section zero of germinal by emil zola translation by havelock ellis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt berard section zero introduction by havelock ellis germinal was published in eighteen eighty five after occupying zola during the previous year in accordance with his usual custom but to a greater extent than with any other of his books except la debacle he accumulated material beforehand for six months he travelled about the coal-mining district in northern france and belgium especially the borinage around mont notebook in hand he was inquisitive was that gentleman miner told Sherard, who visited the neighborhood at a later period and found that the miners in every village knew germinal that was a tribute of admiration the book deserved but it was never one of zola's most popular novels it was neither amusing enough nor outrageous enough to attract the multitude yet germinal occupies a place among zola's works which is constantly becoming more assured so that to some critics it even begins to seem the only book of his that in the end may survive in his own time as we know the accredited critics of the day could find no condemnation severe enough for zola brunetier attacked him perpetually with a fury that seemed inexhaustible Scherer could not even bear to hear his name mentioned anatole france though he lived to relent thought it would have been better if he had never been born even at that time however there were critics who inclined to view germinal more favorably thus faguet who was the recognized academic critic of the end of the last century while he held that posterity would be unable to understand how zola could ever have been popular yet recognized him as in germinal the heroic representative of democracy incomparable in his power of describing crowds and he realized how marvellous is the conclusion of this book to-day when critics view zola in the main with indifference rather than with horror although he still retains his popular favour the distinction of germinal is yet more clearly recognized Selier, while regarding the capitalistic conditions presented as now of an ancient and almost extinct type yet sees germinal standing out as the poem of social mysticism while andre guide a completely modern critic who has left a deep mark on the present generation observes somewhere that it may nowadays cause surprise that he should refer with admiration to germinal but it is a masterly book that fills him with astonishment he can hardly believe that it was written in french and still less that it should have been written in any other language it seems that it should have been created in some international tongue the high place thus claimed for germinal will hardly seem exaggerated the book was produced when zola had at length achieved the full mastery of his art and before his hand had as in his latest novels begun to lose its firm grasp the subject lent itself moreover to his special aptitude for presenting in vivid outline great human groups and to his special sympathy with the collective emotions and social aspirations of such groups we do not as so often in zola's work become painfully conscious that he is seeking to reproduce aspects of life with which he is imperfectly acquainted or fitting them into scientific formulas which he was imperfectly understood he shows a masterly grip of each separate group and each represents some essential element of the whole they are harmoniously balanced and their mutual action and reaction leads on inevitably to the splendid tragic dose with yet its great promise for the future i will not here discuss zola's literary art i have done so in my book of affirmations it is enough to say that 
though he was not a great master of style zola never again wrote so finely as here a word may be added to explain how this translation fell to the lot of one whose work has been in other fields in eighteen ninety three the late a texera de matos was arranging for private issue a series of complete versions of some of zola's chief novels and offered to assign germano to me my time was taken up with preliminary but as yet unfruitful preparation for what i regarded as my own special task in life and i felt that i must not neglect the opportunity of spending my spare time in making a modest addition to my income my wife readily fell into the project and agreed on the understanding that we shared the proceeds to act as my amanuensis so in the little cornish village over the sea we then occupied the evenings of the early months of eighteen ninety four were spent over germinal i translating aloud and she with swift efficient untiring pen following now and then bettering my english dialogue with her pungent wit in this way i was able to gain a more minute insight into the details of zola's work and a more impressive vision of the massive structure he here raised than can easily be acquired by the mere reader that joint task has remained an abidingly pleasant memory it is moreover a satisfaction to me to know that i have been responsible however inadequately for the only complete english version of this wonderful book a great fresco as zola himself called it a great prose epic as it has seemed to some worthy to compare with the great verse epics of old End of section zero. Section one of Germano by Emile Zola. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Part one, chapter one over the open plain beneath a starless sky as dark and thick as ink a man walked alone along the highway from marchaine to montel a straight paved road ten kilometres in length intersecting the beetroot fields he could not even see the black soil before him and only felt the immense flat horizon by the gusts of march wind squalls as strong as on the sea and frozen from sweeping leagues of marsh and naked earth no tree could be seen against the sky and the road unrolled as straight as a pier in the midst of the blinding spray of darkness the man had set out from marchand about two o'clock he walked with long strides shivering beneath his worn cotton jacket and corduroy breeches a small parcel tied in a check handkerchief troubled him much and he pressed it against his side sometimes with one elbow sometimes with the other so that he could slip to the bottom of his pockets both the benumbed hands that bled beneath the lashes of the wind a single idea occupied his head the empty head of a workman without work and without lodging the hope that the cold would be less keen after sunrise for an hour he went on thus when on the left two kilometers from Monceau, he saw red flames three fires burning in the open air and apparently suspended at first he hesitated half afraid then he could not resist the painful need to warm his hands for a moment the steep road led downwards and everything disappeared the man saw on his right a paling a wall of coarse planks shutting in a line of rails while a grassy slope rose on the left surmounted by confused gables a vision of a village with low uniform roofs he went on some two hundred paces suddenly at a bend in the road the fires reappeared close to him though he could not understand how they burnt so high in the dead sky like smoky moons but on the level soil another sight had struck him it was a heavy mass a low pile of buildings from which rose the silhouette of a factory chimney occasional gleams appeared from dirty windows 
five or six melancholy lanterns were hung outside to frames of blackened wood which vaguely outlined the profiles of gigantic stages and from this fantastic apparition drowned in night and smoke a single voice arose the thick long breathing of a steam escapement that could not be seen then the man recognized the pit his despair returned what was the good there would be no work instead of turning towards the buildings he decided at last to ascend the pit bank on which burnt in iron baskets the three coal fires which gave light and warmth for work the labourers in the cutting must have been working late they were still throwing out the useless rubbish now he heard the landers push the wagons on the stages he could distinguish living shadows tipping over the trams or tubs near each fire good day he said approaching one of the baskets turning his back to the fire the carman stood upright he was an old man dressed in knitted violet wool with a rabbit skin cap on his head while his horse a great yellow horse waited with the immobility of stone while they emptied the six trains he drew the workman employed at the tipping cradle a red-haired lean fellow did not hurry himself he pressed on the lever with a sleepy hand and above the wind grew stronger an icy north wind and its great regular breaths passed by like the strokes of a scythe good day replied the old man there was silence the man who felt that he was being looked at suspiciously at once told his name i am called etienne lantier i am an engine man any work here the flames lit him up he might be about twenty-one years of age a very dark handsome man who looked strong in spite of his thin limbs the carman thus reassured shook his head work for an engine man no no there were two came yesterday there's nothing august cut short their speech then etienne asked pointing to the sombre pile of buildings at the foot of the platform a pit isn't it the old man this time could not reply he was strangled by a violent cough at last he expectorated and his expectoration left a black patch on the purple soil yes a pit the Voreux. there the settlement is quite near in his turn and with extended arm he pointed out in the night the village of which the young man had vaguely seen the roofs but the six trams were empty and he followed them without cracking his whip his legs stiffened by rheumatism while the great yellow horse went on of itself pulling heavily between the rails beneath a new gust which bristled its coat the Vaux was now emerging from the gloom etienne who forgot himself before the stove warming his poor bleeding hands looked round and could see each part of the pit the shed tarred with siftings the pit frame the vast chamber of the winding machine the square turret of the exhaustion pump this pit piled up in the bottom of a hollow with its squat brick buildings raising its chimney like a threatening horn seemed to him to have the evil air of a gluttonous beast crouching there to devour the earth while examining it he thought of himself of his vagabond existence these eight days he had been seeking work he saw himself again at his workshop at the railway delivering a blow at his foreman driven from lille driven from everywhere on saturday he had arrived at marchiennes where they said that work was to be had at the forges and there was nothing neither at the forges nor at sonneville's he had been obliged to pass the sunday hidden beneath the wood of a cartwright's yard from which the watchman had just turned him out at two o'clock in the morning he had nothing not a penny not even a crust what should he do wandering along the roads without aim not knowing where to shelter himself from the wind yes it was certainly a pit the occasional lanterns lighted up the square a door suddenly opened had enabled him to catch sight of the furnaces in a clear light he could explain even the escapement of the pump that thick long breathing that went on 
without ceasing and which seemed to be the monster's congested respiration the workman expanding his back at the tipping cradle had not even lifted his eyes on etienne and the latter was about to pick up his little bundle which had fallen to the earth when a spasm of coughing announced the carman's return slowly he emerged from the darkness followed by the yellow horse drawing six more laden trams are there factories at Mosul? asked the young man the old man expectorated then replied in the wind oh it isn't factories that are lacking should have seen it three or four years ago everything was roaring then there were not men enough there never were such wages and now they are tightening their bellies again nothing but misery in the country every one is being sent away workshops closing one after the other it is not the emperor's fault perhaps but why should he go and fight in america without counting that the beasts are dying from cholera like the people then in short sentences and with broken breath the two continued to complain etienne narrated his vain wanderings of the past week must one then die of hunger soon the roads would be full of beggars yes said the old man this will turn out badly for god does not allow so many christians to be thrown on the street we don't have meat every day but if one had bread true if one only had bread their voices were lost gusts of wind carrying away the words in a melancholy howl here began the carman again very loudly turning towards the south Monceau was over there and stretching out his hand again he pointed out invisible spots in the darkness as he named them below at Monceau, the fauvel sugar works were still going but the houghton sugar works had just been dismissing hands there were only the de de l'eau flour mill and the bleu rope walk for mine cables which kept up then with a large gesture he indicated the north half of the horizon the sonneville workshops had not received two-thirds of their usual orders only two of the three blast furnaces of the martian forges were alight finally at the gagebois glassworks a strike was threatening for there was talk of a reduction of wages i know i know replied the young man at each indication i have been there with us here things are going on at present added the carman but the pits have lowered their output and see opposite at the victoire there are also only two batteries of coke furnaces alight he expectorated and set out behind his sleepy horse after harnessing it to the empty trams now etienne could oversee the entire country the darkness remained profound but the old man's hand had as it were filled it with great miseries which the young man unconsciously felt at this moment around him everywhere in the limitless tract was it not a cry of famine that the march wind rolled up across this naked plain the squalls were furious they seemed to bring the death of labour a famine which would kill many men and with wandering eyes he tried to pierce shades tormented at once by the desire and by the fear of seeing everything was hidden in the unknown depths of the gloomy night he only perceived very far off the blast furnaces and the coke ovens the latter with their hundreds of chimneys planted obliquely made lines of red flame while the two towers more to the left burnt blue against the blank sky like giant torches it resembled a melancholy conflagration no other stars rose on the threatening horizon except these nocturnal fires in a land of coal and iron you belong to belgium perhaps began again the carman who had returned behind etienne this time he only brought three trams those at least could be tipped over an accident which had happened to the cage a broken screw-nut would stop work for a good quarter of an hour at the bottom of the pit bank there was silence the landers no longer shook the stages with a prolonged vibration one only heard from the pit the distant sound of a hammer tapping on an iron plate no i come from the south replied the young man the workman after having emptied the trams had seated himself on the earth glad of the accident 
maintaining his savage silence he had simply lifted his large dim eyes to the carman as if annoyed by so many words the latter indeed did not usually talk at such length the unknown man's face must have pleased him that he should have been taken by one of these itchings for confidence which sometimes make old people talk aloud even when alone i belong to monceau he said i am called bon mort is it a nickname asked etienne astonished the old man made a grimace of satisfaction and pointed to the baron yes yes they have pulled me three times out of that torn to pieces once with all my hair scorched once with my gizzard full of earth and another time with my belly swollen with water like a frog and then when they saw that nothing would kill me they called me bon mort for a joke his cheerfulness increased like the creaking of an ill-greased pulley and ended by degenerating into a terrible spasm of coughing the fire basket now clearly lit up his large head with its scanty white hair and flat livid face spotted with bluish patches he was short with an enormous neck projecting calves and heels and long arms with massive hands falling to his knees for the rest like his horse which stood immovable without suffering from the wind he seemed to be made of stone he had no appearance of feeling either the cold or the gusts that whistled at his ears when he coughed his throat was torn by a deep rasping he spat at the foot of the basket and the earth was blackened etienne looked at him and at the ground which he had thus stained have you been working long at the mine bon mort flung open both arms long i should think so i was not eight when i went down into the voreau and i am now fifty-eight reckon that up i have been everything down there at first trammer then putter when i had the strength to wheel then pikeman for eighteen years then because of my cursed legs they put me into the earth cutting to bank up and patch until they had to bring me up because the doctor said i should stay there for good then after five years of that they made me carman eh that's fine fifty years at the mine forty-five down below while he was speaking fragments of burning coal which now and then fell from the basket lit up his pale face with their red reflection they tell me to rest he went on but i'm not going to i'm not such a fool i can get on for two years longer to my sixtieth so as to get the pension of one hundred and eighty francs if i wish them good evening to-day they would give me a hundred and fifty at once they are cunning the beggars besides i am sound except my legs you see it's the water which has got under my skin through being always wet in the cuttings there are days when i can't move a paw without screaming a spasm of coughing interrupted him again and that makes you cough so said etienne but he vigorously shook his head then when he could speak no no i caught cold a month ago i never used to cough now i can't get rid of it and the queer thing is that i spit that i spit the rasping was again heard in his throat followed by the black expectoration is it blood asked etienne at last venturing to question him bon mort slowly wiped his mouth with the back of his hand it's coal i've got enough in my carcass to warm me till i die and it's five years since i put a foot down below i stored it up it seems without knowing it it keeps you alive there was silence the distant hammer struck regular blows in the pit and the wind passed by with its moan like a cry of hunger and weariness coming out of the depths of the night before the flames which grew low the old man went on in lower tones chewing over again his old recollections ah certainly it was not yesterday that he and his began hammering at the seam the family had worked for the monceau mining company since it started and that was long ago a hundred and six years already his grandfather guillaume Mahieu, an urchin of fifteen then had found the rich coal at Requilla, the company's first pit an old abandoned pit to-day down below near the fauvel sugar-works 
all the country knew it and as a proof the discovered scene was called the guillaume after his grandfather he had not known him a big fellow it was said very strong who died of old age at sixty then his father nicolas Mahot, called le roge when hardly forty years of age had died in the pit which was being excavated at that time a landslip a complete slide and the rock drank his blood and swallowed his bones two of his uncles and his three brothers later on also left their skins there he vincent Mayer, who had come out almost whole except that his legs were rather shaky was looked upon as a knowing fellow but what could one do one must work one worked here from father to son as one would work at anything else his son toussaint mahie was being worked to death there now and his grandsons and all his people who lived opposite in the settlement a hundred and six years of mining the youngsters after the old ones with the same master eh there were many bourgeois that could not give their history so well anyhow when one has got enough to eat murmured etienne again that is what i say as long as one has bread to eat one can live bonnemort was silent and his eyes turned towards the settlement where lights were appearing one by one four o'clock struck in the monceau tower and the cold became keener and is your company rich asked etienne the old man shrugged his shoulders and then let them fall as if overwhelmed beneath an avalanche of gold ah yes ah yes not perhaps so rich as its neighbour the anzin company but millions and millions all the same they can't count it nineteen pits thirteen at work the Voreux, the victoire crecour miro st thomas madeleine foutre canal and still more and six were pumping or ventilation like ricula ten thousand workers concessions reaching over sixty-seven communes an output of five thousand tons a day a railway joining all the pits and workshops and factories ah yes ah yes there's money there the rolling of trams on the stages made the big yellow horse prick his ears the cage was evidently repaired below and the landers had got to work again while he was harnessing his beast to redescend the carman added gently addressing himself to the horse won't do to chatter lazy good-for-nothing if monsieur hanbeau knew how you waste your time etienne looked thoughtfully into the night he asked then monsieur hanbeau owns the mine no explained the old man monsieur hanbeau is only the general manager he is paid just the same as us with a gesture the young man pointed into the darkness who does it all belong to them but bonnemort was for a moment so suffocated by a new and violent spasm that he could not get his breath then when he had expectorated and wiped the black froth from his lips he replied in the rising wind eh all that belong to nobody knows to people and with his hand he pointed in the darkness to a vague spot an unknown and remote place inhabited by those people for whom the Mahos had been hammering at the seam for more than a century his voice assumed a tone of religious awe it was as if he were speaking of an inaccessible tabernacle containing a sated and crouching god to whom they had given all their flesh and whom they had never seen at all events if one can get enough bread to eat repeated etienne for the third time without any apparent transition indeed yes if we could always get bread it would be too good the horse had started the carman in his turn disappeared with the trailing step of an invalid near the tipping cradle the workman had not stirred gathered up in a ball burying his chin between his knees with his great dim eyes fixed on emptiness when he had picked up his bundle etienne still remained at the same spot he felt the gusts freezing his back while his chest was burning before the large fire perhaps all the same it would be as well to inquire at the pit the old man might not know then he resigned himself he would accept any work 
where should he go and what was to become of him in this country famished for lack of work must he leave his carcass behind a wall like a strayed dog but one doubt troubled him a fear of the barreau in the middle of this flat plain drowned in so thick a night at every gust the wind seemed to rise as if it blew from an ever-broadening horizon no dawn whitened the dead sky the blast furnaces alone flamed and the coke ovens making the darkness redder without illuminating the unknown and the voreau at the bottom of its hole with its posture as of an evil beast continued to crunch breathing with a heavier and slower respiration troubled by its painful digestion of human flesh End of section one section two of germinal by emile zola translated by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part one chapter two in the middle of the fields of wheat and beetroot the deux cent quarante settlement slept beneath the black night one could vaguely distinguish four immense blocks of small houses back to back barracks or hospital blocks geometric and parallel separated by three large avenues which were divided into gardens of equal size and over the desert plain one heard only the moan of squalls through the broken trellises of the enclosures in the mehu's house number sixteen in the second block nothing was stirring the single room that occupied the first floor was drowned in a thick darkness which seemed to overwhelm with its weight the sleep of the beings whom one felt to be there in a mass with open mouths overcome by weariness in spite of the keen cold outside there was a living heat in the heavy air that hot stuffiness of even the best kept bedrooms the smell of human cattle four o'clock had struck from the clock in the room on the ground floor but nothing yet stirred one heard the piping of slender respirations accompanied by two series of sonorous snores and suddenly catherine got up in her weariness she had as usual counted the four strokes through the floor without the strength to arouse herself completely then throwing her legs from under the bedclothes she felt about at last struck a match and lighted the candle but she remained seated her head so heavy that it fell back between her shoulders seeking to return to the bolster now the candle lighted up the room a square room with two windows and filled with three beds there could be seen a cupboard a table and two old walnut chairs whose smoky tone made hard dark patches against the walls which were painted a light yellow and nothing else only clothes hung to nails a jug placed on the floor and a red pen which served as a basin in the bed on the left zacharie the eldest a youth of one and twenty was asleep with his brother jeanlin who had completed his eleventh year in the right-hand bed two urchins lenore and henri the first six years old the second four slept in each other's arms while catherine shared the third bed with her sister Alzire, so small for her nine years that catherine would not have felt her near her if it were not for the little invalid's humpback which pressed into her side the glass door was open one could perceive this lobby of a landing a sort of recess in which the father and the mother occupied a fourth bed against which they had been obliged to install the cradle of the latest comer estelle aged scarcely three months however catherine made a desperate effort she stretched herself she fidgeted her two hands in the red hair which covered her forehead and neck slender for her fifteen years all that showed of her limbs outside the narrow sheath of her chemise were her bluish feet as it were tattooed with coal and her slight arms the milky whiteness of which contrasted with the sallow tint of her face already spoilt by constant washing with black soap a final yawn opened her rather large mouth with splendid teeth against the chlorotic pallor of her gums 
while her grey eyes were crying in her fight with sleep with a look of painful distress and weariness which seemed to spread over the whole of her naked body but a growl came from the landing and maheu's thick voice stammered devil take it it's time is it you lighting up catherine yes father it has just struck downstairs quick then lazy if you had danced less on sunday you would have woke up earlier a fine lazy life and he went on grumbling but sleep returned to him also his reproaches became confused and were extinguished in fresh snoring the young girl in her chemise with her naked feet on the floor moved about in the room as she passed by the bed of henri and lenore she replaced the coverlet which had slipped down they did not wake lost in the strong sleep of childhood alzire with open eyes had turned to take the warm place of her big sister without speaking i say now zacharie and you jeanlin i say now repeated catherine standing before her two brothers who were still wallowing with their noses in the bolster she had to seize the elder by the shoulder and shake him then while he was muttering abuse it came into her head to uncover them by snatching away the sheet that seemed funny to her and she began to laugh when she saw the two boys struggling with naked legs stupid leave me alone growled zacharie in ill temper sitting up i don't like tricks good lord say it's time to get up he was lean and ill-made with a long face and a chin which showed signs of a sprouting beard yellow hair and the anemic pallor which belonged to his whole family his shirt had rolled up to his belly and he lowered it not from modesty but because he was not warm it has struck downstairs repeated catherine come up father's angry jeanlin who had rolled himself up closed his eyes saying go and hang yourself i'm going to sleep she laughed again the laugh of a good-natured girl he was so small his limbs so thin with enormous joints enlarged by scrofula that she took him up in her arms but he kicked about his apish face pale and wrinkled with its green eyes and great ears grew pale with the rage of weakness he said nothing he bit her right breast beastly fellow she murmured keeping back a cry and putting him on the floor alzire was silent with the sheet tucked under her chin but she had not gone to sleep again with her intelligent invalid's eyes she followed her sister and her two brothers who were now dressing another quarrel broke out around the pan the boys hustled the young girl because she was so long washing herself shirts flew about and while still half asleep they eased themselves without shame with the tranquil satisfaction of a litter of puppies that had grown up together catherine was ready first she put on her miner's breeches then her canvas jacket and fastened the blue cap on her knotted hair in these clean monday clothes she had the appearance of a little man nothing remained to indicate her sex except the slight roll of her hips when the old man comes back said zacharie mischievously he'll like to find the bed unmade you know i shall tell him it's you the old man was the grandfather bonnemort who as he worked during the night slept by day so that the bed was never cold there was always someone snoring there without replying catherine set herself to arrange the bedclothes and tuck them in but during the last moments sounds had been heard behind the wall in the next house these brick buildings economically put up by the company were so thin that the least breath could be heard through them the inmates lived there elbow to elbow from one end to the other and no fact of family life remained hidden even from the youngsters a heavy step had tramped up the staircase then there was a kind of soft fall followed by a sigh of satisfaction good said catherine levaque has gone down and here is Baudelot come to join the levaque woman jeanlin grinned even alzire's eyes shone every morning they made fun of the household of three next door a pikeman who lodged a worker in the cutting an arrangement which gave the woman two men one by night the other by day philomene is coughing began catherine again after listening she was speaking of the eldest levaque 
a big girl of nineteen and the mistress of zachary by whom she had already had two children her chest was so delicate that she was only a sifter at the pit never having been able to work below pooh philomene replied zachary she cares a lot she's asleep it's hoggish to sleep till six he was putting on his breeches when an idea occurred to him and he opened the window outside in the darkness the settlement was awaking lights were dawning one by one between the laths of the shutters and there was another dispute he leant out to watch if he could not see coming out of perron's opposite the captain of the Voreux, who was accused of sleeping with the perron woman while his sister called to him that since the day before the husband had taken day duty at the pit eye and that certainly dan sir could not have slept there that night while the air entered in icy whips both of them becoming angry maintained the truth of their own information until cries and tears broke out it was estelle in her cradle vexed by the cold maheu woke up suddenly what had he got in his bones then here he was going to sleep again like a good-for-nothing and he swore so vigorously that the children became still zachary and jeanlin finished washing with slow weariness alzire with her large open eyes continually stared the two youngsters lenore and henri in each other's arms had not stirred breathing in the same quiet way in spite of the noise catherine give me the candle called out maheu she finished buttoning her jacket and carried the candle into the closet leaving her brothers to look for their clothes by what light came through the door her father jumped out of bed she did not stop but went downstairs in her coarse woolen stockings feeling her way and lighted another candle in the parlour to prepare the coffee all the savants of the family were beneath the sideboard will you be still vermin began maheu again exasperated by estelle's cries which still went on he was short like old bonmort and resembled him with his strong head his flat livid face beneath yellow hair cut very short the child screamed more than ever frightened by those great knotted arms which were held above her leave her alone you know that she won't be still said his wife stretching herself in the middle of the bed she also had just awakened and was complaining how disgusting it was never to be able to finish the night could they not go away quietly buried in the clothes she only showed her long face with large features of a heavy beauty already disfigured at thirty-nine by her life of wretchedness and the seven children she had borne with her eyes on the ceiling she spoke slowly while her man dressed himself they both ceased to hear the little one who was strangling herself with screaming eh you know i haven't a penny and this is only monday still six days before the fortnight's out this can't go on you all of you only bring in nine francs how do you expect me to go on we are ten in the house oh nine francs exclaimed maheu i and zachary three that makes six catherine and the father two that makes four four and six ten and john then one that makes eleven yes eleven but there are sundays and the off days never more than nine you know he did not reply being occupied in looking on the ground for his leather belt then he said on getting up mustn't complain i am sound all the same there's more than one at forty-two who are put to the patching maybe old man but that does not give us bread where am i to get it from eh have you got nothing i've got two coppers keep them for a half pint good lord where am i to get it from six days it will never end we owe sixty francs to maigrat who turned me out of doors day before yesterday that won't prevent me from going to see him again but if he goes on refusing and mahid continued in her melancholy voice without moving her head only closing her eyes now and then beneath the dim light of the candle she said the cupboard was empty the little ones asking for bread and butter even the coffee was done and the water caused colic and the long days passed in deceiving hunger with boiled cabbage leaves 
little by little she had been obliged to raise her voice for estelle's screams drowned her words these cries became unbearable maheu seemed all at once to hear them and in a fury snatched the little one up from the cradle and threw it on the mother's bed stammering with rage here take her i'll do for her damn the child it wants for nothing it sucks and it complains louder than all the rest estelle began in fact to suck hidden beneath the clothes and soothed by the warmth of the bed her cries subsided into the greedy little sound of her lips haven't the Piolaine people told you to go and see them asked the father after a period of silence the mother bit her lip with an air of discouraged doubt yes they met me they were carrying clothes for poor children yes i'll take lenore and henri to them this morning if they only give me a few pence there was silence again maheu was ready he remained a moment motionless then added in his hollow voice what is it that you want let things be and see about the soup it's no good talking better be at work down below true enough replied maheu blow out the candle i don't need to see the colour of my thoughts he blew out the candle zacharie and jeanlin were already going down he followed them and the wooden staircase creaked beneath their heavy feet clad in wool behind them the closet and the room were again dark the children slept even alzire's eyelids were closed but the mother now remained with her eyes open in the darkness while pulling at her breast the pendant breast of an exhausted woman estelle was purring like a kitten down below catherine had at first occupied herself with the fire which was burning in the iron grate flanked by two ovens the company distributed every month to each family eight hectoliters of a hard slaty coal gathered in the passages it burnt slowly and the young girl who piled up the fire every night only had to stir it in the morning adding a few fragments of soft coal carefully picked out then after having placed the kettle on the grate she sat down before the sideboard it was a fairly large room occupying all the ground floor painted in apple green and of flemish cleanliness with its flags well washed and covered with white sand besides the sideboard of varnished deal the furniture consisted of a table and chairs of the same wood stuck on to the walls were some violently coloured prints portraits of the emperor and the empress given by the company of soldiers and of saints speckled with gold contrasting crudely with the simple nudity of the room and there was no other ornament except a box of rose-coloured pasteboard on the sideboard and a clock with its daubed face and loud tick-tack which seemed to fill the emptiness of the place near the staircase door another door led to the cellar in spite of the cleanliness an odour of cooked onion shut up since the night before poisoned the hot heavy air always laden with an acrid flavour of coal catherine in front of the sideboard was reflecting there only remained the end of a loaf cheese in fair abundance but hardly a morsel of butter and she had to provide bread and butter for four at last she decided cut the slices took one and covered it with cheese spread another with butter and stuck them together that was the brick the bread and butter sandwich taken to the pit every morning the four bricks were soon on the table in a row cut with severe justice from the big one for the father down to the little one for jeanlin catherine who appeared absorbed in her household duties must however have been thinking of the stories told by zacharie about the head captain and the perron woman for she half opened the front door and glanced outside the wind was still whistling there were numerous spots of light on the low fronts of the settlement from which arose a vague tremor of awakening already doors were being closed and black files of workers passed into the night it was stupid of her to get cold since the porter at the pit eye was certainly asleep waiting to take his duties at six yet she remained and looked at the house on the other side of the gardens the door opened and her curiosity was aroused but it could only be one of the little perrons lee setting out for the pit 
the hissing sound of steam made her turn she shut the door and hastened back the water was boiling over and putting out the fire there was no more coffee she had to be content to add the water to last night's dregs then she sugared the coffee-pot with brown sugar at that moment her father and two brothers came downstairs faith exclaimed zacharie when he had put his nose into his bowl here's something that won't get into our heads maheu shrugged his shoulders with an air of resignation bah it's hot it's good all the same jeanlin had gathered up the fragments of bread and made a sop of them after having drunk catherine finished by emptying the coffee-pot into the tin jacks all four standing up in the smoky light of the candle swallowed their meals hastily are we at the end said the father one would say we were people of property but a voice came from the staircase of which they had left the door open it was Mahud who was calling out take all the bread i have some vermicelli for the children yes yes replied catherine she had piled up the fire wedging the pot that held the remains of the soup into a corner of the grate so that the grandfather might find it warm when he came in at six each took his sabots from under the sideboard passed the strings of his tin over his shoulder and placed his brick at his back between shirt and jacket and they went out the men first the girl who came last blowing out the candle and turning the key the house became dark again ah we're off together said a man who was closing the door of the next house it was levaque with his son bebe an urchin of twelve a great friend of jeanlin's catherine in surprise stifled a laugh in zacharie's ear why but look didn't even wait until the husband had gone now the lights in the settlement were extinguished and the last door banged all again fell asleep the women and the little ones resuming their slumber in the midst of wider beds and from the extinguished village to the roaring voreau a slow filing of shadows took place beneath the squalls the departure of the colliers to their work bending their shoulders and incommoded by their arms crossed on their breasts while the brick behind formed a hump on each back clothed in their thin jackets they shivered with cold but without hastening straggling along the road with the tramp of a flock. End of section two. Section three of Germana by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part one, chapter three etienne had at last descended from the platform and entered the voreau he spoke to men whom he met asking if there was work to be had but all shook their heads telling him to wait for the captain they left him free to roam through the ill-lighted buildings full of black holes confusing with their complicated stories and rooms after having mounted a dark and half-destroyed staircase he found himself on a shaky footbridge then he crossed the screening shed which was plunged in such profound darkness that he walked with his hands before him for protection suddenly two enormous yellow eyes pierced the darkness in front of him he was beneath the pit frame in the receiving room at the very mouth of the shaft a captain father richon a big man with the face of a good-natured gendarme and with a straight grey moustache was at that moment going towards the receiver's office do they want a hand here for any kind of work asked etienne again richomme was about to say no but he changed his mind and replied like the others as he went away wait for monsieur dansart the head captain four lanterns were placed there and the reflectors which threw all the light on to the shaft vividly illuminated the iron rail the levers of the signals and bars the joists of the guides along which slid the two cages the rest of the vast room like the nave of a church was obscure and peopled by great floating shadows only the lamp cabin shone at the far end while in the receiver's office a small lamp looked like a fading star work was about to be resumed 
and on the iron pavement there was a continual thunder trams of coal being wheeled without ceasing while the landers with their long bent backs could be distinguished amid the movement of all these black and noisy things in perpetual agitation for a moment etienne stood motionless deafened and blinded he felt frozen by the currents of air which entered from every side then he moved on a few paces attracted by the winding engine of which he could now see the glistening steel and copper it was twenty-five metres beyond the shaft in a loftier chamber and placed so solidly on its brick foundation that though it worked at full speed with all its four hundred horsepower the movement of its enormous crank emerging and plunging with oily softness imparted no quiver to the walls the engine man standing at his post listened to the ringing of the signals and his eye never moved from the indicator where the shaft was figured with its different levels by a vertical groove traversed by shot hanging to strings which represented the cages and at each departure when the machine was put in motion the drums two immense wheels five metres in radius by means of which the two steel cables were rolled and unrolled turned with such rapidity that they became like grey powder look out there cried three landers who were dragging an immense ladder at the end just escaped being crushed his eyes were soon more at home and he watched the cables moving in the air more than thirty metres of steel ribbon which flew up into the pit frame where they passed over pulleys to descend perpendicularly into the shaft where they were attached to the cages an iron frame like the high scaffolding of a belfry supported the pulleys it was like the gliding of a bird noiseless without a jar this rapid flight the continual come and go of a thread of enormous weight capable of lifting twelve thousand kilograms at the rate of ten metres a second attention there for god's sake cried one of the landers pushing the ladder to the other side in order to climb to the left-hand rowel slowly etienne returned to the receiving room this giant flight over his head took away his breath shivering in the currents of air he watched the movement of the cages his ears deafened by the rumblings of the trams near the shaft the signal was working a heavy levered hammer drawn by a cord from below and allowed to strike against a block one blow to stop two to go down three to go up it was unceasing like blows of a club dominating the tumult accompanied by the clear sound of the bell while the lander directing the work increased the noise still more by shouting orders to the engine man through a trumpet the cages in the middle of the clear space appeared and disappeared were filled and emptied without etienne being at all able to understand the complicated proceeding he only understood one thing well the shaft swallowed men by mouthfuls of twenty or thirty and with so easy a gulp that it seemed to feel nothing go down since four o'clock the descent of the workmen had been going on they came to the shed with naked feet and their lamps in their hands waiting in little groups until a sufficient number had arrived without a sound with the soft bound of a nocturnal beast the iron cage arose from the night wedged itself on the bolts with its four decks each containing two trams full of coal landers on different platforms took out the trams and replaced them by others either empty or already laden with trimmed wooden props and it was into the empty trams that the workmen crowded five at a time up to forty when they filled all the compartments an order came from the trumpet a hollow indistinct roar while the signal cord was pulled four times from below ringing meat to give warning of this burden of human flesh then after a slight leap the cage plunged silently falling like a stone only leaving behind it the vibrating flight of a cable is it deep asked etienne of a miner who waited near him with a sleepy air five hundred and fifty-four metres replied the man but there are four levels the first at three hundred and twenty both were silent with their eyes on the returning cable 
etienne said again and if it breaks ah if it breaks the miner ended with a gesture his turn had arrived the cage had reappeared with its easy unfatigued movement he squatted in it with some comrades it plunged down then flew up again in less than four minutes to swallow down another load of men for half an hour the shaft went on devouring in this fashion with more or less greedy gulps according to the depth of the level to which the men went down but without stopping always hungry with its giant intestines capable of digesting a nation it went on filling and still filling and the darkness remained dead the cage mounted from the void with the same voracious silence etienne was at last seized again by the same depression which he had experienced on the pit bank what was the good of persisting this head captain would send him off like the others a vague fear suddenly decided him he went away only stopping before the building of the engine-room the wide open door showed seven boilers with two furnaces in the midst of the white steam and the whistling of the escapes a stoker was occupied in piling up one of the furnaces the heat of which could be felt as far as the threshold and the young man was approaching glad of the warmth when he met a new band of colliers who had just arrived at the pit it was the Mehu and levaque said when he saw catherine at the head with her gentle boyish air a superstitious idea caused him to risk another question i say there mate do you want a hand here for any kind of work she looked at him surprised rather frightened at this sudden voice coming out of the shadow but Mehu, behind her had heard and replied talking with etienne for a moment no no one was wanted this poor devil of a man who had lost his way here interested him when he left him he said to the others eh one might easily be like that mustn't complain every one hasn't the chance to work himself to death the band entered and went straight to the shed a vast hall roughly boarded and surrounded by cupboards shut by padlocks in the centre an iron fireplace a sort of closed stove without a door glowed red and was so stuffed with burning coal that fragments flew out and rolled on to the trodden soil the hall was only lighted by this stove from which sanguine reflections danced along the greasy woodwork up to the ceiling stained with black dust as the mehus went into the heat there was a sound of laughter some thirty workmen were standing upright with their backs to the fire roasting themselves with an air of enjoyment before going down they all came here to get a little warmth in their skins so that they could face the dampness of the pit but this morning there was much in amusement they were joking moquette a putter girl of eighteen whose enormous breasts and flanks were bursting through her old jacket and breeches she lived at Requiela with her father old Moc, a groom and moquette her brother a lander but their hours of work were not the same she went to the pit by herself and in the middle of the wheat-fields in summer or against a wall in winter she took her pleasure with her lover of the week all in the mine had their turn it was a perpetual round of comrades without further consequences one day when reproached about a marchand nail-maker she was furiously angry exclaiming that she respected herself far too much that she would cut her arm off if any one could boast that he had seen her with any one but a collier it isn't that big cheval now said a miner grinning did that little fellow have you he must have needed a ladder i saw you behind Requila, a token that he got up on a milestone well replied moquet in a good humour what's that to do with you you were not asked to push and this gross good-natured joke increased the laughter of the men who expanded their shoulders half cooked by the stove while she herself shaken with laughter was displaying in the midst of them the indecency of her costume embarrassingly comical with her masses of flesh exaggerated almost to disease but the gaiety ceased moquette told Mahieu that florence big florence 
would never come again she had been found the night before stiff in her bed some said it was her heart others that it was a pint of gin she had drunk too quickly and maheu was in despair another piece of ill luck one of the best of his putters gone without any chance of replacing her at once he was working in a set there were four pikemen associated in his cutting himself zacharie levaque and chaval if they had catherine alone to wheel the work would suffer suddenly he called out i have it there was that man looking for work at that moment dansart passed before the shed maheu told him the story and asked for his authority to engage the man he emphasized the desire of the company to substitute men for women as at Anzin. the head captain smiled at first for the scheme of excluding women from the pit was not usually well received by the miners who were troubled about placing their daughters and not much affected by questions of morality and health but after some hesitation he gave his permission reserving its ratification for m Negrel, the engineer all very well exclaimed zacharie the man must be away by this time no said catherine i saw him stop at the boilers after him then lazy cried maheu the young girl ran forward while a crowd of miners proceeded to the shaft yielding the fire to others jeanlin without waiting for his father went also to take his lamp together with bevere a big stupid boy and lady a small child of ten Bouquet, who was in front of them called out in the black passage they were dirty brats and threatened to box their ears if they pinched her etienne was in fact in the boiler building talking with a stoker who was charging the furnaces with coal he felt very cold at the thought of the night into which he must return but he was deciding to set out when he felt a hand placed on his shoulder come said catherine there's something for you at first he could not understand then he felt a spasm of joy and vigorously squeezed the young girl's hands thanks mate ah you're a good chap you are she began to laugh looking at him in the red light of the furnaces which lit them up it amused her that he should take her for a boy still slender with her knot of hair hidden beneath the cap he also was laughing with satisfaction and they remained for a moment both laughing in each other's faces with radiant cheeks Mehu, squatting down before his box in the shed was taking off his sabots and his coarse woolen stockings when at the end arrived everything was settled in three or four words thirty sous a day hard work but work that he would easily learn the pikeman advised him to keep his shoes and lent him an old cap a leather hat for the protection of his skull a precaution which the father and his children disdained the tools were taken out of the chest where also was found Laurence's shovel then when maheu had shut up their sabots their stockings as well as etienne's bundle he suddenly became impatient what is that lazy cheval up to another girl given a tumble on a pile of stones we are half an hour late to-day zacharie and levaque were quietly roasting their shoulders the former said at last is it cheval you're waiting for he came before us and went down at once what you knew that and said nothing come come look sharp catherine who was warming her hands had to follow the band etienne allowed her to pass and went behind her again he journeyed through a maze of staircases and obscure corridors in which their naked feet produced the soft sound of old slippers but the lamp cabin was glittering a glass house full of hooks in rows holding hundreds of davy lamps examined and washed the night before and lighted like candles in a mortuary chapel at the barrier each workman took his own stamped with his number then he examined it and shut it himself while the marker seated at a table inscribed on the registers the hour of descent maheu had to intervene to obtain a lamp for his new putter and there was still another precaution the workers defiled before an examiner who assured himself that all the lamps were properly closed golly it's not warm here murmured catherine shivering 
etienne contented himself with nodding his head he was in front of the shaft in the midst of a vast hall swept by currents of air he certainly considered himself brave but he felt a disagreeable emotion at his chest amid this thunder of trams the hollow blows of the signals the stifled howling of the trumpet the continual flight of those cables unrolled and rolled at full speed by the drums of the engine the cages rose and sank with the gliding movement of a nocturnal beast always engulfing men whom the throat of the hole seemed to drink it was his turn now he felt very cold and preserved a nervous silence which made zacharie and levaque grin for both of them disapproved of the hiring of this unknown man especially levaque who was offended that he had not been consulted so catherine was glad to hear her father explain things to the young man look above the cage there is a parachute with iron grapnels to catch into the guides in case of breakage does it work oh not always yes the shaft is divided into three compartments closed by planking from top to bottom in the middle the cages on the left the passage for the ladders but he interrupted himself to grumble though taking care not to raise his voice much what are we stuck here for blast it what right have they to freeze us in this way the captain Richon, who was going down himself with his naked lamp fixed by a nail into the leather of his cap heard him careful look out for ears he murmured paternally as an old miner with affectionate feeling for comrades workmen must do what they can hold on here we are get in with your fellows the cage provided with iron bands and a small meshed lattice work was in fact awaiting them on the bars maheu zacharie and catherine slid into a trend below and as all five had to enter etienne in his turn went in but the good places were taken he had to squeeze himself near the young girl whose elbow pressed into his belly his lamp embarrassed him they advised him to fasten it to the buttonhole of his jacket not hearing he awkwardly kept it in his hand the embarkation continued above and below a confused packing of cattle they did not however set out what then was happening it seemed to him that his impatience lasted for many minutes at last he felt a shock and the light grew dim everything around him seemed to fly while he experienced the dizzy anxiety of a fall contracting his bowels this lasted as long as he could see light through the two reception stories in the midst of the whirling by of the scaffolding then having fallen into the blackness of the pit he became stunned no longer having any clear perception of his sensations now we are off said maheu quietly they were all at their ease he asked himself at times if he was going up or down now and then when the cage went straight without touching the guides there seemed to be no motion but rough shocks were afterwards produced a sort of dancing amid the joists which made him fear a catastrophe for the rest he could not distinguish the walls of the shaft behind the lattice-work to which he pressed his face the lamps feebly lighted the mass of bodies at his feet only the captain's naked light in the neighboring tram shone like a lighthouse this is four meters in diameter continued maheu to instruct him the tubbing wants doing over again for the water comes in everywhere stop we are reaching the bottom do you hear etienne was in fact now asking himself the meaning of this noise of falling rain a few large drops had at first sounded on the roof of the cage like the beginning of a shower and now the rain increased streaming down becoming at last a deluge the roof must be full of holes for a thread of water was flowing on to his shoulder and wetting him to the skin the cold became icy and they were buried in black humidity when they passed through a sudden flash of light the vision of a cavern in which men were moving but already they had fallen back into darkness maheu said that is the first main level we are at three hundred and twenty metres see the speed raising his lamp he lighted up a joist of the guides which led by like a rail beneath a train going at full speed and beyond as before nothing could be seen 
they passed three other levels in flashes of light the deafening rain continued to strike through the darkness how deep it is murmured etienne this fall seemed to last for hours he was suffering for the cramped position he had taken not daring to move and especially tortured by catherine's elbow she did not speak a word he only felt her against him and it warmed him when the cage at last stopped at the bottom at five hundred and fifty-four metres he was astonished to learn that the descent had lasted exactly one minute but the noise of the bolts fixing themselves the sensation of solidity beneath suddenly cheered him and he was joking when he said to catherine what have you got under your skin to be so warm i've got your elbow in my belly sure enough then she also burst out laughing stupid of him still to take her for a boy were his eyes out it's in your eye that you got my elbow she replied in the midst of a storm of laughter which the astonished young man could not account for the cage voided its burden of workers who crossed the pit-eye hall a chamber cut in the rock vaulted with masonry and lighted up by three large lamps over the iron flooring the porters were violently rolling laden trams a cavernous odour exhaled from the walls a freshness of saltpetre in which mingled hot breaths from the neighbouring stable the openings of four galleries yawned here this way said Meheu to etienne you're not there yet it is still two kilometres the workmen separated and were lost in groups in the depths of these black holes some fifteen went off into that on the left and etienne walked last behind Meheu, who was preceded by catherine zacharie and Lavaque. it was a large gallery for wagons through a bed of solid rock which had only needed walling here and there in single file they still went on without a word by the tiny flame of the lamps the young man stumbled at every step and entangled his feet in the rails for a moment a hollow sound disturbed him the sound of a distant storm the violence of which seemed to increase and to come from the bowels of the earth was it the thunder of a landslip bringing on to their heads the enormous mass which separated them from the light a gleam pierced the night he felt the rock tremble and when he had placed himself close to the wall like his comrades he saw a large white horse close to his face harnessed to a train of wagons on the first and holding the reins was seated bevere while jeanlin with his hands leaning on the edge of the last was running barefooted behind they again began their walk farther on they reached crossways where two new galleries opened and the band divided again the workers gradually entering all the stalls of the mine now the wagon gallery was constructed of wood props of timber supported the roof and made for the crumbly rock a screen of scaffolding behind which one could see the plates of schist glimmering with mica and coarse masses of dull rough sandstone trains of tubs full or empty continually passed crossing each other with their thunder borne into the shadow by vague beasts trotting by like phantoms on the double way of a shunting line a long black serpent slept a train at standstill with a snorting horse whose crupper looked like a block fallen from the roof doors for ventilation were slowly opening and shutting and as they advanced the gallery became more narrow and lower and the roof irregular forcing them to bend their backs constantly etienne struck his head hard without his leather cap he would have broken his skull however he attentively followed the slightest gestures of Mehu, whose sombre profile was seen against the glimmer of the lamps none of the workmen knocked themselves they evidently knew each boss each knot of wood or swelling in the rock the young man also suffered from the slippery soil which became damper and damper at times he went through actual puddles only revealed by the muddy splash of his feet but what especially astonished him were the sudden changes of temperature at the bottom of the shaft it was very chilly and in the wagon gallery through which all the air of the mine passed an icy breeze was blowing with the violence of a tempest between the narrow walls afterwards 
as they penetrated more deeply along other passages which only received a meagre share of air the wind fell and the heat increased a suffocating heat as heavy as lead maheu had not again opened his mouth he turned down another gallery to the right simply saying to etienne without looking round the guillaume seam it was the seam which contained their cutting at the first step etienne hurt his head and elbows the sloping roof descended so low that for twenty or thirty metres at a time he had to walk bent double the water came up to his ankles after two hundred metres of this he saw levaque zacharie and catherine disappear as though they had flown through a narrow fissure which was open in front of him we must climb said maheu fasten your lamp to a buttonhole and hang on to the wood he himself disappeared and etienne had to follow him this chimney passage left in the seam was reserved for miners and led to all the secondary passages it was about the thickness of the coal bed hardly sixty centimetres fortunately the young man was thin for as he was still awkward he hoisted himself up with a useless expense of muscle flattening his shoulders and hips advancing by the strength of his wrists clinging to the planks fifteen metres higher they came on the first secondary passage but they had to continue as the cutting of maheu and his mates was in the sixth passage in hell as they said every fifteen metres the passages were placed over each other in never-ending succession through this cleft which scraped back and chest etienne groaned as if the weight of the rocks had pounded his limbs with torn hands and bruised legs he also suffered from lack of air so that he seemed to feel the blood bursting through his skin he vaguely saw in one passage two squatting beasts a big one and a little one pushing trams they were lighty and moquette already at work and he had still to climb the height of two cuttings he was blinded by sweat and he despaired of catching up the others whose agile limbs he heard brushing against the rock with a long gliding movement cheer up here we are said catherine's voice he had in fact arrived and another voice cried from the bottom of the cutting well is this the way to treat people i have two kilometres to walk from montsou and i am here first it was cheval a tall lean bony fellow of twenty-five with strongly marked features who was in a bad humour at having to wait when he saw etienne he asked with contemptuous surprise what's that and when maheu had told him the story he added between his teeth these men are eating the bread of girls the two men exchanged a look lighted up by one of those instinctive hatreds which suddenly flame up etienne had felt the insult without yet understanding it there was silence and they got to work at last all the seams were gradually filled and the cuttings were in movement at every level and at the end of every passage the devouring shaft had swallowed its daily ration of men nearly seven hundred hands who were now at work in this giant ant-hill everywhere making holes in the earth drilling it like an old worm eaten piece of wood and in the middle of the heavy silence and crushing weight of the strata one could hear by placing one's ear to the rock the movement of these human insects at work from the flight of the cable which moved the cage up and down to the biting of the tools cutting out the coal at the end of the stalls at the end on turning round found himself again pressed close to catherine but this time he caught a glimpse of the developing curves of her breast he suddenly understood the warmth which had penetrated him you are a girl then he exclaimed stupefied she replied in a cheerful way without blushing of course you've taken your time to find it out End of section three Section four of Germanon by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part one, chapter four. The four pikemen had spread themselves one above the other over the whole face of the cutting. 
separated by planks hooked on to retain the fallen coal they each occupied about four metres of the seam and this seam was so thin scarcely more than fifty centimetres thick at this spot that they seemed to be flattened between the roof and the wall dragging themselves along by their knees and elbows and unable to turn without crushing their shoulders in order to attack the coal they had to lie on their sides with their necks twisted and arms raised brandishing in a sloping direction their short-handled picks below there was first zachary levaque and chaval were on the stages above and at the very top was Mahil. each worked at the lady bed which he dug out with blows of the pick then he made two vertical cuttings in the bed and detached the block by burying an iron wedge in its upper part the coal was rich the block broke and rolled in fragments along their bellies and thighs when these fragments retained by the plank had collected round them the pikemen disappeared buried in the narrow cleft Mehu suffered most at the top the temperature rose to thirty-five degrees and the air was stagnant so that in the long run it became lethal in order to see he had been obliged to fix his lamp to a nail near his head and this lamp close to his skull still further heated his blood but his torment was especially aggravated by the moisture the rock above him a few centimetres from his face screamed with water which fell in large continuous rapid drops with a sort of obstinate rhythm always at the same spot it was vain for him to twist his head or bend back his neck they fell on his face dropping unceasingly in a quarter of an hour he was soaked and at the same time covered with sweat smoking as with the hot steam of a laundry this morning a drop beating upon his eye made him swear he would not leave his picking he dealt great strokes which shook him violently between the two rocks like a fly caught between two leaves of a book and in danger of being completely flattened not a word was exchanged they all hammered one only heard these irregular blows which seemed veiled and remote the sounds had a sonorous hoarseness without any echo in the dead air and it seemed that the darkness was an unknown blackness thickened by the floating coal dust made heavy by the gas which weighed on the eyes the wicks of the lamps beneath their caps of metallic tissue only showed as reddish points one could distinguish nothing the cutting opened out above like a large chimney flat and oblique in which the soot of ten years had amassed a, a profound night spectral figures were moving in it the gleams of light enabled one to catch a glimpse of a rounded hip a knotty arm a vigorous head besmeared as if for a crime sometimes blocks of coal shone suddenly as they became detached illuminated by a crystalline reflection then everything fell back into darkness pickaxes struck great hollow blows one only heard panting chests the grunting of discomfort and weariness beneath the weight of the air and the rain of the springs zachary with arms weakened by a spree of the night before soon left his work on the pretence that more timbering was necessary this allowed him to forget himself in quiet whistling his eyes vaguely resting in the shade behind the pikemen nearly three metres of the scene were clear and they had not yet taken the precaution of supporting the rock having grown careless of danger and miserly of their time here you swell cried the young man to etienne hand up some wood etienne who was learning from catherine how to manage his shovel had to raise the wood in the cutting a small supply had remained over from yesterday it was usually sent down every morning ready cut to fit the bed hurry up there damn it shouted zachary seeing the new putter hoist himself up awkwardly in the midst of the coal his arms embarrassed by four pieces of oak he made a hole in the roof with his pickaxe and then another in the wall and wedged in the two ends of the wood which thus supported the rock in the afternoon the workers in the earth cutting took the rubbish left at the bottom of the gallery by the pikemen and cleared out the exhausted section of the seam in which they destroyed the wood being only careful about the lower and upper roads for the haulage maheu ceased to groan 
at last he had detached his block and he wiped his streaming face on his sleeve he was worried about what zacharie was doing behind him let it be he said we will see after breakfast better go on hewing if we want to make up our share of trams it's because it's sinking replied the young man look there's a crack it may slip but the father shrugged his shoulders ah nonsense slip and if it did it would not be the first time they would get out of it all right he grew angry at last and sent his son to the front of the cutting all of them however were now stretching themselves levaque resting on his back was swearing as he examined his left thumb which had been grazed by the fall of a piece of sandstone chaval had taken off his shirt in a fury and was working with bare chest and back for the sake of coolness they were already black with coal soaked in a fine dust diluted with sweat which ran down in streams and pools maheu first began again to hammer lower down with his head level with the rock now the drop struck his forehead so obstinately that he seemed to feel it piercing a hole in the bone of his skull you mustn't mind explained catherine to etienne they are always howling and like a good-natured girl she went on with her lesson every laden tram arrived at the top in the same condition as it left the cutting marked with a special metal token so that the receiver might put it to the reckoning of the stall it was necessary therefore to be very careful to fill it and only to take clean coal otherwise it was refused at the receiving office the young man whose eyes were now becoming accustomed to the darkness looked at her still white with her chlorotic complexion and he could not have told her age he thought she must be twelve she seemed to him so slight however he felt she must be older with her boyish freedom a simple audacity which confused him a little she did not please him he thought her too roguish with her pale pirou head framed at the temples by the cap but what astonished him was the strength of this child a nervous strength which was blended with a good deal of skill she filled her tram faster than he could with quick small regular strokes of the shovel she afterwards pushed it to the inclined way with a single slow push without a hitch easily passing under the low rocks he tore himself to pieces got off the rails and was reduced to despair it was certainly not a convenient road it was sixty metres from the cutting to the upbrow and the passage which the miners in the earth cutting had not yet enlarged was a mere tube with a very irregular roof swollen by innumerable bosses at certain spots the laden tram could only just pass the putter had to flatten himself to push on his knees in order not to break his head and besides this the wood was already bending and yielding one could see it broken in the middle in long pale rents like an overweak crutch one had to be careful not to graze oneself in these fractures and beneath the slow crushing which caused the splitting of billets of oak as large as the thigh one had to glide almost on one's belly with a secret fear of suddenly hearing one's back break again said catherine laughing etienne's tram had gone off the rails at the most difficult spot he could not roll straight on these rails which sank in the damp earth and he swore became angry and fought furiously with the wheels which he could not get back into place in spite of exaggerated efforts wait a bit said the young girl if you get angry it will never go skilfully she had glided down and thrust her buttocks beneath the tram and by putting the weight on her loins she raised it and replaced it the weight was seven hundred kilograms surprised and ashamed he stammered excuses she was obliged to show him how to straddle his legs and brace his feet against the planking on both sides of the gallery in order to give himself a more solid fulcrum the body had to be bent the arms made stiff so as to push with all the muscles of the shoulders and hips during the journey he followed her and watched her proceed with tense back her fists so low that she seemed trotting on all fours like one of those dwarf beasts that perform at circuses she sweated panted her joints cracked but without a complaint 
with the indifference of custom as if it were the common wretchedness of all to live thus bent double but he could not succeed in doing as much his shoes troubled him his body seemed broken by walking in this way with lowered head at the end of a few minutes the position became a torture an intolerable anguish so painful that he got on his knees for a moment to straighten himself and breathe then at the upbrow there was more labour she taught him to fill his tram quickly at the top and bottom of this inclined plane which served all the cuttings from one level to the other there was a trammer the brakesman above the receiver below these scamps of twelve to fifteen years shouted abominable words to each other and to warn them it was necessary to yell still more violently then as soon as there was an empty tram to send back the receiver gave the signal and the putter embarked her full tram the weight of which made the other ascend when the brakesman loosened his brake below in the bottom gallery were formed the trains which the horses drew to the shaft here you confounded rascals cried catherine in the inclined way which was wood-lined about a hundred metres long and resounded like a gigantic trumpet the trammers must have been resting for neither of them replied on all the levels haulage had stopped a shrill girl's voice said at last one of them must be on moquette sure enough there was a roar of laughter and the putters of the whole scene held their sides who is that asked etienne of catherine the latter named little lady a scamp who knew more than she ought and who pushed her tram as stoutly as a woman in spite of her doll's arms as to moquette she was quite capable of being with both the trammers at once but the voice of the receiver arose shouting out to load doubtless a captain was passing beneath haulage began again on the nine levels and one only heard the regular calls of the trammers and the snorting of the putters arriving at the upbrow and steaming like overladen mares it was the element of bestiality which breathed in the pit the sudden desire of the male when a miner met one of these girls on all fours with her flanks in the air and her hips bursting through her boy's breeches and on each journey etienne found again at the bottom the stuffiness of the cutting the hollow and broken cadence of the axes the deep painful sighs of the pikemen persisting in their work all four were naked mixed up with the coal soaked with black mud up to the cap at one moment it had been necessary to free Mehu, who was gasping and to remove the planks so that the coal could fall into the passage zachary and levaque became enraged with the seam which was now hard they said and which would make the condition of their account disastrous chaval turned lying for a moment on his back abusing etienne whose presence decidedly exasperated him a sort of worm hasn't the strength of a girl are you going to fill your tub it's to spare your arms eh damned if i don't keep back the ten sous if you get us one refused the young man avoided replying too happy at present to have found this convict's labour and accepting the brutal rule of the worker by master worker but he could no longer walk his feet were bleeding his limbs torn by horrible cramps his body confined in an iron girdle fortunately it was ten o'clock and the stall decided to have breakfast Mehud had a watch but he did not even look at it at the bottom of this starless night he was never five minutes out all put on their shirts and jackets then descending from the cutting they squatted down their elbows to their sides their buttocks on their heels in that posture so habitual with miners that they keep it even when out of the mine without feeling the need of a stone or a beam to sit on and each having taken out his brick bit seriously at the thick slice uttering occasional words on the morning's work catherine who remained standing at last joined etienne who had stretched himself out farther along across the rails with his back against the planking there was a place there almost dry you don't eat she said to him with her mouth full and her brick in her hand then she remembered that this youth wandering about at night without a sou perhaps had not a bit of bread will you share with me 
and as he refused declaring that he was not hungry while his voice trembled with a gnawing in his stomach she went on cheerfully ah if you are fastidious but here i've only bitten on that side i'll give you this she had already broken the bread and butter into two pieces the young man taking his half restrained himself from devouring it all at once and placed his arms on his thighs so that she should not see how he trembled with her quiet air of good comradeship she lay beside him at full length on her stomach with her chin in one hand slowly eating with the other their lamps placed between them lit up their faces catherine looked at him a moment in silence she must have found him handsome with his delicate face and black moustache she vaguely smiled with pleasure then you are an engine driver and they sent you away from your railway why because i struck my chief she remained stupefied overwhelmed with her hereditary ideas of subordination and passive obedience i ought to say that i had been drinking he went on and when i drink i get mad i could devour myself and i could devour other people yes i can't swallow two small glasses without wanting to kill someone then i am ill for two days you mustn't drink she said seriously ah don't be afraid i know myself and he shook his head he hated brandy with the hatred of the last child of a race of drunkards who suffered in his flesh from all those ancestors soaked and driven mad by alcohol to such a point that the least drop had become poison to him it is because of mother that i didn't like being turned into the street he said after having swallowed a mouthful mother is not happy and i used to send her a five-franc piece now and then where is she then your mother at paris a laundress rue de la Côte d'Or. there was silence when he thought of these things a tremor dimmed his dark eyes the sudden anguish of the injury he brooded over in his fine youthful strength for a moment he remained with his looks buried in the darkness of the mine and at that depth beneath the weight and suffocation of the earth he saw his childhood again his mother still beautiful and strong forsaken by his father then taken up again after having married another man living with the two men who ruined her rolling with them in the gutter in drink and ordure it was down there he recalled the street the details came back to him the dirty linen in the middle of the shop the drunken carousals that made the house stink and the jaw-breaking blows now he began again in a slow voice i haven't even thirty sous to make her presents with she will die of misery sure enough he shrugged his shoulders with despair and again bit at his bread and butter will you drink asked catherine uncorking her tin oh it's coffee it won't hurt you one gets dry when one eats like that but he refused it was quite enough to have taken half her bread however she insisted good-naturedly and said at last well i will drink before you since you are so polite only you can't refuse now it would be rude she held out her tin to him she had got on to her knees and he saw her quite close to him lit up by the two lamps why had he found her ugly now that she was black her face powdered with fine charcoal she seemed to him singularly charming in this face surrounded by shadow the teeth and the broad mouth shone with whiteness while the eyes looked large and gleamed with a greenish reflection like a cat's eyes a lock of red hair which had escaped from her cap tickled her ear and made her laugh she no longer seemed so young she might be quite fourteen to please you he said drinking and giving her back the tin she swallowed a second mouthful and forced him to take one too wishing to share she said and that little tin that went from one mouth to the other amused them he suddenly asked himself if he should not take her in his arms and kiss her lips she had large lips of a pale rose colour made vivid by the coal which tormented him with increasing desire but he did not dare intimidated before her only having known girls on the streets of lille of the lowest order and not realizing how one ought to behave with a work-girl still living with her family you must be about fourteen then he asked 
after having gone back to his bread she was astonished almost angry what fourteen but i am fifteen it's true i'm not big girls don't grow quick with us he went on questioning her and she told everything without boldness or shame for the rest she was not ignorant concerning man and woman although he felt that her body was virginal with the virginity of a child delayed in her sexual maturity by the environment of bad air and weariness in which she lived when he spoke of moquette in order to embarrass her she told some horrible stories in a quiet voice with much amusement ah she did some fine things and as he asked if she herself had no lovers she replied jokingly that she did not wish to vex her mother but that it must happen some day her shoulders were bent she shivered a little from the coldness of her garments soaked in sweat with a gentle resigned air ready to submit to things and men people can find lovers when they all live together can't they sure enough and then it doesn't hurt any one one doesn't tell the priest oh the priest i don't care for him but there is the black man what do you mean the black man the old miner who comes back into the pit and wrings naughty girls necks he looked at her afraid that she was making fun of him you believe in those stupid things then you don't know anything yes i do i can read and write that is useful among us in father and mother's time they learnt nothing she was certainly very charming when she had finished her bread and butter he would take her and kiss her on her large rosy lips it was the resolution of timidity a thought of violence which choked his voice these boys clothes this jacket and these breeches on the girl's flesh excited and troubled him he had swallowed his last mouthful he drank from the tin and gave it back to her to empty now the moment for action had come and he cast a restless glance at the miners farther on but a shadow blocked the gallery for a moment chaval stood and looked at them from afar he came forward having assured himself that maheu could not see him and as catherine was seated on the earth he seized her by the shoulders drew her head back and tranquilly crushed her mouth beneath a brutal kiss affecting not to notice etienne there was in that kiss an act of possession a sort of jealous resolution however the young girl was offended let me go do you hear he kept hold of her head and looked into her eyes his moustache and small red beard flamed in his black face with its large eagle nose he let her go at last and went away without speaking a word a shudder had frozen etienne it was stupid to have waited he could certainly not kiss her now for she would perhaps think that he wished to behave like the other in his wounded vanity he experienced real despair why did you lie he said in a low voice he's your lover but no i swear she cried there is not that between us sometimes he likes a joke he doesn't even belong here it's six months since he came from the pas de calais both rose work was about to be resumed when she saw him so cold she seemed annoyed doubtless she found him handsomer than the other she would have preferred him perhaps the idea of some amiable consoling relationship disturbed her and when the young man saw with surprise that his lamp was burning blue with a large pale ring she tried at least to amuse him come i will show you something she said in a friendly way when she had led him to the bottom of the cutting she pointed out to him a crevice in the coal a slight bubbling escaped from it a little noise like the warbling of a bird put your hand there you'll feel the wind it's fire damp he was surprised was that all was that the terrible thing which blew everything up she laughed she said there was a good deal of it to-day to make the flame of the lamp so blue now if you've done chattering lazy louts cried maheu's rough voice catherine and etienne hastened to fill their trams and pushed them to the upbrow with stiffened back crawling beneath the bossy roof of the passage even after the second journey the sweat ran off them and their joints began to crack the pikemen had resumed work in the cutting the men often shortened their breakfast to avoid getting cold and their bricks eaten in this way far from the sun with silent voracity 
loaded their stomachs with lead stretched on their sides they hammered more loudly with the one fixed idea of filling a large number of trams every thought disappeared in this rage for gain which was so hard to earn they no longer felt the water which streamed on them and swelled their limbs the cramps of forced attitudes the suffocation of the darkness in which they grew pale like plants put in a cellar yet as the day advanced the air became more poisoned and heated with the smoke of the lamps with the pestilence of their breaths with the asphyxia of the fire damp blinding to the eyes like spiders webs which only the aeration of the night could sweep away at the bottom of their molehill beneath the weight of the earth with no more breath in their inflamed lungs they went on hammering End of section four. Section five of Germanal by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part one, chapter five. Mahu without looking at his watch which she had left in his jacket stopped and said one o'clock directly zacharie is it done the young man had just been at the planking in the midst of his labour he had been lying on his back with dreamy eyes thinking over a game of hockey of the night before he woke up and replied yes it will do we shall see to-morrow and he came back to take his place at the cutting Levaque and Cheval had also dropped their picks. They were all resting. They wiped their faces on their naked arms and looked at the roof, in which slaty masses were cracking. They only spoke about their work. Another chance, murmured Cheval, of getting into loose earth. They didn't take account of that in the bargain. Rascals, growled Levaque. They only want to bury us in it. Zachary began to laugh. He cared little for the work and the rest, but it amused him to hear the company abused. In his placid way, Mahieu explained that the nature of the soil changed every twenty meters. One must be just. They could not foresee everything. Then, when the two others went on talking against the masters, he became restless and looked around him. Hush, that's enough. You're right, said Levaque also lowering his voice it isn't wholesome a morbid dread of spies haunted them even at this depth as if the shareholders coal while still in the seam might have ears that won't prevent me added cheval loudly in a defiant manner from lodging a brick in the belly of that damned dancer if he talks to me as he did the other day i won't prevent him i won't from buying pretty girls with a white skin this time zacharie burst out laughing the head captain's love for pierron was a constant joke in the pit even catherine rested on her shovel at the bottom of the cutting holding her sides and in a few words told etienne the joke while maheu became angry seized by a fear which he could not conceal will you hold your tongue eh wait till you're alone if you want to get into trouble he was still speaking when the sound of steps was heard in the upper gallery almost immediately the engineer of the mine little negrel as the workmen called him among themselves appeared at the top of the cutting accompanied by danseur the head captain didn't i say so muttered mayo there's always someone there rising out of the ground paul negrel Monsieur Humbault's nephew was a young man of twenty-six, refined and handsome, with curly hair and brown moustache. His pointed nose and sparkling eyes gave him the air of an amiable ferret of sceptical intelligence, which changed into an abrupt authoritative manner in his relations with the workmen. He was dressed like them, and like them smeared with coal. To make them respect him, he exhibited a daredevil courage passing through the most difficult spots and always first when landslips or fire-damp explosions occurred here we are are we not dansert he asked the head captain a coarse-faced belgian with a large sensual nose replied with exaggerated politeness 
yes monsieur negrel here is the man who was taken on this morning both of them had slid down into the middle of the cutting they made etienne come up the engineer raised his lamp and looked at him without asking any questions good he said at last but i don't like unknown men to be picked up from the road don't do it again he did not listen to the explanations given to him the necessities of work the desire to replace women by men for the haulage he had begun to examine the roof while the pikemen had taken up their picks again suddenly he called out i say there maheu have you no care for life by heavens you will all be buried here oh it's solid replied the workman tranquilly what solid but the rock is giving already and you are planting props at more than two metres as if you grudged it ah you are all alike you will let your skull be flattened rather than leave the seam to give these necessary time to the timbering i must ask you to prop that immediately double the timbering do you understand and in the face of the unwillingness of the miners who disputed the point saying that they were good judges of their safety he became angry go along when your heads are smashed is it you who will have to bear the consequences not at all it will be the company which will have to pay you pensions you or your wives i tell you again that we know you in order to get two extra trams by evening you would sell your skins Mehu, in spite of the anger which was gradually mastering him still answered steadily if they paid us enough we should profit better the engineer shrugged his shoulders without replying he had descended the cutting and only said in conclusion from below you have an hour set to work all of you and i give you notice that the stall is fined three francs a low growl from the pikemen greeted these words the force of the system alone restrained them that military system which from the trammer to the head captain ground one beneath the other chaval and levaque however made a furious gesture while maheu restrained them by a glance and zacharie shrugged his shoulders chaffingly but etienne was perhaps most affected since he had found himself at the bottom of this hell a slow rebellion was rising within him he looked at the resigned catherine with her lowered back was it possible to kill oneself at this hard toil in this deadly darkness and not even to gain the few pence to buy one's daily bread however negrel went off with dansart who was content to approve by a continual movement of his head and their voices again rose they had just stopped once more and were examining the timbering in the gallery which the pikemen were obliged to look after for a length of ten metres behind the cutting didn't i tell you that they care nothing cried the engineer and you why in the devil's name don't you watch them but i do i do stammered the head captain one gets tired of repeating things negrel called loudly maheu maheu they all came down he went on do you see that will that hold it's a two-penny half-penny construction here is a beam which the posts don't carry already it was done so hastily by jove i understand how it is that the mending costs us so much it'll do won't it if it lasts as long as you have the care of it and then it may go smash and the company is obliged to have an army of repairers look at it down there it is mere botching chaval wished to speak but he silenced him no i know what you are going to say let them pay you more eh very well i warn you that you will force the managers to do something they will pay you the planking separately and proportionately reduce the price of the trams we shall see if you will gain that way meanwhile prop that over again at once i shall pass to-morrow amid the dismay caused by this threat he went away dancert who had been so humble remained behind a few moments to say brutally to the men you get me into a row you hear i'll give you something more than three francs fine i will look out then when he had gone maheu broke out in his turn 
by god what's fair is fair i like people to be calm because that's the only way of getting along but at last they make you mad did you hear the tram lowered and the planking separately another way of paying us less by god it is he looked for someone upon whom to vent his anger and saw catherine and etienne swinging their arms will you just fetch me some wood what does it matter to you i'll put my foot into you somewhere etienne went to carry it without rancor for this rough speech so furious himself against the masters that he thought the miners too good-natured as for the others levaque and chaval had found relief in strong language all of them even zachary were timbering furiously for nearly half an hour one only heard the creaking of wood wedged in by blows of the hammer they no longer spoke they snorted became enraged with the rock which they would have hustled and driven back by the force of their shoulders if they had been able that's enough said maheu at last worn out with anger and fatigue an hour and a half a fine day's work we shan't get fifty sous i'm off this disgusts me though there was still half an hour of work left he dressed himself the others imitated him the mere sight of the cutting enraged them as the putter had gone back to the haulage they called her irritated at her zeal let the coal take care of itself and the six their tools under their arms set out to walk the two kilometres back returning to the shaft by the road of the morning at the chimney catherine and etienne were delayed while the pikemen slid down they met little lady who stopped in a gallery to let them pass and told them of the disappearance of moquette whose nose had been bleeding so much that she had been away an hour bathing her face somewhere no one knew where then when they left her the child began again to push her tram weary and muddy stiffening her insect-like arms and legs like a lean black ant struggling with a load that was too heavy for it they let themselves down on their backs flattening their shoulders for fear of scratching the skin on their foreheads and they walked so close to the polished rock at the back of the stalls that they were obliged from time to time to hold on to the woodwork so that their backsides should not catch fire as they said jokingly below they found themselves alone red stars appeared afar at a bend in the passage their cheerfulness fell they began to walk with the heavy step of fatigue she in front he behind their lamps were blackened he could scarcely see her drowned in a sort of smoky mist and the idea that she was a girl disturbed him because he felt that it was stupid not to embrace her and yet the recollection of the other man prevented him certainly she had lied to him the other was her lover they lay together on all those heaps of slaty coal for she had a loose woman's gait he sulked without reason as if she had deceived him she however every moment turned round warned him of obstacles and seemed to invite him to be affectionate they were so lost here it would have been so easy to laugh together like good friends at last they entered the large haulage gallery it was a relief to the indecision from which he was suffering while she once more had a saddened look the regret for a happiness which they would not find again now the subterranean life rumbled around them with the continual passing of captains the come and go of the trams drawn by trotting horses lamps starred the night everywhere they had to efface themselves against the rock to leave the path free to shadowy men and beasts whose breath came against their faces jeanlin running barefooted behind his tram cried out some naughtiness to them which they could not hear amid the thunder of the wheels they still went on she now silent he not recognizing the turnings and roads of the morning and fancying that she was leading him deeper and deeper into the earth and what specially troubled him was the cold an increasing cold which he had felt on emerging from the cutting and which caused him to shiver the more the nearer they approached the shaft between the narrow walls the column of air now blew like a tempest they despaired of ever coming to the end when suddenly they found themselves in the pit-eye hall chaval cast a sidelong glance at them his mouth drawn with suspicion 
the others were there covered with sweat in the icy current silent like himself swallowing their grunts of rage they had arrived too soon and could not be taken to the top for half an hour more especially since some complicated manoeuvres were going on for lowering a horse the porters were still rolling the trams with the deafening sound of old iron in movement and the cages were flying up disappearing in the rain which fell from the black hole below the sump a cesspool ten metres deep filled with this streaming water also exhaled its muddy moisture men were constantly moving around the shaft pulling the signal cords pressing on the arms of levers in the midst of this spray in which their garments were soaked the reddish light of three open lamps cut out great moving shadows and gave to this subterranean hall the air of a villainous cavern some bandit's forge near a torrent maheu made one last effort he approached Piron, who had gone on duty at six o'clock here you might as well let us go up but the porter a handsome fellow with strong limbs and a gentle face refused with a frightened gesture impossible asked the captain they would find me fresh growls were stifled catherine bent forward and said in etienne's ear come and see the stable then that's a comfortable place and they had to escape without being seen for it was forbidden to go there it was on the left at the end of a short gallery twenty-five metres in length and nearly four high cut in the rock and vaulted with bricks it could contain twenty horses it was in fact comfortable there there was a pleasant warmth of living beasts the good odour of fresh and well-kept litter the only lamp threw out the calm rays of a night light there were horses there at rest who turned their heads with their large infantine eyes then went back to their hay without haste like fat well-kept workers loved by everybody but as catherine was reading aloud their names written on zinc plates over the mangers she uttered a slight cry seeing something suddenly rise before her it was moquette who emerged in fright from a pile of straw in which she was sleeping on monday when she was overtired with her sunday spree she gave herself a violent blow on the nose and left her cutting under the pretence of seeking water to bury herself here with the horses in the warm litter her father being weak with her allowed it and at the risk of getting into trouble just then mock the father entered a short bald worn-out looking man but still stout which is rare in an old miner of fifty since he had been made a groom he chewed to such a degree that his gums bled in his black mouth on seeing the two with his daughter he became angry what are you up to there all of you come up the jades bringing a man here it's a fine thing to come and do your dirty tricks in my straw moquette thought it funny and held her sides but etienne feeling awkward moved away while catherine smiled at him as all three returned to the pit-eye bebert and jeanlin arrived there also with a train of tubs there was a stoppage for the manoeuvring of the cages and the young girl approached their horse caressed it with her hand and talked about it to her companion it was bataille the doyen of the mine a white horse who had lived below for ten years these ten years he had lived in this hole occupying the same corner of the stable doing the same task along the black galleries without ever seeing daylight very fat with shining coat and a good-natured air he seemed to lead the existence of a sage sheltered from the evils of the world above in this darkness too he had become very cunning the passage in which he worked had grown so familiar to him that he could open the ventilation doors with his head and he lowered himself to avoid knocks at the narrow spots without doubt also he counted his turns for when he had made the regulation number of journeys he refused to do any more and had to be led back to his manger now that old age was coming on his cat's eyes were sometimes dimmed with melancholy perhaps he vaguely saw again in the depths of his obscure dreams the mill at which he was born near marchienne a mill placed on the edge of the scarp 
surrounded by large fields over which the wind always blew something burnt in the air an enormous lamp the exact appearance of which escaped his beast's memory and he stood with lowered head trembling on his old feet making useless efforts to recall the sun meanwhile the manoeuvres went on in the shaft the signal hammer had struck four blows and the horse was being lowered there was always excitement at such a time for it sometimes happened that the beast was seized by such terror that it was landed dead when put into a net at the top it struggled fiercely then when it felt the ground no longer beneath it it remained as if petrified and disappeared without a quiver of the skin with enlarged and fixed eyes this animal being too big to pass between the guides it had been necessary when hooking it beneath the cage to pull down the head and attach it to the flanks the descent lasted nearly three minutes the engine being slowed as a precaution below the excitement was increasing what then was he going to be left on the road hanging in the blackness at last he appeared in his stony immobility his eye fixed and dilated with terror it was a bay horse hardly three years of age called trompette attention cried father moque whose duty it was to receive it bring him here don't undo him yet trompette was soon placed on the metal floor in a mass still he did not move he seemed in a nightmare in this obscure infinite hole this deep hall echoing with tumult they were beginning to unfasten him when Batille, who had just been unharnessed approached and stretched out his neck to smell this companion who lay on the earth the workman jokingly enlarged the circle well what pleasant odour did he find in him but Batille, deaf to mockery became animated he probably found in him the good odour of the open air the forgotten odour of the sun on the grass and he suddenly broke out into a sonorous neigh full of musical gladness in which there seemed to be the emotion of a sob it was a greeting the joy of those ancient things of which a gust had reached him the melancholy of one more prisoner who would not ascend again until death ah that animal bate shouted the workmen amused at the antics of their favourite he's talking with his mate trompette was unbound but still did not move he remained on his flank as if he still felt the net restraining him garroted by fear at last they got him up with a lash of the whip dazed and his limbs quivering and father moque led away the two beasts fraternizing together here is it ready yet asked maheu it was necessary to clear the cages and besides it was yet ten minutes before the hour for ascending little by little the stalls emptied and the miners returned from all the galleries there were already some fifty men there damp and shivering their inflamed chests panting on every side perron in spite of his mawkish face struck his daughter lydie because she had left the cutting before time zachary slyly pinched moquette with a joke about warming himself but the discontent increased chaval and levaque narrated the engineer's threat the tram to be lowered in price and the planking paid separately and exclamations greeted the scheme a rebellion was germinating in this little corner nearly six hundred metres beneath the earth soon they could not restrain their voices these men soiled by coal and frozen by the delay accused the company of killing half their workers at the bottom and starving the other half to death etienne listened trembling quick quick repeated the captain Richon, to the porters he hastened the preparations for the ascent not wishing to be hard pretending not to hear however the murmurs became so loud that he was obliged to notice them they were calling out behind him that this would not last always and that one fine day the whole affair would be smashed up you're sensible he said to maheu make them hold their tongues when one hasn't got power one must have sense but maheu who was getting calm and had at last become anxious did not interfere suddenly the voices fell negrel and Densard returning from their inspection entered from a gallery both of them sweating 
the habit of discipline made the men stand in rows while the engineer passed through the group without a word he got into one tram and the head captain into another the signal was sounded five times ringing for the butcher's meat as they said for the masters and the cage flew up in the air in the midst of a gloomy silence End of section five. Section six of Germinal by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part one, chapter six. As he ascended in the cage, heaped up with four others etienne resolved to continue his famished course along the roads one might as well die at once as go down to the bottom of that hell where it was not even possible to earn one's bread catherine in the tram above him was no longer at his side with her pleasant enervating warmth and he preferred to avoid foolish thoughts and to go away for with his wider education he felt nothing of the resignation of this flock he would end by strangling one of masters suddenly he was blinded the ascent had been so rapid that he was stunned by the daylight and his eyelids quivered in the brightness to which he had already grown unaccustomed it was none the less a relief to him to feel the cage settle on to the bars a lander opened the door and a flood of workmen leapt out of the trams i say moquette whispered zacharie in the lander's ear are we off to the volcan to-night the volcan was a cafe concert at monceau moquette winked his left eye with a silent laugh which made his jaws gape short and stout like his father he had the impudent face of a fellow who devours everything without care for the morrow just then moquette came out in her turn and he gave her a formidable smack on the flank by way of fraternal tenderness etienne hardly recognized the lofty nave of the receiving hall which had before looked imposing in the ambiguous light of the lanterns it was simply bare and dirty a dull light entered through the dusty windows the engine alone shone at the end with its copper the well-greased steel cables moved like ribbons soaked in ink and the pulleys above the enormous scaffold which supported them the cages the trams all this prodigality of metal made the hall look sombre with their hard gray tones of old iron without ceasing the rumbling of the wheels shook the metal floor while from the coal thus put in motion there arose a fine charcoal powder which powdered black the soil the walls even the joists of the steeple but chaval after glancing at the table of counters in the receiver's little glass office came back furious he had discovered that two of their trams had been rejected one because it did not contain the regulation amount the other because the coal was not clean this finishes the day he cried twenty sous less again this is because we take on lazy rascals who use their arms as a pig does his tail and a sidelong look at etienne completed his thought the latter was tempted to reply by a blow then he asked himself what would be the use since he was going away this decided him absolutely it's not possible to do it right the first day said maheu to restore peace he'll do better to-morrow they were all none the less soured and disturbed by the need to quarrel as they passed to the lamp cabin to give up their lamps levaque began to abuse the lamp man whom he accused of not properly cleaning his lamp they only slackened down a little in the shed where the fire was still burning it had even been too heavily piled up for the stove was red and the vast room without a window seemed to be in flames to such a degree did the reflection make bloody the walls and there were grunts of joy all the backs were roasted at a distance till they smoked like soup when their flanks were burning they cooked their bellies moquette had tranquilly let down her breeches to dry her chemise some lads were making fun of her they burst out laughing because she suddenly showed them her posterior a gesture which in her was the extreme expression of contempt i'm off 
said chaval who had shut up his tools in his box no one moved only moquette hastened and went out behind him on the pretext that they were both going back to montsou but the others went on joking they knew that he would have no more to do with her catherine however who seemed preoccupied was speaking in a low voice to her father the latter was surprised then he agreed with a nod and calling etienne to give him back his bundle listen he said you haven't a sou you will have time to start before the fortnight's out shall i try and get you credit somewhere the young man stood for a moment confused he had been just about to claim his thirty sous and go but shame restrained him before the young girl she looked at him fixedly perhaps she would think he was shirking the work you know i can promise you nothing maheu went on they can but refuse us then etienne consented they would refuse besides it would bind him to nothing he could still go away after having eaten something then he was dissatisfied at not having refused seeing catherine's joy a pretty laugh a look of friendship happy at having been useful to him what was the good of it all when they had put on their sabots and shut their boxes the mayhews left the shed following their comrades who were leaving one by one after they had warmed themselves etienne went behind levaque and his urchin joined the band but as they crossed the screening place a scene of violence stopped them it was in a vast shed with beams blackened by the powder and large shutters through which blew a constant current of air the coal trams arrived straight from the receiving room and were then overturned by the tipping cradles on to hoppers long iron slides and to right and to left of these the screeners mounted on steps and armed with shovels and rakes separated the stone and swept together the clean coal which afterwards fell through funnels into the railway wagons beneath the shed philomene levaque was there thin and pale with the sheep-like face of a girl who spat blood with head protected by a fragment of blue wool and hands and arms black to the elbows she was screening beneath an old witch the mother of Piron, the roule as she was called with terrible owl's eyes and a mouth drawn in like a miser's purse they were abusing each other the young one accusing the elder of raking her stones so that she could not get a basket full in ten minutes they were paid by the basket and these quarrels were constantly arising hair was flying and hands were making black marks on red faces give it her bloody well cried zachary from above to his mistress all the screeners laughed but the brule turned snappishly on the young man now then dirty beast you better to own the two kids you have filled her with fancy that a slip of eighteen who can't stand straight maheu had to prevent his son from descending to see as he said the colour of this carcass's skin a foreman came up and the rakes again began to move the coal one could only see all along the hoppers the round backs of women squabbling incessantly over the stones outside the wind had suddenly quieted a moist cold was falling from a grey sky the colliers thrust out their shoulders folded their arms and set forth irregularly with a rolling gait which made their large bones stand out beneath their thin garments in the daylight they looked like a band of negroes thrown into the mud some of them had not finished their bricks and the remains of the bread carried between the shirt and the jacket made them humpbacked hallo there's bottle said zachary grinning levaque without stopping exchanged two sentences with his lodger a big dark fellow of thirty-five with a placid honest air is the soup ready louis i believe it is then the wife is good-humoured to-day yes i believe she is other miners bound for the earth cutting came up new bands which one by one were engulfed in the pit it was the three o'clock descent more men for the pit to devour the gangs who would replace the sets of the pikemen at the bottom of the passages the mine never rested day and night human insects were digging out the rock six hundred metres below the beetroot fields however the youngsters went ahead 
jeanlin confided to bebert a complicated plan for getting four sous worth of tobacco on credit while lady followed respectfully at a distance catherine came with zacharie and etienne none of them spoke and it was only in front of the advantage inn that maheu and levaque rejoined them here we are said the former to etienne will you come in they separated catherine had stood a moment motionless gazing once more at the young man with her large eyes full of greenish limpidity like spring water the crystal deepened the more by her black face she smiled and disappeared with the others on the road that led up to the settlement the inn was situated between the village and the mine at the crossing of two roads it was a two-story brick house whitewashed from top to bottom enlivened around the windows by a broad pale blue border on a square sign board nailed above the door one read in yellow letters a la avantage license to rasseneur behind it stretched a skittle ground enclosed by a hedge the company who had done everything to buy up the property placed within its vast territory was in despair over this inn in the open fields at the very entrance of the Verreaux. go in said maheu to etienne the little parlor was quite bare with its white walls its three tables and its dozen chairs its deal counter about the size of a kitchen dresser there were a dozen glasses at most three bottles of liqueur a decanter a small zinc tank with a pewter tap to hold the beer and nothing else not a figure not a little table not a game in the metal fireplace which was bright and polished a coal fire was burning quietly on the flags a thin layer of white sand drank up the constant moisture of this water-soaked land a glass ordered maheu of a big fair girl a neighbor's daughter who sometimes took charge of the place is rasseneur in the girl turned the tap replying that the master would soon return in a long slow gulp the miner emptied half his glass to sweep away the dust which filled his throat he offered nothing to his companion one other customer a damp and besmeared miner was seated before the table drinking his beer in silence with an air of deep meditation a third entered was served in response to a gesture paid and went away without uttering a word but a stout man of thirty-eight with a round shaven face and a good-natured smile now appeared it was rasseneur a former pikeman whom the company had dismissed three years ago after a strike a very good workman he could speak well put himself at the head of every opposition and had at last become the chief of the discontented his wife already held a license like many miners wives and when he was thrown on to the street he became an innkeeper himself having found the money he placed his inn in front of the Varol as a provocation to the company now his house had prospered it had become a centre and he was enriched by the animosity he had gradually fostered in the hearts of his old comrades this is a lad i hired this morning said maheu at once have you got one of your two rooms free and will you give him credit for a fortnight rasseneur's broad face suddenly expressed great suspicion he examined etienne with a glance and replied without giving himself the trouble to express any regret my two rooms are taken can't do it the young man expected this refusal but it hurt him nevertheless and he was surprised at the sudden grief he experienced in going no matter he would go when he had received his thirty sous the miner who was drinking at a table had left others one by one continued to come in to clear their throats then went on their road with the same slouching gait it was a simple swelling without joy or passion the silent satisfaction of a need then there's no news rasseneur asked in a peculiar tone of maheu who was finishing his beer in small gulps the latter turned his head and saw that only etienne was near there's been more squabbling yes about the timbering he told the story the innkeeper's face reddened swelling with the emotion which flamed in his skin and eyes at last he broke out well well if they decide to lower the price they are done for etienne constrained him however he went on throwing sidelong glances in his direction 
and there were reticences and implications he was talking of the manager m hennebeau of his wife of his nephew the little negrel without naming them repeating that this could not go on that things were bound to smash up one of these fine days the misery was too great and he spoke of the workshops that were closing the workers who were going away during the last month he had given more than six pounds of bread a day he had heard the day before that m denolin the owner of a neighbouring pit could scarcely keep going he had also received a letter from lille full of disturbing details you know he whispered it comes from that person you saw here one evening but he was interrupted his wife entered in her turn a tall woman lean and keen with a long nose and violet cheeks she was a much more radical politician than her husband Pluchard's letter she said ah if that fellow was master things would soon go better etienne had been listening for a moment he understood and became excited over these ideas of misery and revenge this name suddenly uttered caused him to start he said aloud as if in spite of himself i know him Pluchard they looked at him he had to add yes i am an engine man he was my foreman at lille a capable man i have often talked with him rasseneur examined him afresh and there was a rapid change on his face a sudden sympathy at last he said to his wife it's Mayhew who brings me this gentleman one of his putters to see if there is a room for him upstairs and if we can give him credit for a fortnight then the matter was settled in four words there was a room the lodger had left that morning and the innkeeper who was very excited talked more freely repeating that he only asked possibilities from the masters without demanding like so many others things that were too hard to get his wife shrugged her shoulders and demanded justice absolutely good evening interrupted maheu all that won't prevent men from going down and as long as they go there will be people working themselves to death look how fresh you are these three years that you've been out of it yes i'm very much better declared rasseneur complacently etienne went as far as the door thanking the miner who was leaving but the latter nodded his head without adding a word and the young man watched him painfully climb up the road to the settlement madame rasseneur occupied with serving customers asked him to wait a minute when she would show him his room where he could clean himself should he remain he again felt hesitation a discomfort which made him regret the freedom of the open road the hunger beneath the sun endured with the joy of being one's own master it seemed to him that he had lived years from his arrival on the pit bank in the midst of squalls to those hours passed under the earth on his belly in the black passages and he shrank from beginning again it was unjust and too hard his man's pride revolted at the idea of becoming a crushed and blinded beast while etienne was thus debating with himself his eyes wandering over the immense plain gradually began to see it clearly he was surprised he had not imagined the horizon was like this when old bonbon had pointed it out to him in the darkness before him he plainly saw the Verreau in a fold of the earth with its wood and brick buildings the tarred screening shed the slate-covered steeple the engine room and the tall pale red chimney all massed together with that evil air but around these buildings the space extended and he had not imagined it so large changed into an inky sea by the ascending waves of coal soot bristling with high trestles which carried the rails of the footbridges encumbered in one corner with the timber supply which looked like the harvest of a mown forest towards the right the pit bank hid the view colossal as a barricade of giants already covered with grass in its older part consumed at the other end by an interior fire which had been burning for a year with a thick smoke leaving at the surface in the midst of the pale grey of the slates and sandstones long trails of bleeding rust then the fields unrolled the endless fields of wheat and beetroot naked at this season of the year marshes with scanty vegetation cut by a few stunted willows distant meadows separated by slender rows of poplars 
very far away little pale patches indicated towns marchiennes to the north monceau to the south while the forest of vandame to the east bordered the horizon with the violet line of its leafless trees and beneath the livid sky in the faint daylight of this winter afternoon it seemed as if all the blackness of the voreux and all its flying coal dust had fallen upon the plain powdering the trees sanding the roads sowing the earth etienne looked and what especially surprised him was a canal the canalized stream of the scarp which he had not seen in the night from the voreux to marchand this canal ran straight like a dull silver ribbon two leagues long an avenue lined by large trees raised above the low earth threading into space with the perspective of its green banks its pale water into which glided the vermilion of the boats near one pit there was a wharf with moored vessels which were laden directly from the trams at the footbridges afterwards the canal made a curve sloping by the marshes and the whole soul of that smooth plain appeared to lie in this geometrical stream which traversed it like a great road carting coal and iron etienne's glance went up from the canal to the settlement built on the height of which he could only distinguish the red tiles then his eyes rested again at the bottom of the clay slope toward the Voreux, on two enormous masses of bricks made and burnt on the spot a branch of the company's railroad passed behind a paling for the use of the pit they must be sending down the last miners to the earth cutting only one shrill note came from a truck pushed by men one felt no longer the unknown darkness the inexplicable thunder the flaming of mysterious stars afar the blast furnaces and the coke kilns had paled with the dawn there only remained unceasingly the escapement of the pump always breathing with the same thick long breath the ogre's breath of which he could now see the grey steam and which nothing could satiate then etienne suddenly made up his mind perhaps it seemed to see again catherine's clear eyes up there at the entrance to the settlement perhaps rather it was the wind of revolt which came from the Voreux. he did not know but he wished to go down again to the mine to suffer and to fight and he thought fiercely of those people bonmart had talked of the crouching and sated god to whom ten thousand starving men gave their flesh without knowing it End of section six. Section seven of Germinal by Emile Zola, translation by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part two, chapter one. The Gregoire's property, Pierlang, was situated two kilometers to the east of. Monceau. on the oiselle road the house was a large square building without style dating from the beginning of the last century of all the land that once belonged to it there only remained some thirty hectares enclosed by walls and easy to keep up the orchard and kitchen garden especially were everywhere spoken of being famous for the finest fruit and vegetables in the country for the rest there was no park only a small wood the avenue of old limes a vault of foliage three hundred metres long reaching from the gate to the porch was one of the curiosities of this bare plain on which one could count the large trees between marchien and Beaugeny. on that morning the gargoire got up at eight o'clock usually they never stirred until an hour later being heavy sleepers but last night's tempest had disturbed them and while her husband had gone at once to see if the wind had made any havoc madame gregoire went down into the kitchen in her slippers and flannel dressing-gown she was short and stout about fifty-eight years of age and retained a broad surprised dollish face beneath the dazzling whiteness of her hair melanie she said to the cook suppose you were to make the brioche this morning since the dough is ready mademoiselle will not get up for half an hour yet and she can eat it with her chocolate eh it will be a surprise 
the cook a lean old woman who had served them for thirty years laughed <laughs> that is true it will be a famous surprise my stove is alight and the oven must be hot and then honorine can help me a bit honorine a girl of some twenty years who had been taken in as a child and brought up in the house now acted as housemaid besides these two women the only other servant was the coachman francis who undertook the heavy work a gardener and his wife were occupied with the vegetables the fruit the flowers and the poultry yard and as service here was patriarchal this little world lived together like one large family on very good terms madame grégoire who had planned the surprise of the brioche in bed waited to see the dough put in the oven the kitchen was very large and one guessed it was the most important room in the house by its extreme cleanliness and by the arsenal of saucepans utensils and pots which filled it it gave an impression of good feeding provisions abounded hanging from hooks or in cupboards and let it be well glazed won't you madame grégoire said as she passed into the dining-room in spite of the hot air stove which warmed the whole house a coal fire enlivened this room in other respects it exhibited no luxury a large table chairs a mahogany sideboard only two deep easy chairs betrayed a love of comfort long happy hours of digestion they never went into the drawing-room they remained here in a family circle just then monsieur grégoire came back dressed in a thick faustian jacket he also was ruddy for his sixty years with large good-natured honest features beneath the snow of his curly hair he had seen the coachman and the gardener there had been no damage of importance nothing but a fallen chimney-pot every morning he liked to give a glance round Bialin, which was not large enough to cause him anxiety and from which he derived all the happiness of ownership and cecile he asked isn't she up yet then i can't make it out replied his wife i thought i heard her moving the table was set there were three cups on the white cloth they sent honorine to see what had become of mademoiselle but she came back immediately restraining her laughter stifling her voice as if she were still upstairs in the bedroom oh if monsieur and madame could see mademoiselle she sleeps oh she sleeps like an angel i can't imagine it it's a pleasure to look at her the father and mother exchanged tender looks he said smiling will you come and see the poor little darling she murmured i'll come and they went up together the room was the only luxurious one in the house it was draped in blue silk and the furniture was lacquered white with blue tracery a spoilt child's whim which her parents had gratified in the vague whiteness of the bed beneath the half-light which came through a curtain that was drawn back the young girl was sleeping with her cheek resting on her naked arm she was not pretty too healthy and too vigorous condition fully developed at eighteen but she had superb flesh the freshness of milk with her chestnut hair her round face and little wilful nose lost between her cheeks the coverlet had slipped down and she was breathing so softly that her respiration did not even lift her already well-developed bosom that horrible wind must have prevented her from closing her eyes said the mother softly the father imposed silence with a gesture both of them leant down and gazed with adoration on this girl in her virgin nakedness whom they had desired so long and who had come so late when they had no longer hoped for her they found her perfect not at all too fat and could never feed her sufficiently and she went on sleeping without feeling them near her with their faces against hers however a slight movement disturbed her motionless face they feared that they would wake her and went out on tiptoe hush said monsieur grégoire at the door if she has not slept we must leave her sleeping as long as she likes the darling agreed madame grégoire we will wait they went down and seated themselves in the easy chairs in the dining-room while the servants laughing at mademoiselle's sound sleep kept the chocolate on the stove without grumbling he took up a newspaper she knitted a large woolen quilt 
it was very hot and not a sound was heard in the silent house the gregoire's fortune about forty thousand francs a year was entirely invested in a share of the monceau mines they would complacently narrate its origin which dated from the very formation of the company towards the beginning of the last century there had been a mad search for coal between lille and valenciennes the success of those who held the concession which was afterwards to become the anzin company had turned all heads in every commune the ground was tested and societies were formed and concessions grew up in a night but among all the obstinate seekers of that epoch baron de ramon had certainly left the reputation for the most heroic intelligence for forty years he had struggled without yielding in the midst of continual obstacles early searches unsuccessful new pits abandoned at the end of long months of work landslips which build up borings sudden inundations which drowned the workmen hundreds of thousands of francs thrown into the earth then the squabbles of the management the panics of the shareholders the struggle with the lords of the soil who were resolved not to recognize royal concessions if no treaty was first made with themselves he had at last founded the association of de romans vauquinois and company to exploit the Monceau concession and the pits began to yield a small profit when two neighboring concessions that of Cogny, belonging to the comte de Cogny, and that of Oisel, belonging to the Cornille and Jeannard company had nearly overwhelmed him beneath the terrible assault of their competition happily on the twenty fifth august seventeen sixty a treaty was made between these three concessions uniting them into a single one the Monceau mining company was created such as it still exists to-day in the distribution they had divided the total property according to the standard of the money of the time into twenty-four sous of which each was subdivided into twelve deniers which made two hundred and eighty-eight deniers and as the denier was worth ten thousand francs the capital represented a sum of nearly three millions de ramon dying but triumphant received in this division six sous and three deniers in those days the baron possessed Bielin, which had three hundred hectares belonging to it and he had in his service as steward honore grégoire a picardy lad the great-grandfather of leon grégoire cecile's father when the monceau treaty was made honore who had laid up savings to the amount of some fifty thousand francs yielded tremblingly to his master's unshakable faith he took out ten thousand francs in fine crowns and took a denier though with the fear of robbing his children of that sum his son eugene in fact received very small dividends and as he had become a bourgeois and had been foolish enough to throw away the other forty thousand francs of the paternal inheritance in a company that came to grief he lived meanly enough but the interest of the denier gradually increased the fortune began with Felicien, who was able to realize a dream with which his grandfather the old steward had nursed his childhood the purchase of dismembered violin which he acquired as national property for a ludicrous sum however bad years followed it was necessary to await the conclusion of the revolutionary catastrophes and afterwards napoleon's bloody fall and it was leon grégoire who profited at a stupefying rate of progress by the timid and uneasy investment of his great-grandfather these poor ten thousand francs grew and multiplied with the company's prosperity from eighteen twenty they had brought in one hundred per cent ten thousand francs in eighteen forty four they had produced twenty thousand in eighteen fifty forty during two years the dividend had reached the prodigious figure of fifty thousand francs the value of the denier quoted at the lille bourse at a million had centupled in a century m grégoire who had been advised to sell out when this figure of a million was reached had refused with his smiling paternal air six months later an industrial crisis broke out the denier fell to six hundred thousand francs but he still smiled he regretted nothing for the grégoires had maintained an obstinate faith in their mind it would rise again god himself was not so solid 
then with his religious faith was mixed profound gratitude towards an investment which for a century had supported the family in doing nothing it was like a divinity of their own whom their egoism surrounded with a kind of worship the benefactor of the hearth lulling them in their great bed of idleness fattening them at their gluttonous table from father to son it had gone on why risk displeasing fate by doubting it and at the bottom of their fidelity there was a superstitious terror a fear lest the million of the denier might suddenly melt away if they were to realize it and to put it in a drawer it seemed to them more sheltered in the earth from which a race of miners generations of starving people extracted it for them a little every day as they needed it for the rest happiness reigned on this house m grégoire when very young had married the daughter of a marchand's druggist a plain penniless girl whom he adored and who repaid him with happiness she shut herself up in her household and worshipped her husband having no other will but his no difference of tastes separated them their desires were mingled in one idea of comfort and they had thus lived for forty years in affection and little mutual services it was a well-regulated existence the forty thousand francs were spent quietly and the savings expended on cecile whose tardy birth had for a moment disturbed the budget they still satisfied all her whims a second horse two more carriages toilettes sent from paris but they tasted in this one more joy they thought nothing too good for their daughter although they had such a horror of display that they had preserved the fashions of their youth every unprofitable expense seemed foolish to them suddenly the door opened and a loud voice called out hallo what now having breakfast without me it was cecile just come from her bed her eyes heavy with sleep she had simply put up her hair and flung on a white woolen dressing-gown no no said the mother you see we are all waiting eh has the wind prevented you from sleeping poor darling the young girl looked at her in great surprise has it been windy i didn't know anything about it i haven't moved all night then they thought this funny and all three began to laugh the servants who were bringing in the breakfast also broke out laughing so amused was the household at the idea that mademoiselle had been sleeping for twelve hours right off the sight of the brioche completed the expansion of their faces what is it cooked then said cecile that must be a surprise for me that'll be good now hot with the chocolate they sat down to table at last with the smoking chocolate in their cups and for a long time talked of nothing but the brioche melanie and honorine remained to give details about the cooking and watch them stuffing themselves with greasy lips saying that it was a pleasure to make a cake when one saw the masters enjoying it so much but the dogs began to bark loudly perhaps they announced the music mistress who came from marchiennes on mondays and fridays a professor of literature also came all the young girl's education was thus carried on at piolaine in happy ignorance with her childish whims throwing the book out of the window as soon as anything wearied her it is monsieur denoulin said honoré returning behind her denoulin a cousin of monsieur grégoire's appeared without ceremony with his loud voice his quick gestures he had the appearance of an old cavalry officer although over fifty his short hair and thick moustache were as black as ink yes it is i good day don't disturb yourselves he had sat down amid the family's exclamations they turned back at last to their chocolate have you anything to tell me asked m grégoire no nothing at all Denilin hastened to reply i came out on horseback to rub off the rust a bit and as i passed your door i thought i would just look in cecile questioned him about jeanne and lucy his daughters they were perfectly well the first was always at her painting while the other the elder was training her voice at the piano from morning till night and there was a slight quiver in his voice a disquiet which he concealed beneath bursts of gaiety Monsieur grégoire began again and everything goes well at the pit well i am upset over this dirty crisis 
ah we are paying for the prosperous years they have built too many workshops put down too many railways invested too much capital with a view to a large return and to-day the money is asleep they can't get any more to make the whole thing work luckily things are not desperate i shall get out of it somehow like his cousin he had inherited a denier in the Montsou mines but being an enterprising engineer tormented by the desire for a royal fortune he had hastened to sell out when the denier had reached a million for some months he had been maturing a scheme his wife possessed through an uncle the little concession at vandame where only two pits were open jean bart and gaston marie in an abandoned state and with such defective material that the output hardly covered the cost now he was meditating the repair of jean bart the renewal of the engine and the enlargement of the shaft so as to facilitate the descent keeping gaston marie only for exhaustion purposes they ought to be able to shovel up gold there he said the idea was sound only the million had been spent over it and this damnable industrial crisis broke out at the moment when large profits would have shown that he was right besides he was a bad manager with a rough kindness towards his workmen and since his wife's death he allowed himself to be pillaged and also gave the rein to his daughters the elder of whom talked of going on the stage while the younger had already had three landscapes refused at the salon both of them joyous amid the downfall and exhibiting in poverty their capacity for good household management you see leon he went on in a hesitating voice you were wrong not to sell out at the same time as i did now everything is going down you run risk and if you had confided your money to me you would have seen what we should have done at vandame in our mine m grégoire finished his chocolate without haste he replied peacefully never you know that i don't want to speculate i live quietly and it would be too foolish to worry my head over business affairs and as for Monsieur, it may continue to go down we shall always get our living out of it it doesn't do to be so diabolically greedy then listen it is you who will bite your fingers one day for Monsieur will rise again and cecile's grandchildren will still get their white bread out of it Denelin listened with a constrained smile then he murmured if i were to ask you to put a hundred thousand francs in my affair you would refuse but seeing the grégoire's disturbed face as he regretted having gone so far he put off his idea of a loan reserving it until the case was desperate oh i have not got to that it is a joke good heavens perhaps you are right the money that other people earn for you is the best to fatten on they changed the conversation cecile spoke again of her cousins whose tastes interested while at the same time this shocked her madame grégoire promised to take her daughter to see those dear little ones on the first fine day m grégoire however with a distracted air did not follow the conversation he added aloud if i were in your place i wouldn't persist any more i would treat with monceau they want it and you will get your money back he alluded to an old hatred which existed between the concession of monceau and that of vandame in spite of the latter's slight importance its powerful neighbour was enraged at seeing enclosed within its own sixty-seven communes the square league which did not belong to it and after having vainly tried to kill it had plotted to buy it at a low price when in a failing condition the war continued without truce each party stopped its galleries at two hundred metres from the other it was a duel to the last drop of blood although the managers and engineers maintained polite relations with each other Denelin's eyes had flamed up never he cried in his turn monceau shall never have vandame as long as i am alive i dined on thursday at hombeau's and i saw him fluttering him round me last autumn when the big man came to the administration building they made me all sorts of advances yes yes i know them those marquises and dukes and generals and ministers brigands who would take away even your shirt at the corner of a wood he could not cease besides m grégoire did not defend the administration of Monsieur. 
the six stewards established by the treaty of seventeen sixty who governed the company despotically and the five survivors of whom on every death chose the new member among the powerful and rich shareholders the opinion of the owners of Pelain, with his reasonable ideas was that these gentlemen were sometimes rather immoderate in their exaggerated love of money melanie had come to clear away the table outside the dogs were again barking and honorine was going to the door when cecile who was stifled by heat and food left the table no never mind it must be for my lesson deneland had also risen he watched the young girl go out and asked smiling well and the marriage with little negrel nothing has been settled said madame gregoire it is only an idea we must reflect <laughs> no doubt he went on with a gay laugh i believe that the nephew and the aunt what baffles me is that madame hanbeau should throw herself so on cecile's neck but m grégoire was indignant so distinguished a lady and fourteen years older than the young man it was monstrous he did not like joking on such subjects deneulin still laughing shook hands with him and left not yet said cecile coming back it is that woman with the two children you know mamma the miner's wife whom we met are they to come in here they hesitated were they very dirty no not very and they would leave their sabots in the porch already the father and mother had stretched themselves out in the depths of their large easy chairs they were digesting there the fear of change of air decided them let them come in Henri. then maheude and her little ones entered frozen and hungry seized by fright on finding themselves in this room which was so warm and smelled so nicely of the brioche End of section 7section eight of germana by emile zola translation by havelock ellis the slipper box recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part two chapter two the room remained shut up and the shutters had allowed gradual streaks of daylight to form a fan on the ceiling the confined air stupefied them so that they continued their night's slumber lenore and henri in each other's arms alzire with her head back lying on her hump while father bonmort having the bed of zacharie and jalin to himself snored with open mouth no sound came from the closet where maheude had gone to sleep again while suckling estelle her breast hanging to one side the child lying across her belly stuffed with milk overcome also and stifling in the soft flesh of the bosom the clock below struck six along the front of the settlement one heard the sound of doors then the clatter of savants along the pavements the screening women were going to the pit and silence again fell until seven o'clock then shutters were drawn back yawns and coughs were heard through the walls for a long time a coffee mill scraped but no one awoke in the room suddenly a sound of blows and shouts far away made azir sit up she was conscious of the time and ran barefooted to shake her mother 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 it is late you have to go out take care you are crushing estelle and she saved the child half stifled beneath the enormous mass of the breasts good gracious stammered Mahut rubbing her eyes i'm so knocked up i could sleep all day dress lenore and henri i'll take them with me and you can take care of estelle i don't want to drag her along for fear of hurting her this dog's weather she hastily washed herself and put on an old blue skirt her cleanest and a loose jacket of gray wool in which she had made two patches the evening before and the soup good gracious she muttered again when her mother had gone down upsetting everything alzire went back into the room taking with her estelle who had begun screaming but she was used to the little one's rages at eight she had all a woman's tender cunning in soothing and amusing her she gently placed her in her still warm bed and put her to sleep again giving her a finger to suck it was time for now another disturbance broke out 
and she had to make peace between lenore and henri who at last awoke these children could never get on together it was only when they were asleep that they put their hands round one another's necks the girl who was six years old as soon as she was awake set on the boy her junior by two years who received her blows without returning them both of them had the same kind of head which was too large for them as if blown out with disorderly yellow hair alzire had to pull her sister by the legs threatening to take the skin off her bottom then there was stamping over the washing and over every garment that she put on to them the shutters remained closed so as not to disturb father bonnemort's sleep he went on snoring amid the children's frightful clatter it's ready are you coming up there shouted maheu she had put back the blinds and stirred up the fire adding some coal to it her hope was that the old man had not swallowed all the soup but she found the saucepan dry and cooked a handful of vermicelli which she had been keeping for three days in reserve they could swallow it with water without butter as there could not be any remaining from the day before and she was surprised to find that catherine in preparing the bricks had performed the miracle of leaving a piece as large as a nut but this time the cupboard was indeed empty nothing not a crust not an odd fragment not a bone to gnaw what was to become of them if maigrat persisted in cutting short their credit and if the piolaine people would not give them the five francs when the men and the girl returned from the pit they would want to eat for unfortunately it had not yet been found out how to live without eating come down will you she cried out getting angry i ought to be gone by this when alzire and the children were there she divided the vermicelli in three small portions she herself was not hungry she said although catherine had already poured water on the coffee dregs of the day before she did so over again and swallowed two large glasses of coffee so weak that it looked like rusty water that would keep her up all the same listen she repeated to alzire you must let your grandfather sleep you must watch that estelle does not knock her head and if she wakes or if she howls too much here take this bit of sugar and melt it and give it her in spoonfuls i know that you are sensible and won't eat it yourself and school mother school well that must be left for another day i want you and the soup would you like me to make it if you come back late soup soup no wait till i come alzire with the precocious intelligence of a little invalid girl could make soup very well she must have understood for she did not insist now the whole settlement was awake bands of children were going to school and one heard the trailing noise of their clogs eight o'clock struck and a growing murmur of chatter arose on the left among the levac people the women were commencing their day around the coffee-pots with their fists on their hips their tongues turning without ceasing like millstones a faded head with thick lips and flattened nose was pressed against a window-pane calling out got some news stop a bit no no later on replied maheu i have to go out and for fear of giving way to the offer of a glass of hot coffee she pushed lenore and henri and set out with them up above father bonnemort was still snoring with a rhythmic snore which rocked the house outside maheude was surprised to find that the wind was no longer blowing there had been a sudden thaw the sky was earth-coloured the walls were sticky with greenish moisture and the roads were covered with pitch-like mud a special kind of mud peculiar to the coal country as black as diluted soot thick and tenacious enough to pull off her sabots suddenly she boxed lenore's ears because the little one amused herself by piling the mud on her clogs as on the end of a shovel on leaving the settlement she had gone along by the pit bank and followed the road of the canal making a short cut through broken up paths across rough country shut in by mossy palings sheds succeeded one another long workshop buildings tall chimneys spitting out soot and soiling this ravaged suburb of an industrial district behind a clump of poplars the old 
Requilot pit exhibited its crumbling steeple of which the large skeleton alone stood upright and turning to the right maheude found herself on the high road stop stop dirty pig i'll teach you to make mincemeat now it was henri who had taken a handful of mud and was moulding it the two children had their ears impartially boxed and were brought into good order looking out of the corner of their eyes at the mud pies they had made they dragged along already exhausted by their efforts to unstick their shoes at every step on the martian side the road unrolled its two leagues of pavement which stretched straight as a ribbon soaked in cart grease between the reddish fields but on the other side it went winding down through monceau which was built on the slope of a large undulation in the plain these roads in the nord drawn like a string between manufacturing towns with their slight curves their slow ascents gradually get lined with houses and tend to make the department one laborious city the little brick houses daubed over to enliven the climate some yellow others blue others black the last no doubt in order to reach at once their final shade went serpentining down to right and to left to the bottom of the slope a few large two-story villas the dwellings of the heads of the workshops made gaps in the serried line of narrow facades a church also of brick looked like a new model of a large furnace with its square tower already stained by the floating coal dust and amid the sugar works the rope works and the flour mills there stood out ballrooms restaurants and beer shops which were so numerous that to every thousand houses there were more than five hundred inns as she approached the company's yards a vast series of storehouses and workshops maheude decided to take henri and lenoc by the hand one on the right the other on the left beyond was situated the house of the director m hanbeau a sort of vast chalet separated from the road by a grating and then a garden in which some lean trees vegetated just then a carriage had stopped before the door and a gentleman with decorations and a lady in a fur cloak alighted visitors just arrived from paris at the marchiennes station for madame hambeau who appeared in the shadow of the porch was uttering exclamations of surprise and joy come along then dawdlers growled maheude pulling the two little ones who were standing in the mud when she arrived at maigrat's she was quite excited maigrat lived close to the manager only a wall separated the latter's ground from his own small house and he had there a warehouse a long building which opened on to the road as a shop without a front he kept everything there grocery cooked meats fruit and sold bread beer and saucepans formerly an overseer at the baroque he had started with a small canteen then thanks to the protection of his superiors his business had enlarged gradually killing the monceau retail trade he centralized merchandise and the considerable custom of the settlements enabled him to sell more cheaply and to give longer credit besides he had remained in the company's hands and they had built his small house and his shop here i am again monsieur maigret said Mahud humbly finding him standing in front of his door he looked at her without replying he was a stout cold polite man and he prided himself on never changing his mind now you won't send me away again like yesterday we must have bread from now to saturday sure enough we owe you sixty francs these two years she explained in short painful phrases it was an old debt contracted during the last strike twenty times over they had promised to settle it but they had not been able they could not even give him forty sous a fortnight and then a misfortune had happened two days before she had been obliged to pay twenty francs to a shoemaker who threatened to seize their things and that was why they were without a sou otherwise they would have been able to go on until saturday like the others maigret with protruded belly and folded arms shook his head at every supplication only two loaves monsieur maigret i am reasonable i don't ask for coffee only two three pound loaves a day no he shouted at last at the top of his voice 
his wife had appeared a pitiful creature who passed all her days over a ledger without even daring to lift her head she moved away frightened at seeing this unfortunate woman turning her ardent beseeching eyes towards her it was said that she yielded the conjugal bed to the putters among the customers it was a known fact that when a miner wished to prolong his credit he had only to send his daughter or his wife plain or pretty it mattered not provided they were complacent maheu still imploring maigret with her look felt herself uncomfortable under the pale keenness of his small eyes which seemed to undress her it made her angry she would have understood before she had had seven children when she was young and she went off violently dragging lenore and henri who were occupied in picking up nutshells from the gutter where they were making investigations this won't bring you luck monsieur maigret remember now there only remained the Piolaine people if these would not throw her a five-franc piece she might as well lie down and die she had taken the choiselle road on the left the administration building was there at the corner of the road a veritable brick palace where the great people from paris princes and generals and members of the government came every autumn to give large dinners as she walked she was already spending the five francs first bread then coffee afterwards a quarter of butter a bushel of potatoes for the morning soup and the evening stew finally perhaps a bit of pig's chitterlings for the father needed meat the cure of Monceau, abbe joueur was passing holding up his cassock with the delicate air of a fat well-nourished cat afraid of wetting its fur he was a mild man who pretended not to interest himself in anything so as not to vex either the workers or the masters good day monsieur le cure without stopping he smiled at the children and left her planted in the middle of the road she was not religious but she had suddenly imagined that this priest would give her something and the journey began again through the black sticky mud there were still two kilometres to walk and the little ones dragged behind more than ever for they were frightened and no longer amused themselves to right and to left of the path the same vague landscape unrolled enclosed within mossy palings the same factory buildings dirty with smoke bristling with tall chimneys then the flat land was spread out in immense open fields like an ocean of brown clods without a tree trunk as far as the purplish line of the forest of vandame carry me mother she carried them one after the other puddles made holes in the pathway and she pulled up her clothes fearful of arriving too dirty three times she nearly fell so sticky was that confounded pavement and as they at last arrived before the porch two enormous dogs threw themselves upon them barking so loudly that the little ones yelled with terror the coachman was obliged to take a whip to them leave your sabbats and come in repeated honorine in the dining-room the mother and children stood motionless dazed by the sudden heat and very constrained beneath the gaze of this old lady and gentleman who were stretched out in their easy chairs cecile said the old lady fulfil your little duties the gregoires charged cecile with their charities it was part of their idea of a good education one must be charitable they said themselves that their house was the house of god besides they flattered themselves that they performed their charity with intelligence and they were exercised by a constant fear lest they should be deceived and so encouraged vice so they never gave money never not ten sous not two sous for it is a well-known fact that as soon as a poor man gets two sous he drinks them their alms were therefore always in kind especially in warm clothing distributed during the winter to needy children oh the poor dears exclaimed cecile how pale they are from the cold honorine go and look for the parcel in the cupboard the servants were also gazing at these miserable creatures with the pity and vague uneasiness of girls who are in no difficulty about their own dinners while the housemaid went upstairs the cook forgot her duties leaving the rest of the brioche on the table and stood there swinging her empty hands i still have two woolen dresses and some comforters cecile went on you will see how warm they will be 
the poor dears then maheude found her tongue and stammered thank you so much mademoiselle you are all too good tears had filled her eyes she thought herself sure of the five francs and was only preoccupied by the way in which she would ask for them if they were not offered to her the housemaid did not reappear and there was a moment of embarrassed silence from the mother's skirts the little ones opened their eyes wide and gazed at the brioche you only have these two asked madame gregoire in order to break the silence oh madame i have seven monsieur gregoire who had gone back to his newspaper sat up indignantly seven children but why good god it is imprudent murmured the old lady maheude made a vague gesture of apology what would you have one doesn't think about it at all they come quite naturally and then when they grow up they bring something in and that makes the household go take their case they could get on if it was not for the grandfather who was getting quite stiff and if it was not that among the lot only two of her sons and her eldest daughter were old enough to go down into the pit it was necessary all the same to feed the little ones who brought nothing in then said madame gregoire you have worked for a long time at the mines a silent laugh lit up maheude's pale face ah yes ah yes i went down till i was twenty the doctor said that i should stay down for good after i had been confined the second time because it seems that made something go wrong in my inside besides then i got married and i had enough to do in the house but on my husband's side you see they have been down there for ages it goes up from grandfather to grandfather one doesn't know how far back quite to the beginning when they first took the pick down there at Requillon. monsieur gregoire thoughtfully contemplated this woman and these pitiful children with their waxy flesh their discoloured hair the degeneration which stunted them gnawed by anemia and with the melancholy ugliness of starvelings there was silence again and one only heard the burning coal as it gave out a jet of gas the moist room had that heavy air of comfort in which our middle-class nooks of happiness slumber what is she doing then exclaimed cecile impatiently melanie go up and tell her that the parcel is at the bottom of the cupboard on the left in the meanwhile monsieur gregoire repeated aloud the reflections inspired by the sight of these starving ones there is evil in this world it is quite true but my good woman it must also be said that work people are never prudent thus instead of putting aside a few sous like our peasants miners drink get into debt and end by not having enough to support their families monsieur is right replied maheude sturdily they don't always keep to the right path that's what i'm always saying to the ne'er-do-wells when they complain now i have been lucky my husband doesn't drink all the same on feast sundays he sometimes takes a drop too much but it never goes farther it is all the nicer of him since before our marriage he drank like a hog begging your pardon and yet you know it doesn't help us much that he is so sensible there are days like to-day when you might turn out all the drawers in the house and not find a farthing she wished to suggest to them the idea of the five-franc piece and went on in her low voice explaining the fatal debt small at first then large and overwhelming they paid regularly for many fortnights but one day they got behind and then it was all up they could never catch up again the gulf widened and the men became disgusted with work which did not even allow them to pay their way do what they could there was nothing but difficulties until death besides it must be understood that a collier needed a glass to wash away the dust it began there and then he was always in the end when worries came without complaining of any one it might be that the workmen did not earn as much as they ought to i thought said madame gregoire that the company gave you lodging and firing maheude glanced sideways at the gleaming coal in the fireplace yes yes they give us coal not very grand but it burns as to lodging it only costs six francs a month that sounds like nothing but it is often pretty hard to pay to-day they might cut me up into bits without getting two sous out of me where there's nothing there's nothing the lady and gentleman were silent 
softly stretched out and gradually wearied and disquieted by the exhibition of this wretchedness she feared she had wounded them and added with a stolid and just air of a practical woman oh i didn't want to complain things are like this and one has to put up with them all the more that it's no good struggling perhaps we shouldn't change anything the best is is it not to try and live honestly in the place in which the good god has put us monsieur gregoire approved this emphatically with such sentiments my good woman one is above misfortune honorine and melanie at last brought the parcel cecile unfastened it and took out the two dresses she added comforters even stockings and mittens they would all fit beautifully she hastened and made the servants wrap up the chosen garments for her music mistress had just arrived and she pushed the mother and children towards the door oh, we are very short stammered maheude if we only had a five-franc piece the phrase was stifled for the maheus were proud and never begged cecile looked uneasily at her father but the latter refused decisively with an air of duty no it is not our custom we cannot do it then the young girl moved by the mother's overwhelmed face wished to do all she could for the children they were still looking fixedly at the brioche she cut it in two and gave it to them here this is for you then taking the pieces back she asked for an old newspaper wait you must share with your brothers and sisters and beneath the tender gaze of her parents she finally pushed them out of the room the poor starving urchins went off holding the brioche respectfully in their benumbed little hands maheud dragged her children along the road seeing neither the desert fields nor the black mud nor the great livid sky as she passed through Monceau, she resolutely entered maigrat's shop and begged so persistently that at last she carried away two loaves coffee butter and even her five-franc piece for the man also lent money by the week it was not her that he wanted it was catherine she understood that when he advised her to send her daughter for provisions they would see about that catherine would box his ears if he came too close under her nose End of section eight. Section nine of Germinal by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Mamperard. Part two, chapter three. Eleven o'clock struck at the little church in the Deux Cent Quarante settlement a brick chapel to which abbe joie came to say mass on sundays and the school beside it also of brick one heard the faltering voices of the children in spite of windows closed against the outside cold the wide passages divided into little gardens back to back between the four large blocks of uniform houses were deserted and these gardens devastated by the winter exhibited the destitution of their marley soil lumped and spotted by the last vegetables they were making soup chimneys were smoking a woman appeared at distant intervals along the fronts opened a door and disappeared from one end to the other on the pavement the pipes dripped into tubs although it was no longer raining so charged was this gray sky with moistness and the village built altogether in the midst of the vast plain and edged by its black roads as by a morning border had no touch of joyousness about it save the regular bands of its red tiles constantly washed by showers when maheude returned she went out of her way to buy potatoes from an overseer's wife whose crop was not yet exhausted behind a curtain of sickly poplars the only trees in these flat regions was a group of isolated buildings houses placed four together and surrounded by their gardens as the company reserved this new experiment for the captains the workpeople called this corner of the hamlet the settlement of the Badesway, just as they called their own settlement pete dets in good-humoured irony of their wretchedness eh here we are said maheude laden with parcels pushing in lenore and henri covered with mud and quite tired out in front of the fire estelle was screaming cradled in alzire's arms 
the latter having no more sugar and not knowing how to soothe her had decided to pretend to give her the breast this ruse often succeeded but this time it was in vain for her to open her dress and to press the mouth against the lean breast of an eight-year-old invalid the child was enraged at biting the skin and drawing nothing pass her to me cried the mother as soon as she found herself free she won't let us say a word when she had taken from her bodice a breast as heavy as a leather bottle to the neck of which the brawler hung suddenly silent they were at last able to talk otherwise everything was going on well the little housekeeper had kept up the fire and had swept and arranged the room and in the silence they heard upstairs the grandfather snoring the same rhythmic snoring which had not stopped for a moment what a lot of things murmured alzir smiling at the provisions if you like mother i'll make the soup the table was encumbered a parcel of clothes two loaves potatoes butter coffee chicory and half a pound of pig's chitterlings oh the soup said Mehir with an air of fatigue we must gather some sorrel and pull up some leeks no i will make some for the men afterwards put some potatoes on to boil we'll eat them with a little butter and some coffee eh don't forget the coffee but suddenly she thought of the brioche she looked at the empty hands of lenore and henri who were fighting on the floor already rested and lively these gluttons had slyly eaten the brioche on the road she boxed their ears while Elsir, who was putting the t saucepan on the fire tried to appease her let them be mother if the brioche was for me you know i don't mind a bit they were hungry walking so far midday struck they heard the clogs of the children coming out of school the potatoes were cooked and the coffee thickened by a good half of chicory was passing through the percolator with a singing noise of large drops one corner of the table was free but the mother only was eating there the three children were satisfied with their knees and all the time the little boy with silent voracity looked without saying anything at the chitterlings excited by the greasy paper Mehid was drinking her coffee in little sips with her hands round the glass to warm them when father bonmort came down usually he rose late and his breakfast waited for him on the fire but to-day he began to grumble because there was no soup then when his daughter-in-law said to him that one cannot always do what one likes he ate his potatoes in silence from time to time he got up to spit in the ashes for cleanliness and settled in his chair he rolled his food round in his mouth with lowered head and dull eyes ah i forgot mother said alzir the neighbor came her mother interrupted her she bothers me there was a deep rancor against the levaque woman who had pleaded poverty the day before to avoid lending her anything while she knew that she was just then in comfort since her lodger Bataloup, had paid his fortnight in advance in the settlement they did not usually lend from household to household here you remind me said Mahid. wrap up a milkful of coffee i will take it to piron i owe it her from the day before yesterday and when her daughter had prepared the packet she added that she would come back immediately to put the men's soup on the fire then she went out with estelle in her arms leaving old bonnemart to chew his potatoes leisurely while denor and henri fought for the fallen parings instead of going round maheude went straight across through the gardens for fear lest levaque's wife should call her her garden was just next to that of the perrons and in the dilapidated trellis work which separated them there was a hole through which they fraternized the common well was there serving four households beside it behind a clump of feeble lilacs was situated the shed a low building full of old tools in which were brought up the rabbits which were eaten on feast days one o'clock struck it was the hour for coffee and not a soul was to be seen at the doors or windows only a workman belonging to the earth-cutting waiting the hour for descent was digging up his patch of vegetable ground without raising his head but as Mahid arrived opposite the other block of buildings she was surprised to see a gentleman and two ladies in front of the church 
she stopped a moment and recognized them it was madame hambeau bringing her guests the decorated gentleman and the lady in the fur mantle to see the settlement oh why did you take this trouble exclaimed pierron when maheu had returned the coffee there was no hurry she was twenty-eight and was considered the beauty of the settlement dark with a low forehead large eyes straight mouth and coquettish as well with the neatness of a cat and with a good figure for she had had no children her mother Brule, the widow of a pikeman who died in the mine after having sent her daughter to work in a factory swearing that she should never marry a collier had never ceased to be angry since she had married somewhat late Peron, a widower with a girl of eight however the household lived very happily in the midst of chatter of scandals which circulated concerning the husband's complacence and the wife's lovers no debts meet twice a week a house kept so clean that one could see oneself in the saucepans as an additional piece of luck thanks to favors the company had authorized her to sell bonbons and biscuits jars of which she exhibited on two boards behind the window panes there was six or seven sous profit a day and sometimes twelve on sundays the only drawback to all this happiness was mother Boule, who screamed with all the rage of an old revolutionary having to avenge the death of her man on the masters and little lydie who pocketed in the shape of frequent blows the passions of the family how big she is already said pierron simpering at estelle oh the trouble that it gives don't talk of it said maheu you are lucky not to have any at least you can keep clean although everything was in order in her house and she scrubbed every saturday she glanced with a jealous housekeeper's eye over this clean room in which there was even a certain coquetry gilt faces on the sideboard a mirror three framed prints Perron was about to drink her coffee alone all her people being at the pit you'll have a glass with me she said no thanks i've just swallowed mine what does that matter in fact it mattered nothing and both began drinking slowly between the jars of biscuits and bonbons their eyes rested on the opposite houses of which the little curtains in the windows formed a row revealing by their greater or less whiteness the virtues of the housekeepers those of the lavaques were very dirty veritable kitchen clouts which seemed to have wiped the bottoms of the saucepans how can they live in such dirt murmured Perron. then maheu began and did not stop ah if she had had a lodger like that bouteloup she would have made the household go when one knew how to do it a lodger was an excellent thing only one ought not to sleep with him and then the husband had taken to drink beat his wife and ran after the singers at the monceau cafe concerts Perron assumed an air of profound disgust these singers gave all sorts of diseases there was one of Moiselle who had infected a whole pit what surprises me is that you let your son go with their girl ah yes but just stop it then their garden is next to ours zachary was always there in summer with philomene behind the lilacs and they didn't put themselves up on the shed one couldn't draw water at the well without surprising them it was the usual history of the promiscuities of the settlement boys and girls became corrupted together throwing themselves on their backsides as they said on the low sloping roof of the shed when twilight came on all the putters got their first child there when they did not take the trouble to go to Requillard or into the cornfields it was of no consequence they married afterwards only the mothers were angry when their lads began too soon for a lad who married no longer brought anything into the family in your place i would have done with it said Perron sensibly your zacharie has already filled her twice and they will go on and get spliced anyhow the money is gone Mahend was furious and raised her hands listen to this i will curse them if they get spliced doesn't zacharie owe us any respect he has cost us something hasn't he very well he must return before getting a wife to hang on him what will become of us eh if our children begin at once to work for others might as well die however she grew calm 
and speaking in a general way we shall see later it is fine and strong your coffee you make it proper and after a quarter of an hour spent over other stories she ran off exclaiming that the men's soup was not yet made outside the children were going back to school a few women were showing themselves at their doors looking at madame hombeau who with lifted finger was explaining the settlement to her guests this visit began to stir up the village the earth cutting man stopped digging for a moment and two disturbed fowls took fright in the gardens as Mehud returned she ran against the levaque woman who had come out to stop dr van der Hagen, a doctor of the company a small hurried man overwhelmed by work who gave his advice as he walked so she said i can't sleep i feel ill everywhere i must tell you about it he spoke to them all familiarly and replied without stopping just leave me alone you drink too much coffee and my husband sir said maheu in her turn you must come and see him he always has those pains in his legs it is you who take too much out of him just leave me alone the two women were left to gaze at the doctor's retreating back come in then said the levaque woman when she had exchanged a despairing shrug with her neighbour you know there is something new and you will take a little coffee it is quite fresh maheude refused but without energy well a drop at all events not to disoblige and she entered the room was black with dirt the floor and the walls spotted with grease the sideboard and the table sticky with filth and the stink of a badly kept house took you by the throat near the fire with his elbows on the table and his nose in his plate but a look a broad stout placid man still young for thirty-five was finishing the remains of his boiled beef while standing in front of him little Achille, philomene's first-born who was already in his third year was looking at him in the silent supplicating way of a gluttonous animal the lodger very kind behind his big brown beard from time to time stuffed a piece of meat into his mouth wait till i sugar it said the levaque woman putting some brown sugar beforehand into the coffee-pot six years older than he was she was hideous and worn out with her bosom hanging on her belly and her belly on her thighs with a flattened muzzle and grayish hair always uncombed he had taken her naturally without choosing the same as he did his soup in which he found hairs or his bed of which the sheets lasted for three months she was part of the lodging the husband liked repeating that good reckonings make good friends i was going to tell you she went on that perron was seen yesterday prowling about on the bas de Soie side the gentleman you know of was waiting for her behind the rossignols and they went off together along the canal eh that's nice isn't it a married woman gracious said maheude perron before marrying her used to give the captain rabbits now it costs him less to lend his wife Badalou began to laugh enormously and threw a fragment of sauced bread into Achille's mouth the two women went on relieving themselves with regard to perron a flirt no prettier than any one else but always occupied in looking after every freckle of her skin and washing herself and putting on pomade anyhow it was the husband's affair if he liked that sort of thing there were men so ambitious that they would wipe the masters behinds to hear them say thank you and they were only interrupted by the arrival of a neighbor bringing in a little urchin of nine months desiree philomene's youngest philomene taking her breakfast at the screening shed had arranged that they should bring her little one down here where she suckled it seated for a moment in the coal i can't leave mine for a moment she screams directly said Mahou looking at estelle who was asleep in her arms but she did not succeed in avoiding the domestic affair which she had read in the other's eyes i say now we ought to get that settled at first the two mothers without need for talking about it had agreed not to conclude the marriage if zacharie's mother wished to get her son's wages as long as possible philomene's mother was enraged at the idea of abandoning her daughter's wages there was no hurry the second mother had even preferred to keep the little one as long as there was only one but when it began to grow and eat and another one came she found that she was losing 
and furiously pushed on the marriage like a woman who does not care to throw away her money zachary has drawn his lot she went on and there's nothing in the way when shall it be wait till the fine weather replied maheu constrainedly they are a nuisance these affairs as if they couldn't wait to be married before going together my word i would strangle catherine if i knew that she had done that the other woman shrugged her shoulders let be she'll do like the others but a look with the tranquillity of a man who is at home searched about on the dresser for bread vegetables for levaque's soup potatoes and leeks lay about on a corner of the table half peeled taken up and dropped a dozen times in the midst of continual gossiping the woman was about to go on with them again when she dropped them anew and planted herself before the window what's that there why there's madame hambeau with some people they are going into perron's at once both of them started again on the subject of perron oh whenever the company brought any visitors to the settlement they never failed to go straight to her place because it was clean no doubt they never told them stories about the head captain one can afford to be clean when one has lovers who earn three thousand francs and are lodged and warmed without counting presents if it was clean above it was not clean underneath and all the time that the visitors remained opposite they went on chattering there they are coming out said the levaque woman at last they are going all around why look my dear i believe they are going into your place maheud was seized with fear who knows whether alzire had sponged over the table and her soup also which was not yet ready she stammered a good day and ran off home without a single glance aside but everything was bright alzire very seriously with a cloth in front of her had set about making the soup saying that her mother did not return she had pulled up the last leaks from the garden gathered the sorrel and was just then cleaning the vegetables while a large kettle on the fire was heating the water for the men's baths when they should return henri and lenore were good for once being absorbed in tearing up an old almanac father bonmort was smoking his pipe in silence as maheude was getting her breath madame humble knocked you will allow me will you not my good woman tall and fair a little heavy in her superb maturity of four years she smiled with an effort of affability without showing too prominently her fear of soiling her bronze silk dress and black velvet mantle come in come in she said to her guests we are not disturbing any one now isn't this clean again and this good woman has seven children all our households are like this i ought to explain to you that the company rents them the house at six francs a month a large room on the ground floor two rooms above a cellar and a garden the decorated gentleman and the lady in the fur cloak arrived that morning by train from paris opened their eyes vaguely exhibiting on their faces their astonishment at all these new things which took them out of their element and a garden repeated the lady one could live here it is charming we give them more coal than they can burn went on madame hambeau a doctor visits them twice a week and when they are old they receive pensions although nothing is held back from their wages a thibault a real land of milk and honey murmured the gentleman in delight Mahil had hastened to offer chairs the ladies refused madame hambeau was already getting tired happy for a moment to amuse herself in the weariness of her exile by playing the part of exhibiting the beasts but immediately disgusted by the sickly odour of wretchedness in spite of the special cleanliness of the houses into which she ventured besides she was only repeating odd phrases which she had overheard without ever troubling herself further about this race of workpeople who were labouring and suffering beside her what beautiful children murmured the lady who thought them hideous with their large heads beneath their bushy straw-coloured hair and maheud had to tell their ages they also asked her questions about estelle out of politeness father bonnemort respectfully took his pipe out of his mouth but he was not the less a subject of uneasiness so worn out by his forty years underground with his stiff limbs deformed body and earthy face and as a violent spasm of coughing took him he preferred to go and spit outside 
with the idea that his black expectoration would make people uncomfortable alzire received all the compliments what an excellent little housekeeper with her cloth they congratulated the mother on having a little daughter so sensible for her age and none spoke of the hump though looks of uneasy compassion were constantly turned towards the poor little invalid now concluded madame hanbeau if they ask you about our settlements at paris you will know what to reply never more noise than this patriarchal manners all happy and well off as you see a place where you might come to recruit a little on account of the good air and the tranquillity it is marvellous marvellous exclaimed the gentleman in a final outburst of enthusiasm they left with that enchanted air with which people leave a boot in a fair and the hood who accompanied them remained on the threshold while they went away slowly talking very loudly the streets were full of people and they had to pass through several groups of women attracted by the news of their visit which was hawked from house to house just then levaque in front of her door had stopped Perron, who was drawn by curiosity both of them affected a painful surprise what now were these people going to bed at the Malheus? but it was not so very delightful a place always without a sou with all that they earn lord when people have vices i have just heard that she went this morning to beck at pierlaine and maigret who had refused them bread has given them something we know how maigret pays himself on her oh no that would need some courage it's catherine that he's after why did she have the cheek to say just now that she would strangle catherine if she were to come to that as a big cheval for ever so long had not put her backside on the shed hush here they are then levaque and pierron with a peaceful air and without impolite curiosity contented themselves with watching the visitors out of the corners of their eyes then by a gesture they quickly called maheude who was still carrying estelle in her arms and all three motionless watched the well-clad backs of madame hombeau and her guests slowly disappear when they were some thirty paces off the gossiping recommenced with redoubled vigour they carry plenty of money on their skins worth more than themselves perhaps ah sure i don't know the other but the one that belongs here i wouldn't give four sous for her big as she is they do tell stories eh what stories why she has men first the engineer that lean little creature oh he's too small she would lose him in the sheets what does that matter if it amuses her i don't trust a woman who puts on such proud airs and never seems to be pleased where she is just look how she wags her rump as if she felt content for us all is that nice the visitors went along at the same slow pace still talking when a carriage stopped in the road before the church a gentleman of about forty-eight got out of it dressed in a black frock coat and with a very dark complexion and an authoritative correct expression the husband murmured levaque lowering her voice as if he could hear her seized by that hierarchical bit fear which the manager inspired in his ten thousand workpeople it's true though that he has a cuckold's head that man now the whole settlement was out of doors the curiosity of the women increased the groups approached each other and were melted into one crowd while bands of urchins with unwiped noses and gaping mouths dawdled along the pavements for a moment the schoolmaster's pale head was also seen behind the schoolhouse hedge among the gardens the man who was digging stood with one foot on his spade and with rounded eyes and the murmur of gossiping gradually increased with the sound of rattles like a gust of wind among dry leaves it was especially before the levaque's door that the crowd was thickest two women had come forward then ten then twenty Perron was prudently silent now that there were too many ears about maheu one of the more reasonable also contented herself with looking on and to calm estelle who was awake and screaming she had tranquilly drawn out her suckling animal's breast which hung swaying as if pulled down by the continual running of its milk when m hambeau had seated the ladies in the carriage which went off in the direction of marchand 
there was a final explosion of clattering voices all the women gesticulating and talking in each other's faces in the midst of a tumult as of an anthill in revolution but three o'clock struck the workers of the earth cutting Badaluk and the others had set out suddenly around the church appeared the first colliers returning from the pit with black faces and damp garments folding their arms and expanding their backs then there was confusion among the women they all began to run home with terror of housekeepers who had been led astray by too much coffee and too much tattle and one heard nothing more than this restless cry pregnant with quarrels good lord and my soup and my soup which isn't ready End of section nine. Section ten of Germano by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part two, chapter four. When Mahieu came in after having left Etienne at Rasseneur's, he found catherine zacharie and jalin seated at the table finishing their soup on returning from the pit they were always so hungry that they ate in their damp clothes without even cleaning themselves and no one was waited for the table was laid from morning to night there was always someone there swallowing his portion according to the chances of work as he entered the door maheu saw the provisions he said nothing but his uneasy face lighted up all the morning the emptiness of the cupboard the thought of the house without coffee and without butter had been troubling him the recollection came to him painfully while he was hammering at the seam stifled at the bottom of the cutting what would his wife do and what would become of them if she were to return with empty hands and now here was everything she would tell him about it later on he laughed with satisfaction catherine and jean Lin had risen and were taking their coffee standing while zacharie not filled with the soup cut himself a large slice of bread and covered it with butter although he saw the chitterlings on a plate he did not touch them for meat was for the father when there was only enough for one all of them had washed down their soup with a big bumper of fresh water the good clear drink of the fortnight's end i have no beer said maheu when the father had seated himself in his turn i wanted to keep a little money but if you would like some the little one can go and fetch a pint he looked at her in astonishment what she had money too no no he said i've had a glass it's all right and mayhew began to swallow by slow spoonfuls the paste of bread potatoes leeks and sorrel piled up in the bowl which served him as a plate mayhew without putting estelle down helped azir to give him all that he required pushed near him the butter and the meat and put his coffee on the fire to keep it quite hot in the meanwhile beside the fire they began to wash themselves in the half of a barrel transformed into a tub catherine whose turn came first had filled it with warm water and she undressed herself tranquilly took off her cap her jacket her breeches and even her chemise habituated to this since the age of eight having grown up without seeing any harm in it she only turned with her stomach to the fire then rubbed herself vigorously with black soap no one looked at her even lenore and henri were no longer inquisitive to see how she was made when she was clean she went up the stairs quite naked leaving her damp chemise and other garments in a heap on the floor but a quarrel broke out between the two brothers jeanlin had hastened to jump into the tub under the pretence that zacharie was still eating and the latter hustled him claiming his turn calling out that he was polite enough to allow catherine to wash herself first but he did not wish to have the rinsings of the young urchins all the less since when jeanlin had been in it it would do to fill the school ink-pots they ended by washing themselves together also turning towards the fire and they even helped each other rubbing one another's backs then like their sister they disappeared up the staircase naked what a slop they do make murmured Mahu taking up their garments from the floor to put them to dry alzire just sponge up a bit but a disturbance on the other side of the wall cut short her speech one heard a man's oaths a woman's crying a whole stampede of battle with hollow blows that sounded like the shock of an empty gourd levaque's wife is catching it maheu peacefully stated as he scraped the bottom of his bowl with a spoon 
it's queer but a loop made out that the soup was ready ah yes ready said maheu i saw the vegetables on the table not even cleaned the cries redoubled and there was a terrible push which shook the wall followed by complete silence then the miner swallowing the last spoonful concluded with an air of calm justice if the soup is not ready one can understand and after having drunk a glassful of water he attacked the shittlings he cut square pieces stuck the point of his knife into them and ate them on his bread without a fork there was no talking when the father was eating he himself was hungry in silence he did not recognize the usual taste of maigrat's provisions this must come from somewhere else however he put no question to his wife he only asked if the old man was still sleeping upstairs no the grandfather had gone out for his usual walk and there was silence again but the odour of the meat made lenore and henri lift up their heads from the floor where they were amusing themselves with making rivulets with the spilt water both of them came and planted themselves near their father the little one in front their eyes followed each morsel full of hope when it set out from the plate and with an air of consternation when it was engulfed in the mouth at last the father noticed the gluttonous desire which made their faces pale and their lips moist have the children had any of it he asked and as his wife hesitated you know i don't like injustice it takes away my appetite when i see them there begging for beds but they've had some of it she exclaimed angrily if you were to listen to them you might give them your share and the others too they would fill themselves till they burst isn't it true alzu that we have all had some sure enough mother replied the little humpback who under such circumstances could tell lies with the self-possession of a grown-up person lenore and henri stood motionless shocked and rebellious at such lying when they themselves were whipped if they did not tell the truth their little hearts began to swell and they longed to protest and to say that they at all events were not there when the others had some get along with you said the mother driving them to the other end of the room you ought to be ashamed of being always in your father's plate and even if he was the only one to have any doesn't he work while well, all you a lot of good-for-nothings can't do anything but spend yes and the more the bigger you are maheu called them back he seated lenore on his left thigh henri on the right then he finished the chetelings by playing at dinner with them he cut small pieces and each had his share the children devoured with delight when he had finished he said to his wife no don't give me my coffee i'm going to wash first and just give me a hand to throw away this dirty water they took both of the handles of the tub and emptied it into the gutter before the door when jeanlin came down in dry garments breeches and a woolen blouse too large for him which were weary of fading on his brother's back seeing him slinking out through the open door his mother stopped him where are you off to over there over where listen to me you go and gather a dandelion salad for this evening hey do you hear if you don't bring a salad back you'll have to deal with me all right jeanlin set out with his hands in his pockets trailing his savats and slouching along with his slender loins of a ten-year-old urchin like an old miner in his turn zacharie came down more carefully dressed his body covered by a black woolen knitted jacket with blue stripes his father called out to him not to return late and he left nodding his head with his pipe between his teeth without replying again the tub was filled with warm water maheu was already slowly taking off his jacket at a look alzire led lenore and henri outside to play the father did not like washing en famille as was practiced in many houses in the settlement he blamed no one however he simply said that it was good for the children to dabble together what are you doing up there cried maheu up the staircase i'm mending my dress that i tore yesterday replied catherine all right don't come down your father is washing then maheu and maheu were left alone the latter decided to place estelle on a chair and by a miracle finding herself near the fire the child did not scream but turned towards her parents the vague eyes of a little creature without intelligence he was crouching before the tub quite naked having first plunged his head into it well rubbed with that black soap the constant use of which discoloured and made yellow the hair of the race 
afterwards he got into the water lathered his chest belly arms and thighs scraping them energetically with both fists his wife standing by watched him well then she began i saw your eyes when you came in you were bothered eh and it eased you those provisions fancy those peeling people didn't give me a sou oh they are kind enough they have dressed the little ones and i was ashamed to ask them for it crosses me to ask for things she interrupted herself a moment to wedge estelle into the chair lest she should tip over the father continued to work away at his skin without hastening by a question the story which interested him patiently waiting for light i must tell you that maigrat had refused me oh straight like one kicks a dog out of doors guess if i was on a spree they keep you warm woolen garments but they don't put anything into your stomach eh he lifted his head still silent nothing at pialaine nothing in maigrat then where but as usual she was pulling up her sleeves to wash his back and those parts which he could not himself easily reach besides he liked her to soap him to rub him everywhere till she almost broke her wrists she took soap and worked away at his shoulders while he held himself stiff so as to resist the shock then i returned to maigrat's and said to him ah i said something to him and that it didn't do to have no heart and that evil would happen to him if there were any justice that bothered him he turned his eyes and would like to have got away from the back she had got down to the buttocks and was pushing into the folds not leaving any part of the body without passing over it making him shine like her three saucepans on saturdays after a big clean only she began to sweat with this tremendous exertion of her arms so exhausted and out of breath that her words were choked at last he called me an old nuisance we shall have bread until saturday and the best is that he has lent me five francs i have got butter coffee and chicory from him i was even going to get the meat and potatoes there only i saw that he was grumbling seven sous for the chitterlings eighteen for the potatoes and i've got three francs seventy-five left for a ragout and a meat soup eh i don't think i've wasted my morning now she began to wipe him plugging with a towel the parts that would not dry feeling happy and without thinking of the future debt he burst out laughing and took her in his arms leave me alone stupid you are deaf and wetting me only i'm afraid maigret has ideas she was about to speak of catherine but she stopped what was the good of disturbing him it would only lead to endless discussion what ideas he asked why ideas of robbing us catherine will have to examine the bill carefully he took her in his arms again and this time did not let her go the bath always finished in this way she enlivened him by the hard rubbing and then by the towels which tickled the hairs of his arms and chest besides among all his mates of the settlement it was the hour for stupidities when more children were planted than were wanted at night all the family were about he pushed her towards the table jesting like a worthy man who was enjoying the only good moment of the day calling that taking his dessert and a dessert which cost him nothing she with her loose figure and breast struggled a little for fun you are stupid my lord you are stupid and there's estelle looking at us wait till i turn her head oh bosh at three months as if she understood when he got up maheu simply put on a dry pair of breeches he liked when he was clean and had taken his pleasure with his wife to remain naked for a while on his white skin the whiteness of an anemic girl the scratches and gashes of the coal left tattoo marks graps as the miners called them and he was proud of them and exhibited his big arms and broad chest shining like veined marble in summer all the miners could be seen in this condition at their doors he even went there for a moment now in spite of the wet weather and shouted out a rough joke to a comrade whose breast was also naked on the other side of the gardens others also appeared and the children trailing along the pathways raised their heads and also laughed with delight at all this weary flesh of workers displayed in the open air while drinking his coffee without yet putting on a shirt maheu told his wife about the engineer's anger over the planking he was calm and unbent 
and listened with a nod of approval to the sensible advice of maheude who showed much common sense in such affairs she always repeated to him that nothing was gained by struggling against the company she afterwards told him about madame hennebeau's visit without saying so both of them were proud of this can i come down yet asked catherine from the top of the staircase yes yes your father is drying himself the young girl had put on her sunday dress an old frock of rough blue poplin already faded and worn in the folds she had on a very simple bonnet of black tulle hallo you're dressed where are you going to i'm going to monceau to buy a ribbon for my bonnet i've taken off the old one it was too dirty have you got money then no but moquette promised to lend me half a franc the mother let her go but at the door she called her back here don't go and buy that ribbon at maigrat he will rob you and he will think that we are rolling in wealth the father who was crouching down before the fire to dry his neck and shoulders more quickly contented himself with adding try not to dawdle about at night on the road in the afternoon maheu worked in his garden already he had sown potatoes beans and peas and he now set about replanting cabbage and lettuce plants which he had kept fresh from the night before this bit of garden furnished them with vegetables except potatoes of which they never had enough he understood gardening very well and could even grow artichokes which was treated as sheer display by the neighbors as he was preparing the bed levaque just then came out to smoke a pipe in his own square looking at the cause lettuces which bouteloup had planted in the morning for without the lodger's energy in digging nothing would have grown there but nettles and a conversation arose over the trellis levaque refreshed and excited by thrashing his wife vainly tried to take maheu off to rasseneur's why was he afraid of a glass they could have a game at skittles lounge about for a while with the mates and then come back to dinner that was the way of life after leaving the pit no doubt there was no harm in that but maheu was obstinate if he did not replant his lettuces they would be faded by to-morrow in reality he refused out of good sense not wishing to ask a farthing from his wife out of the change of the five franc piece five o'clock was striking when pierron came to know if it was with jeanlin that her lady had gone off levaque replied that it must be something of that sort for bevert had also disappeared and those rascals always went prowling about together when maheu had quieted them by speaking of the dandelion salad he and his comrade set about joking the young woman with the coarseness of good-natured devils she was angry but did not go away in reality tickled by the strong words which made her scream with her hands to her sides a lean woman came to her aid stammering with anger like a clucking hen others in the distance on their doorsteps confided their alarms now the school was closed and all the children were running about there was a swarm of little creatures shouting and tumbling and fighting while those fathers who were not at the public house were resting in groups of three or four crouching on their heels as they did in the mine smoking their pipes with an occasional word in the shelter of a wall pierron went off in a fury when levaque wanted to feel if her thighs were firm and he himself decided to go alone to rasseneur's since maheu was still planting twilight suddenly came on maheu lit the lamp irritated because neither her daughter nor the boys had come back she could have guessed as much they never succeeded in taking together the only meal of the day at which it was possible for them to be all round the table then she was waiting for the dandelion salad what could he be gathering at this hour in this blackness of an oven that nuisance of a child a salad would go so well with the stew which was simmering on the fire potatoes leeks sorrel fricasseed with fried onion the whole house smelt of that fried onion that good odour which gets rank so soon and which penetrates the bricks of the settlements with such infection that one perceives it far off in the country the violent flavour of the poor man's kitchen maheu when he left the garden at nightfall at once fell into a chair with his head against the wall as soon as he sat down in the evening he went to sleep the clock struck seven henri and lenore had just broken a plate in persisting in helping alzire who was laying the table 
when father bonnemort came in first in a hurry to dine and go back to the pit then maheu woke up maheu come and eat so much the worse they are big enough to find the house the nuisance is the salad End of section ten. Section eleven of Germanon by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ready by Matt Perard. Part two, chapter five. At Rossignol, after having eaten his soup etienne went back into the small chamber beneath the roof and facing the voreau which he was to occupy and fell on to his bed dressed as he was overcome with fatigue in two days he had not slept four hours when he awoke in the twilight he was dazed for a moment not recognizing his surroundings and he felt such uneasiness and his head was so heavy that he rose painfully with the idea of getting some fresh air before having his dinner and going to bed for the night outside the weather was becoming milder the sooty sky was growing copper-coloured laden with one of those warm rains of the nord the approach of which one feels by the moist warmth of the air and the night was coming on in great mists which drowned the distant landscape of the plain over this immense sea of reddish earth the low sky seemed to melt into black dust without a breath of wind now to animate the darkness it was the wan and deathly melancholy of a funeral at the end walked straight ahead at random with no other aim but to shake off his fever when he passed before the voreau already growing gloomy at the bottom of its hole and with no lantern yet shining from it he stopped a moment to watch the departure of the day workers no doubt six o'clock had struck landers porters from the pit eye and grooms were going away in bands mixed with the vague and laughing figures of the screening girls in the shade at first it was boulet and her son-in-law perron she was abusing him because he had not supported her in a quarrel with an overseer over her reckoning of stones get along damn good for nothing do you call yourself a man to lower yourself like that before one of these beasts to devour us perron followed her peacefully without replying at last he said i suppose i ought to jump on the boss thanks for showing me how to get into a mess bend your backside to him then she shouted by god if my daughter had listened to me it's not enough for them to kill the father perhaps you'd like me to say thank you no i'll have their skins first their voices were lost etienne saw her disappear with her eagle nose her flying white hair her long lean arms that gesticulated furiously but the conversation of two young people behind caused him to listen he had recognized zacharie who was waiting there and who had just been addressed by his friend moquette are you here said the latter we will have something to eat and then off to the volcan directly i've something to attend to what then the lander turned and saw philomene coming out of the screening shed he thought he understood very well if it's that then i go ahead yes i'll catch you up as he went away moquette met his father old monk who was also coming out of the baron the two men simply wished each other good evening the son taking the main road while the father went along by the canal zacharie was already pushing philomene in spite of her resistance into the same solitary path she was in a hurry another time and the two wrangled like old housemates there was no fun in only seeing one another out of doors especially in winter when the earth is moist and there are no wheat fields to lie in no no it's not that he whispered impatiently i've something to say to you he led her gently with his arm round her waist then when they were in the shadow of the pit bank he asked if she had any money what for she demanded then he became confused spoke of a debt of two francs which had reduced his family to despair hold your tongue i see moquette you're going again to the volcano with him where those dirty singer women are he defended himself struck his chest gave his word of honour then as she shrugged her shoulders he said suddenly come with us if it will amuse you you see that you don't put me out what do i want to do with the singers will you come 
and the little one she replied how can you stir with a child that's always screaming let me go back i guess they're not getting on at the house but he held her and entreated see it was only not to look foolish before moquette to whom he had promised a man could not go to bed every evening like the fowls she was overcome and pulled up the skirt of her gown with her nail she cut the thread and drew out some half-franc pieces from a corner of the hem for fear of being robbed by her mother she hid there the profit of the overtime work she did at the pit i've got five you see she said i'll give you three only you must swear that you'll make your mother decide to let us marry we've had enough of this life in the open air and mother reproaches me for every mouthful i eat swear first she spoke with the soft voice of a big delicate girl without passion simply tired of her life he swore exclaimed that it was a sacred promise then when he had got the three pieces he kissed her tickled her made her laugh and would have pushed things to an extreme in this corner of the pit-bank which was the winter chamber of their household if she had not again refused saying that it would not give her any pleasure she went back to the settlement alone while he cut across the fields to rejoin his companion etienne had followed them mechanically from afar without understanding regarding it as a simple rendezvous the girls were precocious in the pits and he recalled that lille work girls whom he had waited for behind the factories those bands of girls corrupted at fourteen in the abandonment of their wretchedness but another meeting surprised him more he stopped at the bottom of the pit bank in a hollow into which some large stones had slipped little jeanlin was violently snubbing lydie and bevere seated one at his right the other at his left what do you say eh i'll slap each of you if you want more who thought of it first eh in fact jeanlin had had an idea after having roamed about in the meadows along the canal for an hour gathering dandelions with the two others it had occurred to him before the pile of salad that they would never eat all that at home and instead of going back to the settlement he had gone to monceau keeping bebert to watch and making lydie ring at the houses and offer the dandelions he was experienced enough to know that as he said girls could sell what they liked in the ardor of business the entire pile had disappeared but the girl had gained eleven sous and now with empty hands the three were dividing the profits that's not fair bebert declared must divide into three if you keep seven sous we shall only have two each what not fair replied jeanlin furiously i gathered more first of all the other usually submitted with timid admiration and a credulity which always made him the dupe though older and stronger he even allowed himself to be struck but this time the sight of all that money excited him to rebellion he's robbing us lady isn't he if he doesn't share we'll tell his mother jeanlin at once thrust his fist beneath the other's nose say that again i'll go and say at your house that you sold my mother's salad and then you silly beast how can i divide eleven sous into three just try and see if you're so clever here are your two sous each just look sharp and take them or i'll put them in my pocket bebert was vanquished and accepted the two sous lydie who was trembling had said nothing for with jeanlin she experienced the fear and the tenderness of a little beaten woman when he held out the two suits to her she advanced her hand with a submissive laugh but he suddenly changed his mind eh hey, what will you do with all that your mother will nab them sure enough if you don't know how to hide them from her i'd better keep them for you when you want money you can ask me for it and the nine suits disappeared to shut her mouth he had put his arms around her laughingly and was rolling with her over the pit-bank she was his little wife and in the dark corners they used to try together the love which they had heard and saw in their homes behind partitions through the cracks of doors they knew everything but they were able to do nothing being too young fumbling and playing for hours at the games of vicious puppies he called that playing at papa and mamma and when he chased her she ran away and let herself be caught with the delicious trembling of instinct often angry but always yielding in the expectation of something which never came as bebert was not admitted to these games and received a cuffing whenever he wanted to touch lydie he was always constrained agitated by anger and uneasiness 
when the other two were amusing themselves, which they did not hesitate to do in his presence. His one idea, therefore, was to frighten them and disturb them, calling out that someone could see them. It's all up. There's a man looking. This time he told the truth. It was Etienne, who had decided to continue his walk. The children jumped up and ran away, and he passed by, round the bank, following the canal, amused at the terror of these little rascals. No doubt it was too early at their age, but they saw and heard so much that one would have to tie them up to restrain them. Yet Etienne became sad. A hundred paces farther on, he came across more couples. He had arrived at Requilla, and there, around the old ruined mine, all the girls of Monceau prowled about with their lovers. It was the common rendezvous, the remote and deserted spot to which the putters came to get their first child when they dared not risk the shed. The broken palings opened to everyone the old yard, now become a nondescript piece of ground obstructed by the ruins of the two sheds which had fallen in and by the skeletons of the large buttresses which were still standing derelict trams were lying about and piles of old rotting wood while its dense vegetation was reconquering this corner of ground displaying itself in thick grass and springing up in young trees that were already vigorous every girl found herself at home here there were concealed holes for all their lovers placed them over beams behind the timber in the trams they even lay elbow to elbow without troubling about their neighbors and it seemed that around this extinguished engine near the shaft weary of disgorging coal there was a revenge of creation and the free love which beneath the lash of instinct planted children in the bellies of these girls who were yet hardly women yet a caretaker lived there old monk to whom the company had given up almost beneath the destroyed tower two rooms which were constantly threatened by destruction from the expected fall of the last walls he had even been obliged to shore up a part of the roof and he lived there very comfortably with his family he and moquet in one room moquette in the other as the windows no longer possessed a single pane he had decided to close them by nailing up boards one could not see well but it was warm for the rest this caretaker cared for nothing he went to look after his horses at the Verreau, and never troubled himself about the ruins of Requillard, of which the shaft only was preserved in order to serve as a chimney for a fire which ventilated the neighbouring pit it was thus that father monk was ending his old age in the midst of love ever since she was ten moquette had been lying about in all the corners of the ruins not as a timid and still green little urchin like lydie but as a girl who was already big and a mate for bearded lads the father had nothing to say for she was considerate and never introduced a lover into the house then he was used to this sort of accident when he went to the Vero, when he came back whenever he came out of his hole he could scarcely put a foot down without treading on a couple in the grass and it was worse if he wanted to gather wood to heat his soup or look for burdocks for his rabbit at the other end of the enclosure then he saw one by one the voluptuous noses of all the girls of monceau rising up around him while he had to be careful not to knock against the limbs stretched out level with the paths besides these meetings had gradually ceased to disturb either him who was simply taking care not to stumble or the girls whom he allowed to finish their affairs going away with discreet little steps like a worthy man who was at peace with the ways of nature only just as they now knew him he at last also knew them as one knows the rascally magpies who become corrupted in the pear trees in the garden ah you you how it goes on how wild it is sometimes he wagged his chin with silent regret turning away from the noisy wantons who were breathing too loudly in the darkness only one thing put him out of temper two lovers had acquired the bad habit of embracing outside his wall it was not that it prevented him from sleeping but they leaned against the wall so heavily that at last they damaged it every evening old Mook received a visit from his friend father bonnemont who regularly before dinner took the same walk the two old men spoke little scarcely exchanging ten words 
during the half hour that they spent together but it cheered them thus to think over the days of old to chew their recollections over again without need to talk of them at recollet they sat on a beam side by side saying a word and then sinking into their dreams with faces bent towards the earth no doubt they were becoming young again around them lovers were turning over their sweethearts there was a murmur of kisses and laughter the warm odour of the girls arose in the freshness of the trodden grass it was now forty-three years since father bonnemort had taken his wife behind the pit she was a putter so slight that he had placed her on a tram to embrace her at ease ah those were fine days and the two old men shaking their heads at last left each other often without saying good-night that evening however as etienne arrived father bonnemont who was getting up from the beam to return to the settlement said to mock good-night old man i say you know Rousie? mock was silent for a moment rocked his shoulders then returning to the house good-night good-night old man etienne came and sat on the beam in his turn his sadness was increasing though he could not tell why the old man whose disappearing back he watched recalled his arrival in the morning and the flood of words which the piercing wind had dragged from his silence what wretchedness and all these girls worn out with fatigue who were still stupid enough in the evening to fabricate little ones to yield flesh for labour and suffering it would never come to an end if they were always filling themselves with starvelings would it not be better if they were to shut up their bellies and press their thighs together as at the approach of misfortune perhaps these gloomy ideas only stirred confusedly in him because he was alone while all the others at this hour were going about taking their pleasure in couples the mild weather stifled him a little occasional drops of rain fell on his feverish hands yes they all came to it it was something stronger than reason just then as Etienne remained seated motionless in the shadow a couple who came down from monceau rustled against him without seeing him as they entered the uneven recrelaxed ground the girl certainly a virgin was struggling and resisting with low whispered supplications while the lad in silence was pushing her towards the darkness of the corner of the shed still upright under which there were piles of old mouldy rope it was catherine and big cheval but etienne had not recognized them in passing and his eyes followed them he was watching for the end of the story touched by a sensuality which changed the course of his thoughts why should he interfere when girls refuse it it is because they like first to be forced on leaving the settlement of the deux cent quarante catherine had gone to monceau along the road from the age of ten since she had earned her living at the pit she went about the country alone in the complete liberty of the colliers families and if no man had possessed her at fifteen it was owing to the tardy awakening of her puberty the crisis of which had not yet arrived when she was in front of the company's yards she crossed the road and entered a laundress's where she was certain to find moquette for the latter stayed there from morning till night among women who treated each other with coffee all round but she was disappointed moquette had just then been regaling them in her turn so thoroughly that she was not able to lend the half franc she had promised to console her they vainly offered a glass of hot coffee she was not even willing that her companion should borrow from another woman an idea of economy had come to her a sort of superstitious fear the certainty that that ribbon would bring her bad luck if she were to buy it now she hastened to regain the road to the settlement and had reached the last houses of monceau when a man at the door of the piquette estaminet called her eh hey, catherine where are you off to so quick it was lanky cheval she was vexed not because he displeased her but because she was not inclined to joke come in and have a drink a little glass of sweet won't you she refused politely the night was coming on they were expecting her at home he had advanced and was entreating her in a low voice in the middle of the road it had been his idea for a long time to persuade her to come up to the room which he occupied on the first story of the estaminet piquet a fine room for a household with a large bed did he frighten her that she always refused she laughed good-naturedly and said that she would come up some day when children didn't grow 
then one thing leading to another she told him without knowing how about the blue ribbon which she had not been able to buy but i'll pay for it he exclaimed she blushed feeling that it would be best to refuse again but possessed by a strong desire to have the ribbon the idea of a loan came back to her and at last she accepted on condition that she should return to him what he spent on her they began to joke again it was agreed that if she did not sleep with him she should return him the money but there was another difficulty when he talked of going to maigrat's no not maigrat's mother won't let me why is there any need to say where one goes he has the best ribbons in Montsou. when maigrat saw lanky cheval and catherine coming to his shop like two lovers who were buying their engagement gifts he became very red and exhibited his pieces of blue ribbon with the rage of a man who was being made fun of then when he had served the young people he planted himself at the door to watch them disappear in the twilight and when his wife came to ask him a question in a timid voice he fell on her abusing her and exclaiming that he would make them repent some day the filthy creatures who had no gratitude when they ought all to be on the ground licking his feet lanky cheval accompanied catherine along the road he walked beside her swinging his arms only he pushed her by the hip conducting her without seeming to do so she suddenly perceived that he had made her leave the pavement and that they were taking the narrow Requillard road but she had no time to be angry his arm was already round her waist and he was dazing her with a constant caress of words how stupid she was to be afraid did he want to hurt such a little darling who was as soft as soap so tender that he could have devoured her and he breathed behind her ear in her neck so that a shudder passed over the skin of her whole body she felt stifled and had nothing to reply it was true that he seemed to love her on saturday evenings after having blown out the candle she had asked herself what would happen if he were to take her in this way then on going to sleep she had dreamed that she would no longer refuse quite overcome by pleasure why then at the same idea to-day did she feel repugnance and something like regret while he was tickling her neck with his moustache so softly that she closed her eyes the shadow of another man of the lad she had seen that morning passed over the darkness of her closed eyelids catherine suddenly looked around her chaval had conducted her into the ruins of Requillard, and she recoiled shuddering from the darkness of the fallen shed oh no oh no she murmured please let me go the fear of the male had taken hold of her that fear which stiffens the muscles in an impulse of defence even when girls are willing and feel the conquering approach of man her virginity which had nothing to learn took fright as at a threatening blow a wound of which she feared the unknown pain no no i don't want to i tell you that i am too young it's true another time when i am quite grown up he growled in a low voice stupid there's nothing to fear what does that matter but without speaking more he had seized her firmly and pushed her beneath the shed and she fell on her back on the old ropes she ceased to protest yielding to the male before her time with that hereditary submission which from childhood had thrown down in the open air all the girls of her race her frightened stammering grew faint and only the ardent breath of the man was heard etienne however had listened without moving another who was taking the leap and now that he had seen the comedy he got up overcome by uneasiness by a kind of jealous excitement in which there was a touch of anger he no longer restrained himself he stepped over the beams for those two were too much occupied now to be disturbed he was surprised therefore when he had gone a hundred paces along the path to find that they were already standing up and that they appeared like himself to be returning to the settlement the man again had his arm round the girl's waist and was squeezing her with an air of gratitude still speaking in her neck and it was she who seemed in a hurry anxious to return quickly and annoyed at the delay then etienne was tormented by the desire to see their faces it was foolish and he hastened his steps so as not to yield to it but his feet slackened of their own accord and at the first lamp-post he concealed himself in the shade he was petrified by horror when he recognized catherine and lanky cheval he hesitated at first 
was it indeed she that young girl in the coarse blue dress with that bonnet was that the urchin whom he had seen in breeches with her head in the canvas cap that was why she could pass so near him without his recognizing her but he no longer doubted he had seen her eyes again with her greenish limpidity of spring water so clear and so deep what a wench and he experienced a furious desire to avenge himself on her with contempt without any motive besides he did not like her as a girl she was frightful catherine and chaval had passed him slowly they did not know that they were watched he held her to kiss her behind the ear and she began to slacken her steps beneath his caresses which made her laugh left behind etienne was obliged to follow them irritated because they barred the road and because in spite of himself he had to witness these things which exasperated him it was true then what she had sworn to him in the morning she was not any one's mistress and he who had not believed her who had deprived himself of her in order not to act like the other and who had let her be taken beneath his nose pushing his stupidity so far as to be dirtily amused at seeing them it made him mad he clenched his hands he could have devoured that man in one of those impulses to kill in which he saw everything red the walk lasted for half an hour when chaval and catherine approached the Verreaux, they slackened their pace still more they stopped twice beside the canal three times along the pit-bank very cheerful now and occupied with little tender games etienne was obliged to stop also when they stopped for fear of being perceived he endeavoured to feel nothing but a brutal regret that would teach him to treat girls with consideration through being well brought up then after passing the Verreau, and at last free to go and dine at rasseneur's he continued to follow them accompanying them to the settlement where he remained standing in the shade for a quarter of an hour waiting until chaval left catherine to enter her home and when he was quite sure that they were no longer together he set off walking afresh going very far along marchand's road stamping and thinking of nothing too stifled and too sad to shut himself up in a room it was not until an hour later towards nine o'clock that etienne again passed the settlement saying to himself that he must eat and sleep if he was to be up again at four o'clock in the morning the village was already asleep and looked quite black in the night not a gleam shone from the closed shutters the house fronts slept with the heavy sleep of snoring barracks only a cat escaped through the empty gardens it was the end of the day the collapse of workers falling from the table to the bed overcome with weariness and food at rasseneur's in the lighted room an engine man and two day workers were drinking but before going in etienne stopped to throw one last glance into the darkness he saw again the same black immensity as in the morning when he arrived in the wind before him the Verreaux was crouching with its air of an evil beast its dimness pricked with a few lantern lights the three braziers of the bank were burning in the air like bloody moons now and then showing the vast silhouettes of father bonnemont and his yellow horse and beyond in the flat plain shade had submerged everything monceau marchiennes the forest of vandame the immense sea of beetroot and of wheat in which there only shone like distant lighthouses the blue fires of the blast furnaces and the red fires of the coke ovens gradually the night came on the rain was now falling slowly continuously bearing this void in its monotonous streaming only one voice was still heard the thick slow respiration of the pumping engine breathing both by day and by night End of section 11. Section 12 of Gemini by Emile Zola, translated by Ablock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part 3. Chapter 1. On the next day, and the days that followed, Etienne continued his work at the pit. He grew accustomed to it. His existence became regulated by this labor and to these new habits which had seemed so hard to him at first. 
only one episode interrupted the monotony of the first fortnight a slight fever which kept him in bed for forty-eight hours with aching limbs and throbbing head dreaming in a state of semi-delirium that he was pushing his tram in a passage that was so narrow that his body would not pass through it was simply the exhaustion of his apprenticeship an excess of fatigue from which he quickly recovered and days followed days until weeks and months had slipped by now like his mates he got up at three o'clock drank his coffee and carried off the double slice of bread and butter which madame rasseneur had prepared for him the evening before regularly as he went every morning to the pit he met old bonnemort who was going home to sleep and on leaving in the afternoon he crossed bouteloup who was going to his task he had his cap his breeches and canvas jacket and he shivered and warmed his back in the shed before the large fire then came the waiting with naked feet in the receiving room swept by furious currents of air but the engine with its great steel limbs starred with copper shining up above in the shade no longer attracted his attention nor the cables which flew by with the black and silent motion of a nocturnal bird nor the cages rising and plunging unceasingly in the midst of the noise of signals of shouted orders of trams shaking the metal floor his lamp burnt badly that confounded lamp man could not have cleaned it and he only woke up when moquet bundled them all off roguishly smacking the girl's flanks the cage was unfastened and fell like a stone to the bottom of a hole without causing him even to lift his head to see the daylight vanish he never thought of a possible fall he felt himself at home as he sank into the darkness beneath the falling rain below at the pit eye when perron had unloaded them with his air of hypocritical mildness there was always the same tramping as of a flock the yardmen each going away to his cutting with trailing steps he now knew the mine galleries better than the streets of Monceau. he knew where he had to turn where he had to stoop and where he had to avoid a puddle he had grown so accustomed to these two kilometres beneath the earth that he could have traversed them without a lamp with his hands in his pockets and every time the same meetings took place a captain lighting up the faces of the passing workmen father Mouque leading a horse Beber conducting the snorting batel jeanlin running behind the tram to close the ventilation doors and big moquette and lean lighty pushing the trams after a time also etienne suffered much less from the damp and closeness of the cutting the chimney or ascending passage seemed to him more convenient for climbing up as if he had melted and could pass through cracks where before he would not have risked a hand he breathed the cold dust without difficulty saw clearly in the obscurity and sweated tranquilly having grown accustomed to the sensation of wet garments on his body from morning to night besides he no longer spent his energy recklessly he had gained skill so rapidly that he astonished the whole stall in three weeks he was named among the best putters in the pit no one pushed a tram more rapidly to the upbrow nor loaded it afterwards so correctly his small figure allowed him to slip about everywhere and though his arms were as delicate and white as a woman's they seemed to be made of iron beneath the smooth skin so vigorously did they perform their task he never complained out of pride no doubt even when he was panting with fatigue the only thing they had against him was that he could not take a joke and grew angry as soon as any one trod on his toes in all other respects he was accepted and looked upon as a real miner reduced beneath this pressure of habit little by little to a machine maheu regarded etienne with special friendship for he respected work that was well done then like the others he felt that this lad had more education than himself he saw him read write and draw little plans he heard him talking of things of which he himself did not know even the existence this caused him no astonishment for miners are rough fellows who have thicker heads than engine men but he was surprised at the courage of this little chap and at the cheerful way he had bitten into the coal to avoid dying of hunger he had never met a workman who grew accustomed to it so quickly so when hewing was urgent 
and he did not wish to disturb a pikeman he gave the timbering over to the young man being sure of the neatness and solidity of his work the bosses were always bothering him about the damned planking question he feared every hour at the appearance of the engineer Negrel, followed by Danseur, shouting discussing ordering everything to be done over again and he remarked that his putter's timbering gave greater satisfaction to these gentlemen in spite of their air of never being pleased with anything and their repeated assertions that the company would one day or another take radical measures things dragged on a deep discontent was fomenting in the pit and maheu himself in spite of his calmness was beginning to clench his fists there was at first some rivalry between zacharie and etienne one evening they were even coming to blows but the former a good lad though careless of everything but his own pleasure was quickly appeased by the friendly offer of a glass and soon yielded to the superiority of the newcomer levaque was also on good terms with him talking politics with the putter who as he said had his own ideas the only one of the men in whom he felt a deep hostility was lanky cheval not that they were cool towards each other for on the contrary they had become companions only when they joked their eyes seemed to devour each other catherine continued to move among them as a tired resigned girl bending her back pushing her tram always good-natured with her companion in the putting who aided her in his turn and submissive to the wishes of her lover whose caresses she now received openly it was an accepted situation a recognized domestic arrangement to which the family itself closed its eyes to such a degree that cheval every evening led away the putter behind the pit-bank then brought her back to her parent's door where he finally embraced her before the whole settlement at the end who believed that he had reconciled himself to the situation often teased her about these walks making crude remarks by way of joke as lads and girls will at the bottom of the cuttings and she replied in the same tone telling in a swaggering way what her lover had done to her yet disturbed and growing pale when the young man's eyes chanced to meet hers then both would turn away their heads not speaking again perhaps for an hour looking as if they hated each other because of something buried within them and which they never could explain to each other the spring had come on emerging from the pit one day etienne had received in his face a warm april breeze a good odour of young earth of tender greenness of large open air and now every time he came up the spring smelt sweeter warmed him more after his ten hours of labour in the eternal winter at the bottom in the midst of that damp darkness which no summer had ever dissipated the days grew longer and longer at last in may he went down at sunrise when a vermilion sky lit up the voreau with a mist of dawn in which the white vapour of the pumping engine became rose-coloured there was no more shivering a warm breath blew across the plain while the larks sang far above then at three o'clock he was dazzled by the now burning sun which set fire to the horizon and reddened the bricks beneath the filth of the coal in june the wheat was already high of a blue-green which contrasted with the black-green of the beetroots it was an endless vista undulating beneath the slightest breeze and he saw it spread and grow from day to day and was sometimes surprised as if he had found it in the evening more swollen with verdure than it had been in the morning the poplars along the canal were putting on their plumes of leaves grass was invading the pit-bank flowers were covering the meadows a whole life was germinating and pushing up from this earth beneath which he was groaning in misery and fatigue when etienne now went for a walk in the evening he no longer startled lovers behind the pit-bank he could follow their track in the wheat and divine their wanton bird's nests by eddies among the yellowing blades and the great red poppies zacharie and philomene came back to it out of old domestic habit mother brulé always on lydie's heels was constantly hunting her out with jeanlin buried so deeply together that one had to tread on them before they made up their minds to get up and as to moquette she lay about everywhere one could not cross a field without seeing her head plunged down while only her feet emerged as she lay at full length 
but all these were quite free the young man felt nothing guilty there except on the evenings when he met catherine and chaval twice he saw them on his approach tumble down in the midst of a field where the motionless stalks afterwards remained dead another time as he was going along a narrow path catherine's clear eyes appeared before him level with the wheat and immediately sank then the immense plain seemed to him too small and he preferred to pass the evening at rasseneur's in the advantage give me a glass madame rasseneur i'm no i'm not going out to-night my legs are too stiff and he turned towards a comrade who always sat at the bottom table with his head against the wall souverain won't you have one no thanks nothing etienne had become acquainted with souverain through living there side by side he was an engine man at the Vero, and occupied the furnished room upstairs next to his own he must have been about thirty years old fair and slender with a delicate face framed by thick hair and a slight beard his white pointed teeth his thin mouth and nose with his rosy complexion gave him a girlish appearance an air of obstinate gentleness across which the grey reflection of his steely eyes threw savage gleams in his poor workman's room there was nothing but a box of papers and books he was a russian and never spoke of himself so that many stories were afloat concerning him the colliers who were very suspicious with strangers guessing from his small middle-class hands that he belonged to another caste had at first imagined a romance some assassination and that he was escaping punishment but then he had behaved in such a fraternal way with them without any pride distributing to the youngsters of the settlement all the sous in his pockets that they now accepted him reassured by the term political refugee which circulated about him a vague term in which they saw an excuse even for crime and as it were a companionship in suffering during the first weeks etienne had found him timid and reserved so that he only discovered his history later on souverain was the latest born of a noble family in the government of tula at st petersburg where he studied medicine the socialistic enthusiasm which then carried away all the youth in russia had decided him to learn a manual trade that of a mechanic so that he could mix with the people in order to know them and help them as a brother and it was by this trade that he was now living after having fled in consequence of an unsuccessful attempt against the czar's life for a month he had lived at a fruiterer's cellar hollowing out a mine underneath the road and charging bombs with the constant risk of being blown up with the house renounced by his family without money expelled from the french workshops as a foreigner who was regarded as a spy he was dying of starvation when the montsou company had at last taken him on at a moment of pressure for a year he had labored there as a good sober silent workman doing day work one week and night work the next so regularly that the masters referred to him as an example to the others are you never thirsty said etienne to him laughing and he replied with his gentle voice almost without an accent i am thirsty when i eat his companion also joked him about the girls declaring that he had seen him with a putter in the wheat on the body swept side then he shrugged his shoulders with tranquil indifference what should he do with a putter woman was for him a boy a comrade when she had the fraternal feeling and the courage of a man what was the good of having a possible act of cowardice on one's conscience he desired no bond either woman or friend he would be master of his own life and those of others every evening towards nine o'clock when the inn was emptying etienne remained thus talking with souverain he drank his beer in small sips while the engine man smoked constant cigarettes of which the tobacco had at last stained his slender fingers his vague mystic's eyes followed the smoke in the midst of a dream his left hand sought occupation by nervously twitching and he usually ended by installing a tame rabbit on his knees a large doe with young who lived at liberty in the house this rabbit which he had named poland had grown to worship him she would come and smell his trousers fawn on him and scratch him with her paws until he took her up like a child then lying in a heap against him 
her ears laid back she would close her eyes and without growing tired with an unconscious caressing gesture he would pass his hand over her grey silky fur calmed by that warm living softness you know i have had a letter from pluchart said etienne one evening only rasseneur was there the last client had departed for the settlement which was now going to bed ah exclaimed the innkeeper standing up before his two lodgers how are things going with pluchart during the last two months etienne had kept up a constant correspondence with the Lille mechanician whom he had told of his monceau engagement and who was now indoctrinating him having been struck by the propaganda which he might carry on among the miners the association is getting on very well it seems that they are coming in from all sides what have you got to say eh about their society asked rasseneur of Sauron. the latter who was softly scratching poland's head blew out a puff of smoke and muttered with his tranquil air more foolery but at the end grew enthusiastic a predisposition for revolt was throwing him in the first delusions of his ignorance into the struggle of labour against capital it was the international working men's association that they were concerned with that famous international which had just been founded in london was not that a superb effort a campaign in which justice would at last triumph no more frontiers the workers of the whole world rising and uniting to assure to the labourer the bread that he has earned and what a simple and great organization below the section which represents the commune then the federation which groups the sections of the same province then the nation and then at last humanity incarnated in a general council in which each nation was represented by a corresponding secretary in six months it would conquer the world and would be able to dictate laws to the masters should they prove obstinate foolery repeated souverain your karl marx is still only thinking about letting natural forces act no politics no conspiracies is it not so everything in the light of day and simply to raise wages don't bother me with your evolution set fire to the four corners of the town mow down the people level everything and when there is nothing more of this rotten world left standing perhaps a better one will grow up in its place etienne began to laugh he did not always take in his comrade's sayings this theory of destruction seemed to him an affectation rasseneur who was still more practical like a man of solid common sense did not condescend to get angry he only wanted to have things clear then what are you going to try and create a section at Mosso? this was what was desired by Pluchart, who was secretary to the federation of the nord he insisted especially on the services which the association would render to the miners should they go out on strike etienne believed that a strike was imminent this timbering business would turn out badly any further demands on the part of the company would cause rebellion in all the pits it's the subscriptions that are the nuisance Resner declared in a judicial tone half a franc a year for the general fund two francs for the section it looks like nothing but i bet that many will refuse to give it all the more added again because we must first have here a provident fund which we can use if need be as an emergency fund no matter it is time to think about these things i am ready if the others are there was silence the petroleum lamp smoked on the counter through the large open door they could distinctly hear the shovel of a stoker at the bureau stoking the engine everything is so dear began madame rasseneur who had entered and was listening with a gloomy air as if she had grown up in her everlasting black dress when i tell you that i've paid twenty-two sous for eggs it will have to burst up all three men this time were of the same opinion they spoke one after the other in a despairing voice giving expression to their complaints the workers could not hold out the revolution had only aggravated their wretchedness only the bourgeois had grown fat since eighty nine so greedily that they had not even left the bottom of the plates to lick who could say that the workers had had their reasonable share in the extraordinary increase of wealth and comfort during the last hundred years they had made fun of them by declaring them free 
yes free to starve a freedom of which they fully availed themselves it put no bread into your cupboard to go and vote for fine fellows who went away and enjoyed themselves thinking no more of the wretched voters than of their old boots no one way or another it would have to come to an end either quietly by laws by an understanding and good fellowship or like savages by burning everything and devouring one another even if they never saw it their children would certainly see it for the century could not come to an end without another revolution that of the workers this time a general hustling which would cleanse society from top to bottom and rebuild it with more cleanliness and justice it will have to burst up madame rasseneur repeated energetically yes yes they all three cried it will have to burst up souverain was now tickling poland's ears and her nose was curling with pleasure he said in a low voice with abstracted gaze as if to himself raise wages how can you they are fixed by an iron law to the smallest possible sum just the sum necessary to allow the workers to eat dry bread and get children if they fall too low the workers die and the demand for new men makes them rise if they rise too high more men come and they fall it is the balance of empty bellies a sentence to a perpetual prison of hunger when he thus forgot himself entering into the questions that stir an educated socialist etienne and rasseneur became restless disturbed by his despairing statements which they were unable to answer do you understand he said again gazing at them with his habitual calmness we must destroy everything or hunger will reappear yes anarchy and nothing more the earth washed in blood and purified by fire then we shall see monsieur is quite right said madame rasseneur who in her revolutionary violence was always very polite etienne in despair at his ignorance would argue no longer he rose remarking let's go to bed all this won't save one from getting up at three o'clock souverain having blown away the cigarette end which was sticking to his lips was already gently lifting the big rabbit beneath the belly to place it on the ground rasseneur was shutting up the house they separated in silence with buzzing ears as if their heads had swollen with the grave questions they had been discussing and every evening there were similar conversations in the bare room around the single glass which at the end took an hour to empty a crowd of obscure ideas asleep within him were stirring and expanding especially consumed by the need of knowledge he had long hesitated to borrow books from his neighbor who unfortunately had hardly any but german and russian works at last he had borrowed a french book on cooperative societies mere foolery said souverain and he also regularly read a newspaper which the latter received the combat an anarchist journal published at geneva in other respects notwithstanding their daily relations he found him as reserved as ever with his air of camping in life without interests or feelings or possessions of any kind towards the first days of july etienne's situation began to improve in the midst of this monotonous life always beginning over again an accident had occurred the stalls in the guillaume scene had come across a shifting of the strata a general disturbance in the layers which certainly announced that they were approaching a fault and in fact they soon came across this fault which the engineers in spite of considerable knowledge of the soil were still ignorant of this upset the pit nothing was talked of but the lost seam which was to be found no doubt lower down on the other side of the fault the old miners were already expanding their nostrils like good dogs in a chase for coal but meanwhile the hewers could not stand with folded arms and placards announced that the company would put up new workings to auction Mayhew, on coming out one day accompanied at Pien, and offered to take him on as a pikeman in his working in place of levaque who had gone to another yard the matter had already been arranged with the head captain and the engineer who were very pleased with the young man so etienne merely had to accept this rapid promotion glad of the growing esteem in which maheu held him in the evening they returned together to the pit to take note of the placards the cuttings put up to auction were in the filonier scene in the north gallery of the 
they did not seem very advantageous and the miner shook his head when the young man met out the conditions on the following day when they had gone down he took him to see the seam and showed him how far away it was from the pit eye the crumbly nature of the earth the thinness and hardness of the coal but if they were to eat they would have to work so on the following sunday they went to the auction which took place in the shed and was presided over by the engineer of the pit assisted by the head captain in the absence of the divisional engineer from five to six hundred miners were there in front of the little platform which was placed in the corner and the bidding went on so rapidly that one only heard a deep tumult of voices of shouted figures drowned by other figures for a moment maheu feared that he would not be able to obtain one of the forty workings offered by the company all the rivals went lower disquieted by the rumours of a crisis and the panic of a lockout Negrel, the engineer, did not hurry in the face of this panic, and allowed the offers to fall to the lowest possible figures, while Dansert, anxious to push matters still further, lied with regard to the quality of the workings. In order to get his fifty metres, Mahieu struggled with a comrade who was also obstinate. In turn, they each took off a centime from the tram, and if he conquered in the end, it was only by lowering the wage to such an extent that the captain richon who was standing behind him muttered between his teeth and nudged him with his elbow growling angrily that he could never do it at that price when they came out etienne was swearing and he broke out before cheval who was returning from the wheat-fields in company with catherine amusing herself while his father-in-law was absorbed in serious business my by god he exclaimed it's simply slaughter to-day it is the worker who is forced to devour the worker cheval was furious he would never have lowered it he wouldn't and zacharie who had come out of curiosity declared that it was disgusting but at the end with a violent gesture silenced them it will end some day we shall be the masters maheu who had been mute since the auction appeared to wake up he repeated masters ah bad luck it can't be too soon. End of section 12it was Monceau feast day the last sunday in july since saturday evening the good housekeepers of the settlement had deluged their parlors with water throwing bucketfuls over the flags and against the walls and the floor was not yet dry in spite of the white sand which had been strewn over it an expensive luxury for the purses of the poor but the day promised to be very warm it was one of those heavy skies threatening storm which in summer stifled this flat bare country of the nord sunday upset the hours for rising even among the mahus while the father after five o'clock grew weary of his bed and dressed himself the children lay in bed until nine on this day mahu went to smoke a pipe in the garden and then came back to eat his bread and butter alone while waiting he thus passed the morning in a random manner he mended the tub which leaked stuck up beneath the clock a portrait of the prince imperial which had been given to the little ones however the others came down one by one father bonnemont had taken a chair outside to sit in the sun while the mother and alzire had at once set about cooking catherine appeared pushing before her lenore and henri whom she had just dressed eleven o'clock struck and the odour of the rabbit which was boiling with potatoes was already filling the house when zacharie and jeanlin came down last still yawning and with their swollen eyes the settlement was now in a flutter excited by the feast day and in expectation of dinner which was being hastened for the departure in bands to Monceau. troops of children were rushing about men in their shirt-sleeves were trailing their old shoes with the lazy gait of days of rest 
windows and doors opened wide in the fine weather gave glimpses of rows of parlors which were filled with movement and shouts and the chatter of families and from one end to the other of the frontages there was a smell of rabbit a rich kitchen smell which on this day struggled with the inveterate odor of fried onion the Mahus dined at midday they made little noise in the midst of the chatter from door to door in the coming and going of women in a constant uproar of calls and replies of objects borrowed of youngsters hunted away or brought back with a slap besides they had not been on good terms during the last three weeks with their neighbors the lavaques on the subject of the marriage of zacharie and philomene the men passed the time of day but the women pretended not to know each other this quarrel had strengthened the relations with Perron. only Perron had left Perron and lydie with her mother and set out early in the morning to spend the day with a cousin at marchand's and they joked for they knew this cousin she had a moustache and was head captain at the Verreaux. maheude declared that it was not proper to leave one's family on a feast day sunday beside the rabbit with potatoes a rabbit which had been fattening in the shed for a month the Mahus had meat soup and beef the fortnight's wages had just fallen due the day before they could not recollect such a spread even at the last st barbara's day the fit of the miners when they do nothing for three days the rabbit had not been so fat nor so tender so the ten pairs of jaws from little estelle whose teeth were beginning to appear to old bonmart who was losing his worked so heartily that the bones themselves disappeared the meat was good but they could not digest it well they saw it too seldom everything disappeared there only remained a piece of boiled beef for the evening they could add bread and butter if they were hungry jeanlin went out first bebert was waiting for him behind the school and they prowled about for a long time before they were able to entice away lydie whom Brule, who had decided not to go out was trying to keep with her when she perceived that the child had fled she shouted and brandished her lean arms while Perron, annoyed at the disturbance strolled quietly away with the air of a husband who can amuse himself with a good conscience knowing that his wife also has her little amusements old bonmort set out at last and maheu decided to have a little fresh air after asking maheu if she would come and join him down below no she couldn't at all it was nothing but drudgery with the little ones but perhaps she would all the same she would think about it they could easily find each other when he got outside he hesitated then he went into the neighbor's to see if levaque was ready there he found zacharie who was waiting for philomene and the levaque woman started again on that everlasting subject of marriage saying that she was being made fun of and that she would have an explanation with maheu once and for all was life worth living when one had to keep one's daughter's fatherless children while she went off with her lover philomene quietly finished putting on her bonnet and zacharie took her off saying that he was quite willing if his mother was willing as levaque had already gone maheu referred his angry neighbor to his wife and hastened to depart but a little, who was finishing a fragment of cheese with both elbows on the table obstinately refused the friendly offer of a glass he would stay in the house like a good husband gradually the settlement was emptied all the men went off one behind the other while the girls watching at the doors set out in the opposite direction on the arms of their lovers as her father turned the corner of the church catherine perceived chaval and hastening to join him they took together the monceau road and the mother remained alone in the midst of her scattered children without strength to leave her chair where she was pouring out a second glass of boiling coffee which she drank in little sips in the settlement there were only the women left inviting each other to finish the dregs of the coffee pots around tables that were still warm and greasy with the dinner Mehu had guessed that Lavaque was at the advantage, and he slowly went down to Rasseneur's. In fact, behind the bar, in the little garden shut in by a hedge, 
levaque was having a game of skittles with some mates standing by and not playing father bonnemont and old mook were following the ball so absorbed that they even forgot to nudge each other with their elbows a burning sun struck down on them perpendicularly there was only one streak of shade by the side of the inn and etienne was there drinking his glass before a table annoyed because souverine had just left him to go up to his room nearly every sunday the engine man shut himself up to write or to read will you have a game asked levaque of maheu but he refused it was too hot he was already dying of thirst Brassenaud, called etienne bring a glass will you and turning towards maheu i'll stand it you know they now all treated each other familiarly Rasseneur did not hurry himself he had to be called three times and madame Rasseneur at last brought some lukewarm beer the young man had lowered his voice to complain about the house they were worthy people certainly people with good ideas but the beer was worthless and the soup abominable he would have changed his lodgings ten times over only the thought of the walk from the monceau held him back one day or another he would go and live with some family at the settlement sure enough said maheu in his slow voice sure enough you would be better in a family but shouts now broke out levaque had overthrown all the skittles at one stroke Mouk and bonnemort with their faces towards the ground in the midst of the tumult preserved a silence of profound approbation and the joy at the stroke found vent in jokes especially when the players perceived moquette's radiant face behind the hedge she had been prowling about there for an hour and at last ventured to come near on hearing the laughter what are you alone shouted levaque where are your sweethearts my sweethearts i've stabled them she replied with a fine impudent gaiety i'm looking for one they all offered themselves throwing coarse chaff at her she refused with a gesture and laughed louder playing the fine lady besides her father was watching the game without even taking his eyes from the fallen skittles ah levaque went on throwing a look towards etienne one can tell where you're casting sheep's eyes my girl you'll have to take him by force then etienne brightened up it was in fact around him that the putter was revolving and he refused amused indeed but without having the least desire for her she remained planted behind the hedge for some minutes longer looking at him with large fixed eyes then she slowly went away and her face suddenly became serious as if she were overcome by the powerful sun in a low voice etienne was again giving long explanations to maheu regarding the necessity for the monsoon miners to establish a provident fund since the company professes to leave us free he repeated what is there to fear we only have their pensions and they distribute them according to their own idea since they don't hold back any of our pay well it will be prudent to form outside their good pleasure an association of mutual help on which we can count at least in cases of immediate need and he gave details and discussed the organization promising to undertake the labor of it i am willing enough said maheu at last convinced but there are the others get them to make up their minds levaque had won and they left the scales to empty their glasses but maheu refused to drink a second glass he would see later on the day was not yet done he was thinking about Perron. where could he be no doubt at the l'enfant estaminet and having persuaded etienne and levaque the three set out for monceau at the same moment that a new band took possession of the skittles at the advantage on the road they had to pause at the casimir bar and then at the estimant du progrès comrades called them through the open doors and there was no way of refusing each time it was a glass too if they were polite enough to return the invitation they remained there ten minutes exchanging a few words and then began again a little farther on knowing the beer with which 
they could fill themselves without any other discomfort than having to piss it out again at the same measure as clear as rock water at the estaminet l'enfant they came right upon Piron, who was finishing his second glass and who in order not to refuse to touch glasses swallowed a third they naturally drank theirs also now there were four of them and they set out to see if zacharie was not at the estaminet tisson it was empty and they called for a glass in order to wait for him a moment then they thought of the estaminet saint eloi and accepted there a round from captain richomme then they rambled from bar to bar without any pretext simply saying that they were having a stroll we must go to the volcan suddenly said the levaque who was getting excited the others began to laugh and hesitated then they accompanied their comrade in the midst of the growing crowd in the long narrow room of the volcan on a platform raised at the end five singers the scum of the lille prostitutes were walking about low-necked and with monstrous gestures and the customers gave ten sous when they desired to have one behind the stage there was especially a number of putters and landers even trammers of fourteen all the youth of the pit drinking more gin than beer a few old miners also ventured there and the worst husbands of the settlements those whose households were falling into ruin as soon as the band was seated round a little table etienne took possession of levaque to explain to him his idea of the provident fund like all new converts who have found a mission he had become an obstinate propagandist every member he repeated could easily pay in twenty sous a month as these twenty sous accumulated they would form a nice little sum in four or five years and when one has money one is ready eh for anything that turns up eh what do you say about it i've nothing to say against it replied levaque with an abstracted air we will talk about it he was excited by an enormous blonde and determined to remain behind when Mehu and perron after drinking their glasses set out without waiting for a second song outside etienne who had gone with them found moquette who seemed to be following them she was always there looking at him with her large fixed eyes laughing her good-natured laugh as if to say are you willing the young man joked and shrugged his shoulders then with a gesture of anger she was lost in the crowd where then is chaval asked perron true said Mayo. he must surely be at piquette's let us go to piquette's but as they all three arrived at the estaminet piquette sounds of a quarrel arrested them at the door zacharie with his fist was threatening a thick-set phlegmatic walloon nail-maker while chaval with his hands in his pockets was looking on hello there's chaval said maheu quietly he is with catherine for five long hours the putter and her lover had been walking about the fair all along the montsou road that wide road with low bedaubed houses winding downhill a crowd of people wandered up and down in the sun like a trail of ants lost in the flat bare plain the eternal black mud had dried a black dust was rising and floating about like a storm cloud on both sides the public houses were crowded there were rows of tables to the street where stood a double rank of hucksters at stalls in the open air selling neck handkerchiefs and looking-glasses for the girls knives and caps for the lads to say nothing of sweetmeats sugar-plums and biscuits in front of the church archery was going on opposite the yards they were playing at bowls at the corner of the Oiselle road beside the administration buildings in a spot enclosed by fences crowds were watching a cock-fight two large red cocks armed with steel spurs their breasts torn and bleeding farther on at Magritte's, aprons and trousers were being won at billiards and there were long silences the crowd drank and stuffed itself without a sound a mute indigestion of beer and fried potatoes was expanding in the great heat still further increased by the frying pan bubbling in the open air chaval bought a looking-glass for nineteen sous and a handkerchief for three francs to give to catherine at every turn they met mouque and bonnemort 
who had come to the fair and in meditative mood were plodding heavily through it side by side another meeting made them angry they caught sight of jeanlin inciting bébert and lady to steal bottles of gin from an extemporized bar installed at the edge of an open piece of ground catherine succeeded in boxing her brother's ears the little girl had already run away with a bottle these imps of satan would certainly end in a prison then as they arrived before another bar the tete coupe it occurred to chaval to take his sweetheart in to a competition of chaffinches which had been announced on the door for the past week fifteen nail-makers from the marchiennes nail-works had responded to the appeal each with a dozen cages and the gloomy little cages in which the blinded finches sat motionless were already hung upon a paling in the end yard it was a question as to which in the course of an hour should repeat the phrase of its song the greatest number of times each nail-maker with a slate stood near his cages to mark watching his neighbors and watched by them and the chaffinches had begun the chichoi u with a deeper note the batisicoics with their shriller notes all at first timid and only risking a rare phrase then excited by each other's songs increasing the pace then at last carried away by such a rage of rivalry that they would even fall dead the nail-makers violently whipped them on with their voices shouting out to them in walloon to sing more still more yet a little more while the spectators about a hundred people stood by in mute fascination in the midst of this infernal music of a hundred and eighty chaffinches all repeating the same cadence out of time it was a batisicouic which gained the first prize a metal coffee-pot catherine and chaval were there when zacharie and philomene entered they shook hands and all stayed together but suddenly zacharie became angry for he discovered that a nail-maker who had come in with his mates out of curiosity was pinching his sister's thigh she blushed and tried to make him be silent trembling at the idea that all these nail-makers would throw themselves on chaval and kill him if he objected to her being pinched she had felt the pinch but said nothing out of prudence her lover however merely made a grimace and as they all four now went out the affair seemed to be finished but hardly had they entered piquette's to drink a glass when the nail-maker reappeared making fun of them and coming close up to them with an air of provocation zacharie insulted in his good family feelings threw himself on the insolent intruder that's my sister you swine just wait a bit and i'm damned if i don't make you respect her the two men were separated while chaval who was quite calm only repeated let be it's my concern i tell you i don't care a damn for him maheu now arrived with his party and quieted catherine and philomene who were in tears the nail-maker had disappeared and there was laughter in the crowd to bring the episode to an end chaval who was at home at the estaminet piquette called for drinks etienne had touched glasses with catherine and all drank together the father the daughter and her lover the son and his mistress saying politely to your good health piron afterwards persisted in paying for more drinks and they were all in good humour when zacharie grew wild again at the sight of his comrade moquette and called him as he said to go and finish his affair with the nail-maker i shall have to go and do for him here chaval keep philomene with catherine i'm coming back maheu offered drinks in his turn after all if the lad wished to avenge his sister it was not a bad example but as soon as she had seen moquet philomene felt at rest and nodded her head sure enough the two chaps would be off to the balkan on the evenings of feast days the fair was terminated in the ballroom of the bon joyeux it was a widow madame de serre who kept this ballroom a fat matron of fifty as round as a tub but so fresh that she still had six lovers one for every day of the week she said and the six together for sunday 
she called all the miners her children and grew tender at the thought of the flood of beer which she had poured out for them during the last thirty years and she boasted also that a putter never became pregnant without having first stretched her legs at her establishment there were two rooms in the bon joyeux the bar which contained the counter and tables then communicating with it on the same floor by a large arch was the ballroom a large hall only planked in the middle being paved with bricks round the sides it was decorated with two garlands of paper flowers which crossed one another and were united in the middle by a crown of the same flowers while along the walls were rows of gilt shields bearing the names of saints saint Eloi, patron of the iron workers saint crispin patron of the shoemakers saint barbara patron of the miners the whole calendar of corporations the ceiling was so low that the three musicians on their platform which was about the size of a pulpit knocked their heads against it when it became dark four petroleum lamps were fastened to the four corners of the room on this sunday there was dancing from five o'clock with the full daylight through the windows but it was not until towards seven that the rooms began to fill outside a gale was rising blowing great black showers of dust which blinded people and sleeted into the frying pans Mehu, etienne and perron having come in to sit down had found chaval at the bon joyeux dancing with catherine while philomene by herself was looking on neither levaque nor zacharie had reappeared as there were no benches around the ballroom catherine came after each dance to rest at her father's table they called philomene but she preferred to stand up the twilight was coming on the three musicians played furiously one could only see in the hall the movement of hips and breasts in the midst of a confusion of arms the appearance of the four lamps was greeted noisily and suddenly everything was lit up the red faces the dishevelled hair sticking to the skin the flying skirts spreading abroad the strong odour of perspiring couples maheu pointed out moquette to etienne she was as round and greasy as a bladder of lard revolving violently in the arms of a tall lean lander she had been obliged to to console herself and take a man at last at eight o'clock Mehid appeared with estelle at her breast followed by alzire henri and lenore she had come there straight to her husband without fear of missing him they could sup later on as yet nobody was hungry with their stomachs soaked in coffee and thickened with beer other women came in and they whispered together when they saw behind Mehid the levaque woman enter with Bataloupe who led in by the hand Achille and desire philomene's little ones the two neighbors seemed to be getting on well together one turning round to chat with the other on the way there had been a great explanation and Mehude had resigned herself to zacharie's marriage in despair at the loss of her eldest son's wages but overcome by the thought that she could not hold it back any longer without injustice she was trying therefore to put a good face on it though with an anxious heart as a housekeeper who was asking herself how she could make both ends meet now that the best part of her purse was going place yourself there neighbor she said pointing to a table near that where maheu was drinking with etienne and pierron is not my husband with you asked the levaque woman the others told her that he would come soon they were all seated together in a heap but a loop and the youngsters so tightly squeezed among the drinkers that the two tables only formed one there was a call for drinks seeing her mother and her children philomene had decided to come near she accepted a chair and seemed pleased to hear that she was at last to be married then as they were looking for zacharie she replied in her soft voice i am waiting for him he is over there Mehu had exchanged a look with his wife. She had then consented. He became serious and smoked in silence. He also felt anxiety for the morrow in face of the ingratitude of these children who got married one by one, leaving their parents in wretchedness. The dancing still went on, and the end of a quadrille drowned the ballroom in red dust. The walls cracked, 
a cornet produced shrill whistling sounds like a locomotive in distress and when the dancers stopped they were smoking like horses do you remember said the levaque woman bending towards maheude's ear you talked of strangling catherine if she did anything foolish chaval brought catherine back to the family table and both of them standing behind the father finished their glasses bah murmured maheude with an air of resignation one says things like that but what quiets me is that she will not have a child i feel sure of that you see if she is confined and obliged to marry what shall we do for a living then now the cornet was whistling a polka and as the deafening noise began again maheu in a low voice communicated an idea to his wife why should they not take a lodger etienne for example who was looking out for quarters they would have room since zacharie was going to leave them and the money that they would lose in that direction would be in part regained in the other maheude's face brightened certainly it was a good idea it must be arranged she seemed to be saved from starvation once more and her good humour returned so quickly that she ordered a new round of drinks etienne meanwhile was seeking to indoctrinate Perron, to whom he was explaining his plan of a provident fund he had made him promise to subscribe when he was imprudent enough to reveal his real aim and if we go out on strike you can see how useful that fund will be we can snap our fingers at the company we shall have there a fund to fight against them eh don't you think so Perron lowered his eyes and grew pale he stammered i think it over good conduct that's the best provident fund then maheu took possession of etienne and squarely like a good man proposed to take him as a lodger the young man accepted at once anxious to live in the settlement with the idea of being nearer to his mates the matter was settled in three words maheude declaring that they would wait for the marriage of the children just then zacharie at last came back with moquet and levaque the three brought in the odours of the volcan a breath of gin a musky acidity of ill-kept girls they were very tipsy and seemed well pleased with themselves digging their elbows into each other and grinning when he knew that he was at last to be married zacharie began to laugh so loudly that he choked philomene peacefully declared that she would rather see him laugh than cry as there were no more chairs father loup had moved so as to give up half of his to levaque and the latter suddenly much affected by realizing that the whole family party was there once more had beer served out by the lord we don't amuse ourselves so often he roared they remained there till ten o'clock women continued to arrive either to join or to take away their men bands of children followed in rows and the mothers no longer troubled themselves pulling out their long pale breasts like sacks of oats and smearing their chubby babies with milk while the little ones who were already able to walk gorged with beer and on all fours beneath the table relieved themselves without shame it was a rising sea of beer from madame Dessir's disemboweled barrels the beer enlarged every belly flowing from noses eyes and everywhere so puffed out was the crowd that every one had a shoulder or knee poking into his neighbour all were cheerful and merry in thus feeling each other's elbows a continuous laugh kept their mouths open from ear to ear the heat was like an oven they were roasting and felt themselves at ease with glistening skin gilded in a thick smoke from the pipes the only discomfort was when one had to move away from time to time a girl rose went to the other end near the pump lifted her clothes and then came back beneath the garlands of painted paper the dancers could no longer see each other they perspired so much this encouraged the trammers to tumble the putters over catching them at random by the hips but where a girl tumbled with a man over her the cornet covered their fall with its furious music the swirl of feet wrapped them round as if the ball had collapsed upon them someone who was passing warned perron that his daughter lydie was sleeping at the door across the pavement she had drunk her share of the stolen bottle and was tipsy he had to carry her away in his arms while jeanlin and bebert 
who were more sober followed him behind thinking it a great joke this was the signal for departure and several families came out of the bon joyeux the mehus and the levaques deciding to return to the settlement at the same moment father bonmort and old monk also left monceau walking in the same somnambulistic manner preserving the obstinate silence of their recollections and they all went back together passing for the last time through the fair where the frying-pans were coagulating and by the estaminets from which the last glasses were flowing in a stream towards the middle of the road the storm was still threatening and sounds of laughter arose as they left the lighted houses to lose themselves in the dark country around panting breaths arose from the ripe wheat many children must have been made on that night they arrived in confusion at the settlement neither the levaques nor the mathieus supped with appetite and the latter kept on dropping off to sleep while finishing their morning's boiled beef etienne had led away chaval for one more drink at rasseneur's i am with you said chaval when his mate had explained the matter of the provident fund put it there you're a fine fellow the beginning of drunkenness was flaming in etienne's eyes he exclaimed yes let's join hands as for me you know i would give up everything for the sake of justice both drink and girls there's only one thing that warms my heart and that is the thought that we are going to sweep away these bourgeois End of section thirteen. section fourteen of germinal by emile zola translated by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain according by matt perard part three chapter three towards the middle of august etienne settled with the maheus zachary having married and obtained from the company a vacant house in the settlement for philomene and the two children during the first days the young man experienced some constraint in the presence of catherine there was a constant intimacy as he everywhere replaced the elder brother sharing jeanlin's bed over against the big sisters going to bed and getting up he had to dress and undress near her and see her take off and put on her garments when the last skirt fell from her she appeared of pallid whiteness that transparent snow of anemic blondes and he experienced a constant emotion in finding her with hands and face already spoilt as white as if dipped in milk from her heels to her neck where the line of tan stood out sharply like a necklace of amber he pretended to turn away but little by little he knew her the feet at first which his lowered eyes met then a glimpse of a knee when she slid beneath the coverlet then her bosom with little rigid breasts as she leant over the bowl in the morning she would hasten without looking at him and in ten seconds was undressed and stretched beside alzire with so supple and snake-like a movement that he had scarcely taken off his shoes when she disappeared turning her back and only showing her heavy knot of hair she never had any reason to be angry with him if a sort of obsession made him watch her in spite of himself at the moment when she lay down he avoided all practical jokes or dangerous pastimes the parents were there and besides he still had for her a feeling half of friendship and half of spite which prevented him from treating her as a girl to be desired in the midst of the abandonment of their now common life in dressing at meals during work where nothing of them remained secret not even their most intimate needs all the modesty of the family had taken refuge in the daily bath for which the young girl now went upstairs alone while the men bathed below one after the other at the end of the first month etienne and catherine seemed no longer to see each other when in the evening before extinguishing the candle they moved about the room undressed she had ceased to hasten and resumed her old custom of doing up her hair at the edge of her bed while her arms raised in the air lifted her chemise to her thighs and he without his trousers sometimes helped her looking for the hairpins that she had lost custom killed the shame of being naked 
they found it natural to be like this for they were doing no harm and it was not their fault if there was only one room for so many people sometimes however a trouble came over them suddenly at moments when they had no guilty thought after some nights when he had not seen her pale body he suddenly saw her white all over with a whiteness which shook him with a shiver which obliged him to turn away for fear of yielding to the desire to take her on other evenings without any apparent reason she would be overcome by a panic of modesty and hastened to slip between the sheets as if she felt the hands of this lad seizing her then when the candle was out they both knew that they were not sleeping but were thinking of each other in spite of their weariness this made them restless and sulky all the following day they liked best the tranquil evenings when they could behave together like comrades etienne only complained of jeanlin who slept curled up alzire slept lightly and lenore and henri were found in the morning in each other's arms exactly as they had gone to sleep in the dark house there was no other sound than the snoring of Mehu and Mehud, rolling out at regular intervals like a forge bellows on the whole etienne was better off than at rasseneur's the bed was tolerable and the sheets were changed every month he had better soup too and only suffered from the rarity of meat but they were all in the same condition and for forty-five francs he could not demand rabbit to every meal these forty-five francs helped the family and enabled them to make both ends meet though always leaving some small debts and arrears so the mehus were grateful to their lodger his linen was washed and mended his buttons sewn on and his affairs kept in order in fact he felt all around him a woman's neatness and care it was at this time that etienne began to understand the ideas that were buzzing in his brain up till then he had only felt an instinctive revolt in the midst of the inarticulate fermentation among his mates all sorts of confused questions came before him why are some miserable why are others rich why are the former beneath the heel of the latter without hope of ever taking their place and his first stage was to understand his ignorance a secret shame a hidden annoyance gnawed him from that time he knew nothing he dared not talk about these things which were working in him like a passion the equality of all men and the equity which demanded a fair division of the earth's wealth he thus took to the methodless study of those who in ignorance feel the fascination of knowledge he now kept up a regular correspondence with Bouchard, who was better educated than himself and more advanced in the socialist movement he had books sent to him and his ill-digested reading still further excited his brain especially a medical book entitled hygiene du minor in which a belgian doctor had summed up the evils of which the people in coal mines were dying without counting treatises on political economy incomprehensible in their technical dryness anarchist pamphlets which upset his ideas and old numbers of newspapers which he preserved as irrefutable arguments for possible discussions souverain also lent him books and the works on cooperative societies had made him dream for a month of a universal exchange association abolishing money and basing the whole social life on work the shame of his ignorance left him and a certain pride came to him now that he felt himself thinking during these first months etienne retained the ecstasy of a novice his heart was bursting with generous indignation against the oppressors and looking forward to the approaching triumph of the oppressed he had not yet manufactured a system his reading had been too vague rasseneur's practical demands were mixed up in his mind with souverains violent and destructive methods and when he came out of the advantage where he was to be found nearly every day railing with them against the company he walked as if in a dream assisting at a radical regeneration of nations to be effected without one broken window or a single drop of blood the methods of execution 
remained obscure he preferred to think that things would go very well for he lost his head as soon as he tried to formulate a program of reconstruction he even showed himself full of illogical moderation he often said that we must banish politics from the social question a phrase which he had read and which seemed a useful one to repeat among the phlegmatic colliers with whom he lived every evening now at the Mehus, they delayed half an hour before going to bed etienne always introduced the same subject as his nature became more refined he found himself wounded by the promiscuity of the settlement were they beasts to be thus pinned together in the midst of fields so tightly packed that one could not change one's shirt without exhibiting one's backside to the neighbors and how bad it was for health and boys and girls were forced to grow corrupt together lord replied Mayhew, if there were more money there would be more comfort all the same it's true enough that it's good for no one to live piled up like that it always ends with making the men drunk and the girls big-bellied and the family began to talk each having his say while the petroleum lamp vitiated the air of the room already stinking of fried onion no life was certainly not a joke one had to work like a brute of labor which was once a punishment for convicts one left one's skin there oftener than was one's turn all that without even getting meat on the table in the evening no doubt one had one's feed one ate indeed but so little just enough to suffer without dying overcome with debts and pursued as if one had stolen the bread when sunday came one slept from weariness the only pleasures were to get drunk and to get a child with one's wife then the beer swelled the belly and the child later on left you to go to the dogs no it was certainly not a joke then maheu joined in the bother is you see when you have to say to yourself that it won't change when you're young you think that happiness will come some time you hope for things and then the wretchedness begins always over again and you get shut up in it now i don't wish harm to any one but there are times when this injustice makes me mad there was silence they were all breathing with the vague discomfort of this closed-in horizon father bonmort only if he was there opened his eyes with surprise for in his time people used not to worry about things they were born in the coal and they hammered at the seam without asking for more while now there was an air of stirring which made the colliers ambitious it don't do to spit at anything he murmured a good glass is a good glass as to the masters they're often rascals but they are always will be masters won't there what's the use of racking your brains over those things etienne at once became animated what the worker was to be forbidden to think why that was just it things would change now because the worker had begun to think in the old man's time the miner lived in the mine like a brute like a machine for extracting coal always under the earth with ears and eyes stopped to outward events so the rich who governed found it easy to sell him and buy him and to devour his flesh he did not even know what was going on but now the miner was waking up down there germinating in the earth just as a grain germinate and some fine day he would spring up in the midst of the fields yes men would spring up an army of men who would re-establish justice is it not true that all citizens are equal since the revolution because they vote together why should the worker remain the slave of the master who pays him the big companies with their machines were crushing everything and one no longer had against them the ancient guarantees when people of the same trade united in a body were able to defend themselves it was for that by god and for no other reason that all would burst up one day thanks to education one had only to look into the settlement itself the grandfathers could not sign their names the fathers could do so and as for the sons they read and wrote like schoolmasters ah it was springing up it was springing up little by little a rough harvest of men who would ripen in the sun 
from the moment when they were no longer each of them stuck to his place for his whole existence and when they had the ambition to take a neighbor's place why should they not hit out with their fists and try for the mastery maheu was shaken but remained full of doubts as soon as you move they give you back your certificate he said the old man is right it will always be the miner who gets all the trouble without a chance of a leg of mutton now and then as a reward Mahud, who had been silent for a while awoke as from a dream but if what the priests tell is true if the poor people in this world become the rich ones in the next a burst of laughter interrupted her even the children shrugged their shoulders being incredulous in the open air keeping a secret fear of ghosts in the pit but glad of the empty sky ah bosh the priests exclaimed maheu if they believed that they'd eat less and work more so as to reserve a better place for themselves up there no when one's dead one's dead maheu sighed deeply oh lord lord then her hands fell on to her knees with a gesture of immense dejection then if that's true we are done for we are they all looked at one another father bonnemort spat into his handkerchief while maheu sat with his extinguished pipe which he had forgotten in his mouth alzire listened between lenore and henri who were sleeping on the edge of the table but catherine with her chin in her hand never took her large clear eyes off etienne while he was protesting declaring his faith and opening out the enchanting future of his social dream around them the settlement was asleep one only heard the stray cries of a child or the complaints of a belated drunkard in the parlor the clocks ticked slowly and a damp freshness arose from the sanded floor in spite of the stuffy air fine ideas said the young man why do you need a good god in his paradise to make you happy haven't you got it in your own power to make yourselves happy on earth with his enthusiastic voice he spoke on and on the close horizon was bursting out a gap of light was opening in the sombre lives of these poor people the eternal wretchedness beginning over and over again the brutalizing labor the fate of a beast who gives his wool and has his throat cut all the misfortune disappeared as though swept away by a great flood of sunlight and beneath the dazzling gleam of fairyland justice descended from heaven since the good god was dead justice would assure the happiness of men and equality and brotherhood would reign a new society would spring up in a day just as in dreams an immense town with the splendor of a mirage in which each citizen lived by his work and took his share in the common joys the old rotten world had fallen to dust a young humanity purged from its crimes formed but a single nation of workers having for their motto to each according to his deserts and to each desert according to its performance and this stream grew continually larger and more beautiful and more seductive as it mounted higher in the impossible at first maheu refused to listen possessed by a deep dread no no it was too beautiful it would not do to embark upon these ideas for they made life seem abominable afterwards and one would have destroyed everything in the effort to be happy when she saw maheu's eyes shine and that he was troubled and won over she became restless and exclaimed interrupting etienne don't listen my man you can see he's only telling us fairy tales do you think the bourgeois would ever consent to work as we do but little by little the charm worked on her also her imagination was aroused and she smiled at last entering his marvellous world of hope it was so sweet to forget for a while the sad reality when one lives like the beast with face bent towards the earth one needs a corner of falsehood where one can amuse oneself by regaling on the things one will never possess and what made her enthusiastic and brought her into agreement with the young man was the idea of justice now there you're right she exclaimed when a thing's just i don't mind being cut to pieces for it 
and it's true enough it would be just for us to have a turn then maheu ventured to become excited blast it all i am not rich but i would give five francs to keep alive to see that what a hustling eh will it be soon and how can we set about it etienne began talking again the old social system was cracking it could not last more than a few months he affirmed roundly as to the methods of execution he spoke more vaguely mixing up his reading and fearing before ignorant hearers to enter on explanations where he might lose himself all the systems had their share in it softened by the certainty of easy triumph a universal kiss which would bring to an end all class misunderstandings without taking count however of the thick heads among the masters and bourgeois whom it would perhaps be necessary to bring to reason by force and the maheus looked as if they understood approving and accepting miraculous solutions with the blind faith of new believers like those christians of the early days of the church who awaited the coming of a perfect society on the dunghill of the ancient world little azir picked up a few words and imagined happiness under the form of a very warm house where children could play and eat as long as they liked catherine without moving her chin always resting in her hand kept her eyes fixed on etienne and when he stopped a slight shudder passed over her and she was quite pale as if she felt the cold but maheu looked at the clock past nine can it be possible we shall never get up to-morrow and the maheus left the table with hearts ill at ease and in despair it seemed to them that they had just been rich and that they had now suddenly fallen back into the mud father von mort who was setting out for the pit growled that those sort of stories wouldn't make the soup better while the others went upstairs in single file noticing the dampness of the walls and the pestiferous stuffiness of the air upstairs amid the heavy slumber of the settlement when catherine had got into bed last and blown out the candle at the end heard her tossing feverishly before getting to sleep often at these conversations the neighbors came in levaque who grew excited at the idea of a general sharing Perron, who prudently went to bed as soon as they attacked the company at long intervals zachary came in for a moment but politics bored him he preferred to go off and drink a glass at the advantage as to cheval he would go to extremes and wanted to draw blood nearly every evening he passed an hour with the maheus in this assiduity there was a certain unconfessed jealousy the fear that he would be robbed of catherine this girl of whom he was already growing tired had become precious to him now that a man slept near her and could take her at night etienne's influence increased he gradually revolutionized the settlement his propaganda was unseen and all the more sure since he was growing in the estimation of all Mahid, notwithstanding the caution of a prudent housekeeper treated him with consideration as a young man who paid regularly and neither drank nor gambled with his nose always in a book she spread abroad his reputation among the neighbors as an educated lad a reputation which they abused by asking him to write their letters he was a sort of business man charged with correspondence and consulted by households in affairs of difficulty since september he had thus at last been able to establish his famous provident fund which was still very precarious only including the inhabitants of the settlement but he hoped to be able to obtain the adhesion of the miners at all the pits especially if the company which had remained passive continued not to interfere he had been made secretary of the association and he even received a small salary for the clerking this made him almost rich if a married miner can with difficulty make both ends meet a sober lad who had no burdens can even manage to save from this time a slow transformation took place in etienne certain instincts of refinement and comfort which had slept during his poverty were now revealed he began to buy cloth garments 
he also bought a pair of elegant boots he became a big man the whole settlement grouped round him the satisfaction of his self-love was delicious he became intoxicated with this first enjoyment of popularity to be at the head of others to command he who was so young and but the day before had been a mere labourer this filled him with pride and enlarged his dream of an approaching revolution in which he was to play a part his face changed he became serious and put on airs while his growing ambition inflamed his theories and pushed him to ideas of violence but autumn was advancing and the october cold had blighted the little gardens of the settlement behind the thin lilacs the trammers no longer tumbled the putters over on the shed and only the winter vegetables remained the cabbages pearled with white frost the leeks and the salads once more the rains were beating down on the red tiles and flowing down into the tubs beneath the gutters with the sound of a torrent in every house the stove piled up with coal was never cold and poisoned the close parlors it was the season of wretchedness beginning once more in october on one of the first frosty nights etienne feverish after his conversation below could not sleep he had seen catherine glide beneath the coverlet and then blow out the candle she also appeared to be quite overcome and tormented by one of those fits of modesty which still made her hasten sometimes and so awkwardly that she only uncovered herself more in the darkness she lay as though dead but he knew that she also was awake and he felt that she was thinking of him just as he was thinking of her this mute exchange of their beings had never before filled them with such trouble the minutes went by and neither he nor she moved only their breathing was embarrassed in spite of their efforts to, re to retain it twice over he was on the point of rising and taking her it was idiotic to have such a strong desire for each other and never to satisfy it why should they thus sulk against what they desired the children were asleep she was quite willing he was certain that she was waiting for him stifling and that she would close her arms round him in silence with clenched teeth nearly an hour passed he did not go to take her and she did not turn round for fear of calling him the more they lived side by side the more a barrier was raised of shames repugnancies delicacies of friendship which they could not explain even to themselves End of section 14section fifteen of germinal by emile zola translated by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perore part three chapter four listen said maheu to her man when you go to montsou for the pay just bring me back a pound of coffee and a kilo of sugar he was selling one of his shoes in order to spare the cobbling good he murmured without leaving his task i should like you to go to the butcher's too a bit of veal eh it's so long since we saw it this time he raised his head do you think then that i've got thousands coming in the fortnight's pay is too little as it is with their confounded idea of always stopping work they were both silent it was after breakfast one saturday at the end of october the company under the pretext of the derangement caused by payment had on this day once more suspended output in all their pits seized by panic at the growing industrial crisis and not wishing to augment their already considerable stock they profited by the smallest pretext to force their ten thousand workers to rest you know that etienne is waiting for you at rasseneur's began Mehid again take him with you you'll be more clever than you are in clearing up matters if they haven't counted all your hours maheu nodded approval and just talk to those gentlemen about your father's affair the doctor's on good terms with the directors it's true isn't it old un that the doctor's mistaken and that you can still work for ten days father bonmort with benumbed paws as he said had remained nailed to his chair 
she had to repeat her question and he growled sure enough i can work one isn't done for because one's legs are bad all that is just stories they make up so as not to give the hundred and eighty franc pension maheude thought of the old man's forty sous which he would perhaps never bring in any more and she uttered a cry of anguish my god we shall soon be all dead if this goes on when one is dead said maheu one doesn't get hungry he put some nails into his shoes and decided to set out the du saint quarante settlement would not be paid till towards four o'clock the men did not hurry therefore but waited about going off one by one beset by the women who implored them to come back at once many gave them commissions to prevent them forgetting themselves in public houses at rossignol etienne had received news disquieting rumours were flying about it was said that the company was more and more discontented over the timbering they were overwhelming the workmen with fines and a conflict appeared inevitable that was however only the avowed dispute beneath it were grave and secret causes of complication just as etienne arrived a comrade who was drinking a glass on his return from Monceau, was telling that an announcement had been stuck up at the cashier's but he did not quite know what was on the announcement a second entered then a third and each brought a different story it seemed certain however that the company had taken a resolution what do you say about it eh asked etienne sitting down near Sauron at a table where nothing was to be seen but a packet of tobacco the engine man did not hurry but finished rolling a cigarette i say that it was easy to foresee they want to push you to extremes he alone had a sufficiently keen intelligence to analyze the situation he explained it in his quiet way the company suffering from the crisis had been forced to reduce their expenses if they were not to succumb and it was naturally the workers who would have to tighten their bellies under some pretext or another the company would nibble at their wages for two months the coal had been remaining at the surface of their pits and nearly all the workshops were resting as the company did not dare to rest in this way terrified at the ruinous inaction they were meditating a middle course perhaps a strike from which the miners would come out crushed and worse paid then the new provident fund was disturbing them as it was a threat for the future while a strike would relieve them of it by exhausting it when it was still small rasseneur had seated himself beside etienne and both of them were listening in consternation they could talk aloud because there was no one there but madame rasseneur seated at the counter what an idea murmured the innkeeper what's the good of it the company has no interest in a strike nor the men either it would be best to come to an understanding this was very sensible he was always on the side of reasonable demands since the rapid popularity of his old lodger he had even exaggerated the system of possible progress saying they would obtain nothing if they wished to have everything at once in his fat good-humoured nature nourished on beer a secret jealousy was forming increased by the desertion of his bar into which the workmen from the bureau now came more rarely to drink and to listen and he thus sometimes even began to defend the company forgetting the rancour of an old miner who had been turned off then you are against the strike cried madame rasseneur without leaving the counter and as he energetically replied yes she made him hold his tongue bah you have no courage let these gentlemen speak etienne was meditating with his eyes fixed on the glass which she had served to him at last he raised his head i dare say it's all true what our mate tells us and we must get resigned to the strike if they force it on us Pluchart has just written me some very sensible things on this matter he's against the strike too for the men would suffer as much as the masters and it wouldn't come to anything decisive only it seems to him a capital chance to get our men to make up their minds to go into his big machine here's his letter in fact pluchart in despair at the suspicion which the international aroused among the miners at monceau 
was hoping to see them enter in a mass if they were forced to fight against the company in spite of his efforts etienne had not been able to place a single member's card and he had given his best efforts to his provident fund which was much better received but this fund was still so small that it would be quickly exhausted as souverain said and the strikers would then inevitably throw themselves into the working men's association so that their brothers in every country could come to their aid how much have you in the fund asked rasseneur hardly three thousand francs replied etienne and you know that the directors sent for me yesterday oh they were very polite they repeated that they wouldn't prevent their men from forming a reserve fund but i quite understood that they wanted to control it we are bound to have a struggle over that the innkeeper was walking up and down whistling contemptuously three thousand francs what can you do with that it wouldn't yield six days bread and if we counted on foreigners such as the people in england one might go to bed at once and turn up one's toes no it was too foolish this strike then for the first time bitter words passed between these two men who usually agreed together at last in their common hatred of capital we shall see and you what do you say about it repeated etienne turning towards souverain the latter replied with his usual phrase of habitual contempt a strike foolery then in the midst of the angry silence he added gently on the whole i shouldn't say no if it amuses you it ruins the one side and kills the other and that is always so much cleared away only in that way it will take quite a thousand years to renew the world just begin by blowing up this prison in which you are all being done to death with his delicate hand he pointed out the Voreux, the buildings of which could be seen through the open door but an unforeseen drama interrupted him poland the big tame rabbit which had ventured outside came bounding back fleeing from the stones of a band of trammers and in her terror with fallen ears and raised tail she took refuge against his legs scratching and imploring him to take her up when he had placed her on his knees he sheltered her with both hands and fell into that kind of dreamy somnolence into which the caress of this soft warm fur always plunged him almost at the same time maheu came in he would drink nothing in spite of the polite insistence of madame rasseneur who sold her beer as though she made a present of it etienne had risen and both of them set out for montsou on payday at the company's yards montsou seemed to be in the midst of a fete as on fine sunday feast days bands of miners arrived from all the settlements the cashier's office being very small they preferred to wait at the door stationed in groups on the pavement barring the way in a crowd that was constantly renewed hucksters profited by the occasion and installed themselves with their movable stalls that sold even pottery and cooked meats but it was especially the estaminets and the bars which did a good trade for the miners before being paid went to the counters to get patients and returned to them to wet their pay as soon as they had it in their pockets but they were very sensible except when they finished it at the volcan as maheu and etienne advanced among the groups they felt that on that day a deep exasperation was rising up it was not the ordinary indifference with which the money was taken and spent at the publics fists were clenched and violent words were passing from mouth to mouth is it true then asked maheu of chaval whom he met before the estaminet piquet that they've played the dirty trick but chaval contented himself by replying with a furious growl throwing a sidelong look on etienne since the working had been renewed he had hired himself on with others more and more bitten by envy against this comrade the newcomer who posed as a boss and whose boots as he said were licked by the whole settlement this was complicated by a lover's jealousy he never took catherine to Requilar now or behind the pit-bank without accusing her in abominable language of sleeping with her mother's lodger then seized by a savage desire he would stifle her with caresses maheu asked him another question is it the voreux's turn now 
and when he turned his back after nodding affirmatively both men decided to enter the yards the counting-house was a small rectangular room divided in two by a grating on the forms along the wall five or six miners were waiting while the cashier assisted by a clerk was paying another who stood before the wicket with his cap in his hand above the form on the left a yellow placard was stuck up quite fresh against the smoky grey of the plaster and it was in front of this that the men had been constantly passing all the morning they entered two or three at a time stood in front of it and then went away without a word shrugging their shoulders as if their backs were crushed two colliers were just then standing in front of the announcement a young one with a square brutish head and a very thin one his face dull with age neither of them could read the young one spelt moving his lips the old one contented himself with gazing stupidly many came in thus to look without understanding read us up there said maheu who was not very strong either in reading to his companion then etienne began to read him the announcement it was a notice from the company to the miners of all the pits informing them that in consequence of the lack of care bestowed on the timbering and being weary of inflicting useless fines the company had resolved to apply a new method of payment for the extraction of coal henceforward they would pay for the timbering separately by the cubic metre of wood taken down and used based on the quantity necessary for good work the price of the tub of coal extracted would naturally be lowered in the proportion of fifty centimes to forty according to the nature and distance of the cuttings and a somewhat obscure calculation endeavoured to show that this diminution of ten centimes would be exactly compensated by the price of the timbering the company added also that wishing to leave every one time to convince himself of the advantages presented by this new scheme they did not propose to apply it till monday the first of december don't read so loud over there shouted the cashier we can't hear what we are saying etienne finished reading without paying attention to this observation his voice trembled and when he had reached the end they all continued to gaze steadily at the placard the old miner and the young one looked as though they expected something more then they went away with depressed shoulders good god muttered maheu he and his companions sat down absorbed with lowered heads and while files of men continued to pass before the yellow paper they made calculations were they being made fun of they could never make up with the timbering for the ten centimes taken off the tram at most they could only get to eight centimes so the company would be robbing them of two centimes without counting the time taken by careful work this then was what this disguised lowering of wages really came to the company was economizing out of the miners pockets good lord good lord repeated maheu raising his head we should be bloody fools if we took that but the wicket being free he went up to be paid the heads only of the workings presented themselves at the desk and then divided the money between their men to save time maheu and associates said the clerk Villonier seem cutting number seven he searched through the lists which were prepared from the inspection of the tickets on which the captain stated every day for each stall the number of trams extracted then he repeated Mayhew and associates villonier seam cutting number seven one hundred and thirty-five francs the cashier paid beg pardon sir stammered the pikeman in surprise are you sure you have not made a mistake he looked at the small sum of money without picking it up frozen by a shudder which went to his heart it was true he was expecting bad payment but it could not come to so little or he must have calculated wrong when he had given their shares to zacharie etienne and the other mate who replaced chaval there would remain at most fifty francs for himself his father catherine and jeanlin no no i've made no mistake replied the clerk there are two sundays and four rest days to be taken off that makes nine days of work maheu followed this calculation in a low voice 
nine days gave him about thirty francs eighteen to catherine nine to jeanlin as to father bonnemort he only had three days no matter by adding the ninety francs of zacharie and the two mates that would surely make more and don't forget the fines added the clerk twenty francs for fines for defective timbering the pikeman made a gesture of despair twenty francs of fines four days of rest that made out the account to think that he had once brought back a fortnight's pay of full a hundred and fifty francs when father bonnemort was working and zacharie had not yet set up house for himself well are you going to take it cried the cashier impatiently you can see there's someone else waiting if you don't want it say so as Mihir decided to pick up the money with his large trembling hand the clerk stopped him wait i have your name here to saint maheu is it not the general secretary wishes to speak to you go in he is alone the dazed workman found himself in a, an office furnished with old mahogany upholstered with faded green rep as he listened for five minutes to the general secretary a tall sallow gentleman who spoke to him over the papers of his bureau without rising but the buzzing in his ears prevented him from hearing he understood vaguely that the question of his father's retirement would be taken into consideration with a pension of a hundred and fifty francs fifty years of age and forty years of service then it seemed to him that the secretary's voice became harder there was a reprimand he was accused of occupying himself with politics an allusion was made to his lodger and the provident fund finally he was advised not to compromise himself with these follies he who was one of the best workmen in the mine he wished to protest but could only pronounce words at random twisting his cap between his feverish fingers and he retired stuttering certainly sir i can assure you sir outside when he had found etienne who was waiting for him he broke out well i am a bloody fool i ought to have replied not enough money to get bread and insults as well yes he has been talking against you he told me the settlement was being poisoned and what's to be done good god bend one's back and say thank you he's right that's the wisest plan Mayhew fell silent, overcome at once by rage and fear. Etienne was gloomily thinking. Once more they traversed the groups who blocked the road. The exasperation was growing, the exasperation of a calm race, the muttered warning of a storm, without violent gestures, terrible to see above this solid mass. A few men understanding accounts had made calculations, and the two centimes gained by the company over the wood were rumored about and excited the hardest heads but it was especially the rage over this disastrous pay the rebellion of the hunger against the rest days and the fines already there was not enough to eat and what would happen if wages were still further lowered in the estaminets the anger grew loud and fury so dried their throats that the little money taken went over the counters from Monceau to the settlement Etienne and Mehu never exchanged a word. When the latter entered, Mehu, who was alone with the children, noticed immediately that his hands were empty. "'Well, you're a nice one,' she said. "'Where's my coffee and my sugar and the meat? A bit of veal wouldn't have ruined you.' He made no reply, stifled by the emotion he had been keeping back. Then the coarse face of this man, hardened to work in the mines, became swollen with despair and large tears broke from his eyes and fell in a warm rain he had thrown himself into a chair weeping like a child and throwing fifty francs on the table here he stammered that's what i've brought you back that's our work for all of us Mehid looked at etienne and saw that he was silent and overwhelmed then she also wept how were nine people to live for a fortnight on fifty francs her eldest son had left them the old man could no longer move his legs it would soon mean death alzire threw herself round her mother's neck overcome on hearing her weep estelle was howling lenore and henri were sobbing and from the entire settlement there soon arose the same cry of wretchedness the men had come back and each household was lamenting the disaster of this bad pay 
the doors opened women appeared crying aloud outside as if their complaints could not be held beneath the ceilings of these small houses a fine rain was falling but they did not feel it they called one another from the pavements they showed one another in the hollow of their hands the money they had received look they've given him this do they want to make fools of people as for me see i haven't got enough to pay for the fortnight's bread with and just count mine i should have to sell my shifts maheude had come out like the others a group had formed around the Levaque woman who was shouting loudest of all for her drunkard of a husband had not even turned up and she knew that large or small the pay would melt away at the volcan philomene watched maheu so that zacharie should not get hold of the money pierron was the only one who seemed fairly calm for that sneak of a pierron always arranged things no one knew how so as to have more hours on the captain's ticket than his mates but mother Boulet thought this cowardly of her son-in-law she was among the enraged lean and erect in the midst of the group with her fists stretched towards monceau too thick she cried without naming the hambos that this morning i saw their servant go by in a carriage yes the cook in a carriage with two horses going to marchiennes to get fish sure enough a clamour arose and the and the abuse began again that servant in a white apron taken to the market of the neighbouring town in her master's carriage aroused indignation while the workers were dying of hunger they must have their fish at all costs perhaps they would not always be able to eat their fish the turn of the poor people would come and the ideas sown by etienne sprang up and expanded in this cry of revolt it was impatience before the promised age of gold a haste to get a share of the happiness beyond this horizon of misery closed in like the grave the injustice was becoming too great at last they would demand their rights since the bread was being taken out of their mouths the women especially would have liked at once to take by assault this ideal city of progress in which there was to be no more wretchedness it was almost night and the rain increased while they were still filling the settlement with their tears in the midst of the screaming helter-skelter of the children that evening at the advantage the strike was decided on rasseneur no longer struggled against it and souverain accepted it as a first step etienne summed up the situation in a word if the company really wanted a strike then the company should have a strike End of section 15section sixteen of germinal by emile zola translation by havelock ellis the slipper box recording is in the public domain reading by matt Gerard. part three chapter five a week passed and work went on suspiciously and mournfully in expectation of the conflict among the mehus the fortnight threatened to be more meagre than ever Mehud grew bitter in spite of her moderation and good sense her daughter catherine too had taken it into her head to stay out one night on the following morning she came back so weary and ill after this adventure that she was not able to go to the pit and she told with tears how it was not her fault for cheval had kept her threatening to beat her if she ran away he was becoming mad with jealousy and wished to prevent her from returning to etienne's bed where he well knew he said that the family made her sleep maheude was furious and after forbidding her daughter ever to see such a brute again talked of going to monceau to box his ears but all the same it was a day lost and the girl now that she had this lover preferred not to change him two days after there was another incident on monday and tuesday jeanlin who was supposed to be quietly engaged on his task at the bureau had escaped to run away into the marshes and the forest of vandame with bebert and lydie he had seduced them no one knew to what plunder or to what games of precocious children they had all three given themselves up he received a vigorous punishment 
a whipping which his mother applied to him on the pavement outside before the terrified children of the settlement who could have thought such a thing of children belonging to her who had cost so much since their birth and who ought now to be bringing something in and in this cry there was the remembrance of her own hard youth of the hereditary misery which made of each little one in the brood a breadwinner later on that morning when the men and the girl set out for the pit maheude sat up in her bed to say to jeanlin you know that if you begin that game again you little beast i'll take the skin off your bottom in maheude's new stall the work was hard this part of the filonniere seam was so thin that the pikemen squeezed between the wall and the roof grazed their elbows at their work it was too becoming very damp from hour to hour they feared a rush of water one of those sudden torrents which burst through rocks and carry away men the day before as etienne was violently driving in his pick and drawing it out he had received a jet of water in his face but this was only an alarm the cutting simply became damper and more unwholesome besides he now thought nothing of possible accidents he forgot himself there with his mates careless of peril they lived in fire damp without even feeling its weight on their eyelids the spider's web veil which it left on the eyelashes sometimes when the flame of the lamps grew paler and bluer than usual it attracted attention and a miner would put his head against the seam to listen to the low noise of the gas a noise of air bubbles escaping from each crack but the constant threat was of landslips for besides the insufficiency of the timbering always patched up too quickly the soil soaked with water would not hold three times during the day maheu had been obliged to add to the planking it was half-past two and the men would soon have to ascend lying on his side etienne was finishing the cutting of a block when a distant growl of thunder shook the whole mine what's that then he cried putting down his axe to listen he had at first thought that the gallery was falling in behind his back but maheu had already glided along the slope of the cutting saying it's a fall quick quick all tumbled down and hastened carried away by an impulse of anxious fraternity their lamps danced at their wrists in the deathly silence which had fallen they rushed in single file along the passages with bent backs as though they were galloping on all fours and without slowing this gallop they asked each other questions and threw brief replies where was it then in the cuttings perhaps no it came from below no from the haulage when they arrived at the chimney passage they threw themselves into it tumbling one over the other without troubling about bruises jeanlin with skin still red from the whipping of the day before had not run away from the pit on this day he was trotting with naked feet behind his tram closing the ventilation doors one by one when he was not afraid of meeting a captain he jumped on to the last tram which he was not allowed to do for fear he should go to sleep but his great amusement was whenever the tram was shunted to let another one pass to go and join bebert who was holding the reins in front he would come up slyly without his lamp and vigorously pinch his companion inventing mischievous monkey tricks with his yellow hair his large ears his lean muzzle lit up by little green eyes shining in the darkness with morbid precocity he seemed to have the obscure intelligence and the quick skill of a human abortion which had returned to its animal ways in the afternoon Malk brought Bataille, whose turn it was to the trammers and as the horse was snuffing in the shunting john lin who had glided up to bebert asked him what's the matter with the old hack to stop short like that he'll break my legs bebert could not reply he had to hold in bataille who was growing lively at the approach of the other tram the horse had smelled from afar his comrade trompette for whom he had felt great tenderness ever since the day when he had seen him disembarked in the pit one might say that it was the affectionate pity of an old philosopher anxious to console a young friend by imparting to him his own resignation and patience for trompette 
did not become reconciled drawing his trams without any taste for the work standing with lowered head blinded by the darkness and forever regretting the sun so every time that Vatel met him he put out his head snorting and moistened him with an encouraging caress by god swore bebert there they are licking each other's skins again then when trompette had passed he replied on the subject of Bataille, oh he's a cunning old beast when he stops like that it's because he guesses there's something in the way a stone or a hole and he takes care of himself he doesn't want to break his bones to-day i don't know what was the matter with him down there after the door he pushed it and stood stock still did you see anything no said jeanlin there's water i've got it up to my knees the tram set out again and on the following journey when he had opened the ventilation door with a blow from his head the tail again refused to advance neighing and trembling at last he made up his mind and set off with a bound jeanlin who closed the door had remained behind he bent down and looked at the mud through which through which he was paddling then raising his lamp he saw that the wood had given way beneath the continual bleeding of a spring just then a pikeman one berlot who was called chicot had arrived from his cutting in a hurry to go to his wife who had just been confined he also stopped and examined the planking and suddenly as the boy was starting to rejoin his train a tremendous cracking sound was heard and a landslip engulfed the man and the child there was deep silence a thick dust raised by the wind of the fall passed through the passages blinded and choked the miners came from every part even from the farthest stalls with their dancing lamps which feebly lighted up this gallop of black men at the bottom of these mole hills when the first men tumbled against the landslip they shouted out and called their mates a second band come from the cutting below found themselves on the other side of the mass of earth which stopped up the gallery it was at once seen that the roof had fallen in for a dozen metres at most the damage was not serious but all hearts were contracted when a death rattle was heard from the ruins bebert leaving his tram ran up repeating jeanlin is underneath jeanlin is underneath maheu at this very moment had come out of the passage with zacharie and etienne he was seized with a fury of despair and could only utter oaths my god my god my god catherine lydie and moquette who had also rushed up began to sob and shriek with terror in the midst of the fearful disorder which was increased by the darkness the men tried to make them be silent but they shrieked louder as each groan was heard the captain richomme had come up running in despair that neither negrel the engineer nor danseur was at the pit with his ear pressed against the rocks he listened and at last said those sounds could not come from a child a man must certainly be there maheu had already called jeanlin twenty times over not a breath was heard the little one must have been smashed up and still the groans continued monotonously they spoke to the agonized man asking him his name the groaning alone replied look sharp repeated Richon, who had already organized a rescue we can talk afterwards from each end the miners attacked the landslip with pick and shovel cheval worked without a word beside maheu and etienne while zacharie superintended the removal of the earth the hour for ascent had come and no one had touched food but they could not go up for their soup while their mates were in peril they realized however that the settlement would be disturbed if no one came back and it was proposed to send off the women but neither catherine nor moquette nor even lydie would move nailed to the spot with a desire to know what had happened and to help Lavoque then accepted the commission of announcing the landslip up above a simple accident which was being repaired it was nearly four o'clock in less than an hour the men had done a day's work half the earth would have already been removed if more rocks had not slid from the roof maheu persisted with such energy that he refused with a furious gesture when another man approached to relieve him for a moment 
gently said richomme at last we are getting near we must not finish them off in fact the groaning was becoming more and more distinct it was a continuous rattling which guided the workers and now it seemed to be beneath their very picks suddenly it stopped in silence they all looked at one another and shuddered as they felt the coldness of death pass in the darkness they dug on soaked in sweat their muscles tense to breaking they came upon a foot and then began to remove the earth with their hands freeing the limbs one by one the head was not hurt they turned their lamps on it and chicot's neck went round he was quite warm with his spinal column broken by a rock wrap him up in a covering and put him in a tram ordered the captain now for the lad look sharp maheu gave a last blow and an opening was made communicating with the men who were clearing away the soil from the other side they shouted out that they had just found jeanlin unconscious with both legs broken still breathing it was the father who took up the little one in his arms with clenched jaws constantly uttering my god to express his grief while catherine and the other women again began to shriek a procession was quickly formed bébert had brought back bataille who was harnessed to the trams in the first lay chicot's corpse supported by etienne in the second maheu was seated with jeanlin still unconscious on his knees covered by a strip of wool torn from a ventilation door they started at a walking pace on each tram was a lamp like a red star then behind followed the row of miners some fifty shadows in single file now that they were overcome by fatigue they trailed their feet slipping in the mud with the mournful melancholy of a flock stricken by an epidemic it took them nearly half an hour to reach the pit eye this procession beneath the earth in the midst of deep darkness seemed never to end through galleries which bifurcated and turned and unrolled at the pit high richomme who had gone on before had ordered an empty cage to be reserved perron immediately loaded the two trams in the first maheu remained with his wounded little one on his knees while in the other etienne kept chicot's corpse between his arms to hold it up when the men had piled themselves up in the other decks the cage rose it took two minutes the rain from the tubbing fell very cold and the men looked up towards the air impatient to see daylight fortunately a trammer sent to dr van der hagen's had found him and brought him back Chauvelin and the dead man were placed in the captain's room where from year's end to year's end a large fire burnt a row of buckets with warm water was ready for washing feet and two mattresses having been spread on the floor the man and the child were placed on them maheu and etienne alone entered outside putters miners and boys were running about forming groups and talking in a low voice as soon as the doctor had glanced at chicot done for you can wash him two overseers undressed him and then washed with a sponge this corpse blackened with coal and still dirty with the sweat of work nothing wrong with the head said the doctor again kneeling on jeanlin's mattress near the chest either ah it's the legs which have given he himself undressed the child unfastening the cap taking off the jacket drawing off the breeches and shirt with the skill of a nurse and the poor little body appeared as lean as an insect stained with black dust and yellow earth marbled by bloody patches nothing could be made out and they had to wash him also he seemed to grow leaner beneath the sponge the flesh so pallid and transparent that one could see the bones it was a pity to look on this last degeneration of a wretched race this mere nothing that was suffering and half crushed by the falling of the rocks when he was clean they perceived the bruises on the thighs two red patches on the white skin jeanlin awaking from his faint moaned standing up at the foot of the mattress with hands hanging down maheu was looking at him and large tears rolled from his eyes eh are you the father said the doctor raising his head no need to cry then you can see he's not dead help me instead he found two simple fractures but the right leg gave him some anxiety 
it would probably have to be cut off at this moment the engineer negrel and danseur who had been informed came up with Rochon. the first listened to the captain's narrative with an exasperated air he broke out always this cursed timbering had he not repeated a hundred times that they would leave their men down there and those brutes who talked about going out on strike if they were forced to timber more solidly the worst was that now the company would have to pay for the broken pots m hondo would be pleased who is it he asked of dansart who was standing in silence before the corpse which was being wrapped up in a sheet chicot one of our good workers replied the chief captain he has three children poor chap dr van der hagen ordered jean lin's immediate removal to his parents six o'clock struck twilight was already coming on and they would do well to remove the corpse also the engineer gave orders to harness the van and to bring a stretcher the wounded child was placed on the stretcher while the mattress and the dead body were put into the van some putters were still standing at the door talking with some miners who were waiting about to look on when the door reopened there was silence in the group a new procession was then formed the van in front then the stretcher and then the train of people they left the mine square and went slowly up the road to the settlement the first november cold had denuded the immense plain the night was now slowly bearing it like a shroud fallen from the livid sky etienne then in a low voice advised maheude to send catherine on to warn maheude so as to soften the blow the overwhelmed father who was following the stretcher agreed with a nod and the young girl set out running for they were now near but the van that gloomy well-known box was already signalled women ran out wildly on to the paths three or four rushed about in anguish without their bonnets soon there were thirty of them then fifty all choking with the same terror then someone was dead who was it the story told by levaque after first reassuring them now exaggerated their nightmare it was not one man it was ten who had perished and who were now being brought back in the van one by one catherine found her mother agitated by a presentiment and after hearing the first stammered words maheude cried the father's dead the young girl protested in vain speaking of jeanne lin without hearing her maheude had rushed forward and on seeing the van which was passing before the church she grew faint and pale the women at their doors mute with terror were stretching out their necks while others followed trembling as they wondered before whose house the procession would stop the vehicle passed and behind it maheude saw maheude who was accompanying the stretcher then when they had placed the stretcher at her door and when she saw jeanlin alive with his legs broken there was so sudden a reaction in her that she choked with anger stammering without tears is this it they cripple our little ones now both legs my god what do they want me to do with him be still then said dr van der hagen who had followed to attend to jeanlin would you rather he had remained below but maheude grew more furious while alzire lenore and henri were crying round her as she helped to carry up the wounded boy and to give the doctor what he needed she cursed fate and asked where she was to find money to feed invalids the old man was not then enough now this rascal too had lost his legs and she never ceased while other cries more heart-breaking lamentations were heard from a neighbouring house chicot's wife and children were weeping over the body it was now quite night the exhausted miners were at last eating their soup and the settlement had fallen into a melancholy silence only disturbed by these loud outcries three weeks passed it was found possible to avoid amputation jean lin kept both his legs but he remained lame on investigation the company had resigned itself to giving a donation of fifty francs it had also promised to find employment for the little cripple at the surface as soon as he was well all the same their misery was aggravated for the father had received such a shock that he was seriously ill with fever 
since thursday maheu had been back at the pit and it was now sunday in the evening etienne talked of the approaching date of the first of december preoccupied in wondering if the company would execute its threat they sat up till ten o'clock waiting for catherine who must have been delaying with chaval but she did not return maheude furiously bolted the door without a word etienne was long in going to sleep restless at the thought of that empty bed in which alzire occupied so little room next morning she was still absent and it was only in the afternoon on returning from the pit that the maheus learnt that chaval was keeping catherine he created such abominable scenes with her that she had decided to stay with him to avoid reproaches he had suddenly left the Verrou and had taken on at jean bart m denolin's mine and she had followed him as a putter the new household still lived at monceau at piquet's maheu at first talked of going to fight the man and of bringing his daughter back with a kick in the backside then he made a gesture of resignation what was the good it always turned out like that one could not prevent a girl from sticking to a man when she wanted to it was much better to wait quietly for the marriage but maheu did not take things so easily did i beat her when she took this trip out she cried to etienne who listened in silence very pale see now tell me you who are a sensible man we have left her free haven't we because my god they all come to it now i was in the family way when the father married me but i didn't run away from my parents and i should never have done so dirty a trick as to carry the money i earned to a man who had no want of it before the proper age ah oh, it's disgusting you know people will leave off getting children and as etienne still replied only by nodding his head she insisted a girl who went out every evening where she wanted to what has she got in her skin then not to be able to wait till i married her after she had helped to get us out of difficulties eh it's natural one has a daughter to work but there we have been too good we ought not to let her go and amuse herself with a man give them an inch and they take an ell alzire nodded approvingly and lenore and henri overcome by this storm cried quietly while the mother now enumerated their misfortunes first zacharie who had had to get married then old bonnemort who was there on his chair with his twisted feet then jean lin who could not leave the room for ten days with his badly united bones and now as a last blow this jade catherine who had gone away with a man the whole family was breaking up there was only the father left at the pit how were they to live seven persons without counting estelle on his three francs they might as well jump into the canal in a band it won't do any good to worry yourself said maheu in a low voice perhaps we have not got to the end etienne who was looking fixedly at the flags on the floor raised his head and murmured with eyes lost in a vision of the future ah it is time it is time end of section sixteen